Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Time is 8.37 a.m. Um, I'm assuming everybody in this room is here for the Board of Fisheries meeting for Chignik, Alaska Peninsula, Aleutian Islands, Bering Sea, and Pacific Cod meeting. The day is Thursday, October 27th. There are seven of seven board members present this morning. And uh, just before I go any farther, I will have them introduce themselves. Let's start on this side today, and we'll start with Mr. Weitz. David Weiss, Wasilla, Alaska. Mike Heimbuck from Homer, Alaska. John Wood, Willow. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair. John Jensen from Petersburg. Good morning, Mackenzie Mitchell, Fairbanks. Good morning, everyone. Tom Carpenter from Cordova. And good morning. I'm Marek Carlson Van Dort. I am chair of the Board of Fisheries. Just a couple of um, sort of housekeeping items. For those that need some help with additional hearing, if you have a hearing disability or just like a little bit um, better audio, we do have wireless hearing assistive headsets available. Just ask any one of the board staff here um, and they'll provide you one. And also, before we go any further, I just remind people to please silence your cell phones. Um, that will be really helpful. And then we'll go ahead and get into introductions of staff and other guests here this morning. So I will start with Mr. Commissioner. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to our first regulatory meeting of the year. Um, I'm Doug Vincent Lang, Commissioner of Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and I'm going to let Sam introduce his staff that's attending the meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Sam Raybung. I'm the Director of the Division of Commercial Fisheries. And with us today is uh, Deputy Director Forrest Bowers, uh, Ms. Ms. Shalene Hutter. Hi, Shalene. <laughs> our Regulations and Programs Coordinator, Mr. Nick Segalpin, our Regional Supervisor for the Westward Region, uh, Mr. Mark Stickert, our Shellfish and Groundfish Management Coordinator for the Westward Region, and Ms. Asia Better, our Assistant Area Management Biologist for the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands Shellfish and Groundfish. I'd also like to congratulate Asia on her newborn. So. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Asia. Thank you, Mr. Raybung. Um, it looks like we don't have sport fish here today because it's all calm fish primarily. Um, fish and Wildlife Service, Mr. Pappas. Good morning, George Pappas, Sop Subsistence Management, State Subsistence Liaison, seat on the Board of Fish and Board of Games. Great to be here. I'm here to monitor. You've noticed our absence from OSM here during the COD meetings. Uh, it's been several cycles. I'm here to re-up the Take a look at uh, if you know, uh, there's more to be in future meetings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. It's nice to have you here as well. Thanks. Commissioner. Lisa Olson is online on the, on the phone call, and uh, she's homesick today. So, But if she's needed, she can be available for questions. Very good. And, um, Lisa is the director for subsistence, correct? Thank you. Um, Mr. Peterson. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Aaron Peterson with the Department of Law. Thank you very much. And Captain Frenzel. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Aaron Frenzel of the Alaska Wildlife Troopers. Thank you both for being present here today. And I will turn over to Executive Director Nelson, please. Good morning. My name is Art Nelson. I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Fisheries. And with us here from our board support staff today, we have, starting at the far end of the table, we have Faree Sylvester. She's our South Central Region Advisory Committee Coordinator. Uh, next to Faree is Henry Lesia. He's our publication specialist for the Board of Fisheries and the Southern Southeast uh, Adv Regional Advisory Coordinator. Uh, and we also have Annie Bartholomew, uh, pub specialist for the Board of Game and the Northern Southeast Advisory uh, Committee Coordinator. Uh, and we also have, way in the back, Christy Tibbles, the Executive Director for the uh, Board of Game, here to help me out for some of my first meetings as Executive Director. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Just would like to say a special Hello and welcome back to Shalene. It's really great to have you back in person at these meetings. <laughs> All right, um, access to board members, just a couple of words. As board members were available to you for the purpose of receiving added information, this process doesn't work without your help. Many of us often meet with stakeholders informally during breaks, at meal times, um, before and after daily meetings, and we're here to serve you and benefit from your input. There's a line called the sanctuary line. I think most of you are familiar with it. I think it's a yellow line just at the end of these tables. And we ask that you not cross that during meetings and breaks. Um, however, if you would like to t speak with any of the board members, just um, notify whoever you'd like to speak with. If you can't get a member's attention, 
please feel free to talk to one of the board support specialists or ADF and G staff and they'll come and get our attention and we'll walk over to meet you. Also, please keep in mind that it's during the breaks and both before and after the daily meetings that we find time to read all of the material that's submitted. Um, the volume of RCs can be pretty prolific, so just please keep that in mind um, if we uh, need a few minutes before we come and, and meet with you. If you have process questions, if the public has process questions, so in order to ensure that the public is fully informed on the board, the chairman, which is myself, Vice Chairman Jensen, or the Executive Director Nelson will be happy to answer any or all process questions that you have um, during the course of the meeting. And it's hoped that the practices of the board outlined um, here will maximize public participation um, at the board meetings. Um, and the board believes that an informed and engaged public can only result in better conversation and development and management of our fisheries resources. This is an incredibly public process. It's one of the best processes, in my opinion, and um, we want to make sure that we do everything we can to facilitate that. But we want to facilitate that also in a very respectful way. It's very important to me um, and the rest of the department, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, the full board, that we are fostering a respectful workplace. We're committed to making sure that our workplace is free from negative, aggressive, and inappropriate behaviors and harassment of any nature just isn't acceptable and I won't tolerate it. So we appreciate everyone's assistance in helping us um, maintain a respectful meeting. In accordance with the Open Meetings Act, the board staff has published a notice in the Alaska Online Public Notice System. The notice has been posted on our, on the, sorry, the board's main website and the meeting website in its designated posting place. Um, it's also been distributed to a wide list of email recipients. I'm not gonna take the time to read it, but if you're interested in seeing the full copy of that text, you can speak with the executive director. Public notices and proposals were distributed to the local Fish and Game Advisory Committees. They're posted online, and they were also sent, again, to that uh, email to interested organizations and individuals. Public comments were solicited, and board members have received copies of all of the written public on-time comments. The timely public comments and timely advisory committee comments are available for the board's use. They're also available to the public um, in the workbooks at the table at the back of the room if you want to see a hard copy of it. Um, they're also available online. Copy of all the meeting materials updated frequently throughout the meeting. Um, again, can be found on the board's website um, uh, under this particular meeting tab. Likewise, copies of the tentative agenda for this meeting can also be found on the table at the back of the room. The agenda is subject to change throughout the meeting, but I will make an attempt to try and stick to it as closely as possible. Um, with that, I think we'll... Go ahead and take some ethics statements at this time. So the procedural requirements for disclosures by the board members are set out in AS 3952-220 and 9AAC 52.120. If you have questions or would like further information about the ethics disclosure process, board members are encouraged to speak with either myself or the Assistant Attorney General, Mr. Peterson, in the Department of Law. So at this time, we'll go ahead and um, have board members put their ethics statements on the record. And um, just for board members' edification, those guidelines for ethics statements are in your workbooks. Um, and I think we'll start in the same order as introductions with Mr. Weiss. Hello, my name is David Weiss. I'm cur I currently reside in the Meadow Lakes area of Wasilla, Alaska. I'm currently employed as a president CEO of Three Bears Alaska. My wife is also employed by Three Bears Alaska as a pharmacy director. I also receive a monthly commission from Amsoil Inc. as a rep. Both my wife and I have family trusts from which we withdraw funds from time to time. Both she and I receive the state of Alaska permanent funds dividend, and I will receive a stipend for my service on this board. Neither I, my wife, my employer, nor any re anyone related to me have any financial interest in the fisheries. Similarly, neither I, my wife, my employer, or anyone related to me are involved in any lawsuits with the state of Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game, or the Board of Fisheries. This information is true, correct, and complete to the best of my knowledge.
Thank you. Are there any board questions? Seeing none, I rule that you can fully participate in the meeting's agenda before us. Thank you. Mr. Heimbuck. Mike Heimbuck from Homer. <clears throat> I'm a lifelong Alaskan and have lived in Homer since 1975. I no longer commercial fish, nor am I otherwise employed. I do receive an annual PFD. My wife is an occasional school teacher still. My daughter Hannah works as an advocate for some mariners and marine issues as an employee of the company Ocean, Ocean Strategies. No other member of my family is employed in a manner that's affected by the actions of the Board of Fisheries. I have a conflict of interest in two proposals ahead of us dealing with COD today. Uh, as a lobbyist for some under 60 foot pot boats, my daughter Hannah intends to represent her clients on proposals five and six exclusively dealing with COD. The rest of the proposals are of little concern to her and as a result the remaining COD proposals do not generate an ethics conflict for me. Neither myself nor any member of my extended family is involved with any lawsuit with the state of Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game, or the Board of Fisheries, and I do hereby declare that this statement is true and correct. Thank you, Mr. Heimbach. Any questions from the board? Mr. Wood. <clears throat> Just one. Hannah does not fish in the cod fishery, does she? I hope not. <laughs> okay. But to the best of my knowledge, she does not. Thank you very much, Mr. Heimbach. Appreciate your transparency. And so I rule that you will um, need to recuse yourself for proposals number five and six, but may participate fully in all the other matters before the board um, for this meeting. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm John Wood, residing in Willow, Alaska. I have three adult children, none of whom is involved in any fishing related work or business. I receive a pension from the state of Alaska after serving in the Alaska court system the Anchorage Municipal Assembly, and a staff to the Alaska State Legislature. I also receive Social Security benefits and the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, as does my wife and one of my adult children. I also am on contract with the State of Alaska on hourly as-needed basis, totally unrelated to any fishing issues. I fish recreationally and will receive a stipend for services on this Board of Fisheries. My wife, Mary, is now retired and is the administrator of a trust composed of assets, none of which are related to any fish business. Neither I nor my wife or children have any interest in any business or organization related to fish resources or in any proposals that may be considered by the board. There are no interests of a personal or financial nature that I nor any member of my immediate family has that may be affected by any of the proposals to be considered by the board. Neither I nor any of my immediate family have any or members of any organization or corporation that is involved in the lawsuit against the state, the board, or the Department of Fish and Game, or where the state, the board, or the department is a party to the lawsuit. And I certify that to the best of my knowledge, this statement is true, correct, and complete. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Are there any questions for Mr. Wood from members of the board? Seeing none, I rule that you may fully participate in the matters before us at this meeting. Let's go to Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I stated earlier, my name is Tom Carpenter. I reside in Cordova. I'm currently retired. I've divested myself completely of all businesses, including limited entry permits and IFQs. My primary income comes from investment income, personal savings managed by Merrill Lynch. I work twice a year for Boswell Bay LLC, conducting oil spill recovery work and training in Prince William Sound. My wife is employed by the Cordova School District as an educator. I receive the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend, as do my wife and daughter, and receive a stipend for serving on this board. Neither I nor anyone in my immediate or extended family have any financial interest in any business which relate to fish and wildlife resources or belong to any organizations which any financial gain can be attributed. Upon confirmation, I resign my position on all boards, including the Copper River Prince William Sound Advisory Committee and the Prince William Sound Aquaculture Board. There are no proposals before the board that will benefit myself, nor anyone in my immediate or extended family. No member of my family or extended family is involved with any lawsuits against the state of Alaska or the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And I believe this statement to be true, correct, and complete to the best of my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Any board questions for Member Carpenter? 
Seeing none, I rule that you may fully participate in the meeting. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Mitchell, and I have resided in Alaska since 2010. My immediate family consists of my mother and two brothers, all of whom reside outside of Alaska. In addition, I do not have any relatives that are from Alaska, reside in Alaska, or are involved in Alaska's fisheries. I will receive a stipend for service on the Board of Fisheries, and I do receive the permanent fund dividend as a resident of Alaska. I annually purchase a, a resident sport fish hunt and trap license for personal hunting and fishing recreation in the state. I teach economics and recreation management courses at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I am currently taking an aviation maintenance technician course. In addition to my work with the university, I work seasonally for hunting and fishing outfitters across the state, serving roles as sport fishing guide and hunting guide under my registered guide outfitter license, sport fishing guide license, and merchant mariner credential. In 2020 and 2021, I guided fishing charters in Prince William Sound in the Gulf of Alaska while basing out of the Port of Valdez. In years prior to 2020, I guided fishing charters in the Gulf of Alaska basing out of the Kodiak Islands. I did not guide any sport fishing charters in 2022. I hold a commercial pilot certificate and a flight instructor certificate and occasionally work providing flight instruction. I hold two business licenses in the state of Alaska, one for an air taxi service and one for a hunting and fishing outfitter company. Only the hunting side of the outfitting company is operational at this time, but it is my intent to at some point operate a sport fishing company in the South Central Sport Fish area. Neither I nor any member of my immediate family are members of any organization or corporation that is involved in a lawsuit against the state, the board, or the Department of Fish and Game, or where the state, the board, or the department is a party to the lawsuit. I do not believe that I have any conflicts with the matters before us, and I certify that to the best of my knowledge, this statement is true, correct, and complete. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, I rule you may fully participate in the matters before us. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. My name is John Jensen. I'm a small business owner and commercial fisherman residing in Petersburg, Alaska. <clears throat> I own and operate a small recreational skiff rental business and a marine storage facility. As a commercial fisherman, I hold permits in the Red King and Tanner Crab fisheries in southeast Alaska. Other business interests include a partnership in a real estate investment company, JHD Real Estate Investments, LLC. My wife, Pam, works part-time as an administrative clerk for the Petersburg Municipal Power and Light Department of the Petersburg Borough. I receive a stipend from the state of Alaska as a member of the Board of Fish. I'm also a member of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council and receive compensation. We receive an, the annual permanent dividend fund of Alaska. I'm a lifelong Alaska resident, and traditionally my family and I have always enjoyed hunting and sport fishing. I participate in the personal use fisheries. There are three members of my immediate family that are directly involved in commercial fishing industry in Alaska. My oldest son, Jeremy, is a commercial fisherman. He owns and operates his own fishing vessel and holds permits in the following areas. Southeast Alaska Golden King Crab and in Bristol Bay Salmon Gillnet. He occasionally participates in the Southeast Tanner and Red King Crab fisheries. He's not a permit owner. My younger son, Sam, is a commercial fisherman. He participates as a crewman for Bristol Bay Salmon, and in Southeast Alaska, he owns permits in the Southern Southeast Alaska Herring Row on Kelp and dives for sea cucumbers in the winter. My brother, Mark, is a commercial fisherman. He holds permits in Southeast Alaska for drift gillnet and hand trolling, and also a Dungeness 150-pot uh, crab permit and southeast herring roll, southern Southeast herring roll on kelp. With that, Madam Chair, I don't believe I have any conflicts with the matters before us, and certified to the best of my knowledge, my disclosure statement is true, correct, and complete. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, you may fully participate in the matters before the board at this meeting, and I will turn the gavel over to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Carlson Van Dort, would you provide your ethics statement, please? Thank you. My name is Marit Carlson Van Dort. I was born and raised in Alaska. I currently reside in Anchorage. I am currently employed as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Far West Incorporated, um, which is the village corporation for Chignik Bay formed under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. I am also a shareholder in Bristol Bay Native Corporation and in Kodiak. Kodiak Incorporated, the Angska Re um, Regional Corporation for Kodiak Island area. My significant other is a heavy equipment operator and member of the International Brotherhood of Operating Engineers, number 302. Both of us purchase resident sport fishing licenses. Both he and I receive State of Alaska permanent fund dividends, and I will receive a stipend for my service on this board. Neither 
I, any members of my immediate family, nor my employer have any financial interest in fisheries. Similarly, neither um, I, any member of my immediate family, or my employer are involved with any lawsuits with the state of Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game, or the Board of Fisheries. Uh, Mr. Chair, this information is true, correct, and complete to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Carlson Van Dort. Seeing none, I really could participate fully in the matter before us and return the gavel to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Just a couple other um, important pieces of information before we get into staff reports. Uh, a word on record copies and what they are. The board encourages the public to submit written comments on specific proposals or issues. Written public comments limited to 10 single-sided or five double-sided pages in length when submitted before deliberation of agenda change requests begin from any one individual or group will be accepted as a record copy, otherwise known as an RC. You're gonna hear that a lot. Once the deliberations on proposals begin at this meeting, the board will only accept written public comments that are not more than five single-sided pages or the equivalent double-sided pages, unless very specific, specific information is requested by the board that requires more than that, um, uh, and that's allowed under you know, the standard that we typically go by. Anyone attending this meeting who would like to submit written materials for the board's consideration can turn in a copy to the board support staff at the end of the table that was introduced at the beginning of this meeting. If you have something that needs to be printed in color, please turn in 21 copies to the board support specialist. Otherwise, you need only turn in one copy. You can also upload your written comments on the board's website on the page where we post all of the documents for this meeting, but please note that board staff does not print, again, uploaded comments in color. Individuals attending the meeting can submit written comments also by fax to 907-465-6094, and written comments can also be uploaded as a Word document or a PDF, again, through the board's website. Please make sure that your written comments clearly include your name and any affiliation with any organization that you represent at the top of the document. With no exception, all materials which are to be submitted to the board for its consideration must be presented to the record keeper for distribution um, or uploaded through our website. Please do not give documents directly to board members as these documents will be handed back to you and they'll request that you submit it for the record. All documents received at this board meeting will be assigned a log number, again called an RC, and it will be recorded in the log book. The original of all written materials submitted will be retained for the board's permanent record. The record keeper will distribute copies of the documents in the morning before the meeting begins, after the noon break, and if there's an evening session, after the dinner break, and this practice will ensure regular distribution of all written materials um, to all members of the board, as well as proper retention of records. And just kind of a note, um, while you have the right to submit a set number of pages of information um, as a record copy, please keep in mind that the board gets a tremendous amount um, of things to read, are very busy during these meetings, and um, although we do our very best to try and read, get eyes on every piece of paper and information that's put before us, um, sometimes we're unable to read ev everything, so um, I would encourage brevity um, and saying what you can what you need to say in the least amount of words and pages, and um, that's really, really helpful. Um, that being said, we wanna make sure that you um, have the opportunity to communicate the information that's important to you. Just a quick early reminder about signing up for public testimony. For those of you who wish to testify, you must fill out one of the blue cards located at the back table of the room and hand it to the board staff. The blue card should be legible and completely filled out so that both your name and your area of interest and your topic or the proposal that you're interested in um, testifying about um, can be identified to the board members. Um, the tentative cutoff time for sign up for oral, oral testimony is 11 a.m. today. At this meeting, um, the public will be given three minutes to testify. Advisory committee and regional advisory council representatives will be given 10 minutes. All right, hopefully that's most of the informational housekeeping, and um, we'll go ahead and get into staff reports at this time, and we'll give you a second to set up. Welcome, Mark. Madam Chair, while they're setting up, if anyone's gonna be using the screen, those of us on this end cannot see the screen on the wall at all, and if you could turn the screen somewhat 
towards us so that we can see it. Be appreciated. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll also just note that um, there is one staff presentation on our agenda today. Um, it is RC3. Yep, was, right here. It was in your RC packets. Thanks. Thanks, Annie. Appreciate it. All right, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Good morning. My name is Mark Stickert. I work for the Commercial Fisheries Division as a regional management coordinator for groundfish and shellfish fisheries based out of Kodiak. Um, before I get started this morning, I want to quickly acknowledge that the department's fortunate to have two excellent management biologists in our Dutch Harbor office. Um, Asia Beter, as, as you heard, is our, our COD specialist. She very recently had her child, and despite her insistence on being here, she'll take a little more of a passive role during this meeting. Normally, she'd be sitting at this table instead of me. And Miranda Westfall, who runs our Dutch Harbor office and is a COD and crab specialist, um, is stuck in Dutch due to weather. And so uh, even though they're, they're not here to fully represent their work, they did all the legwork for this meeting. They wrote the reports, put together this report, wrote the staff comments. Um, I just want to give credit where credit's due. I'm, I'm just the messenger today. Um, and also acknowledge that um, Krista Milani, who is the federal groundfish manager for National Marine Fishery Service in Dutch Harbor, was also scheduled to be here to support any of your questions on federal fisheries. But same as Miranda, she's stuck in Dutch due to weather. Um, I'm in direct contact with Krista. She's listening along. And so um, I can help coordinate any um, transfer information or questions. Uh, you may have a federal fisheries with Krista. So with that in mind, just a single staff report this morning. Um, this will be very familiar to those of you that saw the report at the Joint Protocol Committee meeting. Um, my goal this morning is to provide a, a quick overview of state waters cod fisheries and then introduce the 11 proposals that are before you during this meeting. I'll start with a, a quick list of fishery terms. Um, all state waters cod fisheries in one form or another are coordinated and overlap with federal cod fisheries. So you get the pleasure of two governments worth of acronyms. Um, a, a lot of information here, but I'll focus you on the, the handful of highlighted uh, acronyms here. Um, these are going to be common throughout this, this meeting and um, represent the, the greatest degree of overlap between state and federal management. So ABC, or acceptable biological catch, is a federal reference term for the total amount of cod that can be removed um, in a given area in a given year. So when I say total amount of cod, that's across all types of fisheries, whether they're directed or bycatch. So really it's the total amount of dead cod in a given area in a year. The TAC or total allowable catch is that portion of the ABC which is allocated or directed towards the federal fisheries. And the GHL or guideline harvest level is that portion of the ABC that is directed were allocated to the state waters fisheries. So the take home here is TAC plus GHL can never exceed the ABC. And when one changes, the other one has to compensate for it. Uh, more fishery terms, just a quick mention of jurisdiction. As you know, there are two different governments in play for cod fisheries. Um, their federal jurisdiction over federal waters um, occur in the EEZ. So the, which occurs from three to 200 nautical miles offshore. Um, these waters fall under federal management jurisdiction, and the federal government 
divides that jurisdiction into five unique management units, three in the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea, and the Aleutian Islands. In contrast, the state of Alaska has jurisdiction of all waters from shore to three miles offshore. Um, and for purposes of civic cod anyway, the state divides up our jurisdictional um, footprint into state or to eight unique state ground fish areas, um, starting in the eastern Gulf of Alaska, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, Kodiak, Chignik, um, Alaska Peninsula, Dutch Harbor, and Aleutian Islands. So this map just gives you uh, a quick indication on how these um, jurisdictions overlap in space. Um, the federal management units are in shades of blue and green. Um, you can see they tend to be fairly large areas, and the black lines with the labels are the state management areas that overlap. You'll, you'll notice in some cases, some state management areas fall fully within the federal management area, and in some cases, um, they, they span multiple areas. So with that in mind, there are really three types of cod fisheries. Federal fisheries, again, occur in federal waters. They are guided by regulations established by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council process. And as I mentioned, all harvest from federal fisheries accrue against a federal TAC. There's also parallel fisheries. These are um, fisheries that occur in state waters. And I think the easiest way to think about parallel fisheries is it's um, that portion of the federal fishery that occurs inside three miles or in, in, inside state waters. So parallel fisheries run concurrent with the adjacent federal fishery and the state for consistency generally adopts most federal regulations and management measures as guided by the board process. Um, so there are certainly instances where the state has, the board has decided to implement separate regulations for the parallel fisheries, and that is your prerogative to do so, but for the most part, um, they are generally designed to um, mimic the federal fishery. And then there are state, or you'll hear them oftentimes referred to as GHL fisheries. These are fully independent fisheries. These fisheries are exclusively happen inside state waters. They're exclusively guided by um, regulations promulgated through the board process, and as we heard, the harvest is deducted from the state GHL. And for purposes of this meeting, um, we're really going to be focusing on federal and state waters fisheries. There's little reference to parallel fisheries for the rest of this meeting. So just a few details on what these fisheries look like. Um, federal fisheries, again, federal waters, the 2022 TAC, and I'll focus here on the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, um, was based on 89% of the federal Pacific Cod um, uh, ABC in, in the Bering Sea and 67% of the ABC in the Aleutian Islands. Um, federal fisheries tend to be large and complex and heavily industrialized. Um, they allow for um, a wide array of gear sectors, trawl, longline, pot. Um, also, there's multiple processing types, um, catcher processors, catcher vessels. Um, most sectors operate under a matrix of, of multiple seasons within the year. I tend not to be any gear limits or any other sort of restrictions on, on how people um, work that gear. Um, all federal fisheries are um, limited access or rationalized in one form or another. Um, I'll note that there's um, stellar sea line protection measures have, have a large influence on the distribution of where federal fisheries can occur. And um, all federal um, ground fish, Pacific cod fisheries have um, uh, observer coverage in, in one form or another. Um, in contrast, state waters fisheries obviously have a much smaller footprint. Um, the harvest uh, limits um, are, are based on a percentage of the federal cod ABC, as we discussed. Um, most state water seasons are designed to sort of open and be coordinated with the federal seasons. We work hard to not have a state cod fishery and a federal cod fishery for the same gear type open in the same space and time. So they're really meant to um, um, be coordinated and, and, and follow each other. Um, the, the gear um, tends to vary by fishery. Most state waters fisheries um, are limited to pot and jig vessels only. Um, all state fisheries are currently open access. Um, there's no limited entry for state waters fishery, although there are exclusive registration requirements unique for each area that is meant to sort of stop boats from transitioning across um, state waters fisheries within the year. Um, we tend to follow some sea lion protection measures, but, but not many, and I'll note that the state does not have an observer program for ground fish. 
So uh, a quick mention here of um, the stock assessment process and, and where these ABCs and, and GHLs on tax come from. Um, this is really a federal function. So every year, based on survey, fishery data, and research, um, these, these sources get put into some fairly sophisticated mathematical models. Those models undergo a, a high degree of review. Um, there are a number of state um, um, biologists as part of this review process. The, these review teams then um, recommend additional ABCs for each federal area to the council and the SSC, and then each December for the following year adopts final ABCs. And that's where the interaction really happens between state and federal fisheries, as you can see that those ABCs get divided into GHLs and tax. So uh, for well-established, um, complicated, and well-reviewed process in, in terms of stock assessment for Pacific cod across the state. This figure just gives you an indication on the interaction between how these ABCs are divided up across the fisheries. So again, ABCs, total amount of cod that can be caught in a given year in a given area, in this case, in each of the five federal management areas. TAC, um, limits on the federal fishery, GHL as limits on the on the federal fishery. So starting um, at the top here, um, you'll notice with the Bering Sea ABC, currently in regulation, the state waters GHL for Dutch Harbor Subdistrict um, takes between 8 and 15 percent of the Bering Sea ABC. Um, 2022, it was 11 percent. And that 11 percent pull then comes off and gets allocated, in this case, to the pot fishery. Um, and then there's a smaller, a smaller um, sort of standalone jig fishery. So again, state waters fishery, um, fairly salt, small in size and scope. Um, compared to the remainder of that ABC, in this case 89% of the ABC for 2022 gets allocated as TAC to the federal fisheries. Um, and then a lot of divisions happen after that. Um, a little about 11% of that TAC gets um, pulled off the top and gets allocated towards CDQ fisheries. And then the remaining 89% of the 89% get divided across all these different sectors. So I think there's nine or ten different sectors there. And then those sectors oftentimes occur. That, that tack then gets divided across multiple seasons. So again, the footprint of federal fisheries is certainly larger. Um, but same basic scheme as you start with the total and then divide it into smaller units based on um, unique fisheries. So with that in mind, um, there are 11 proposals in front of you in the next couple days. Um, four proposals uh, concern the Aleutian Islands subdistrict Pacific cod fishery. There are two proposals uh, focusing on the Dutch Harbor subdistrict cod fishery. There's a, um, one proposal each that sort of addresses general regulations for Bering Sea Aleutian Islands ground fish fisheries. Um, we'll switch to the south a little bit and uh, discuss one proposal for the South Alaska Peninsula cod fishery, um, uh, a more regional um, proposal looking to amend um, how the jig fisheries um, are, are prosecuted, proposal nine, um, and then we, we snuck in a sable fish fishery, uh, sable fish proposal, proposal 10, and then there's a larger policy proposal for number, number 11. So, so to give you a little bit of context these proposals, um, I'll start with just a, a brief description of the Aleutian Islands subdistrict state waters fishery. Um, I think it's fair to say that this fishery is, is a bit of a balancing act. It's, it's sort of two primary and sometimes competing objectives for this fishery. One is to promote opportunity for typically small, less than 60 foot boats that um, really meant to deliver to local shore based processors. So really you want to put small, local, regional fleets delivering into a processor at an ADAC. Um, understanding that's not always possible, you know, a processor um, success rate in ADAC is, is variable. And so when that objective is not really available, we, we kick into a secondary objective as where, you know, we just need to get those fish out of the water and not strand not strand quota. So there's a secondary objective where we acknowledge historical fishery participants, you know, traditionally larger size boats, oftentimes trawl gear, um, allow them into the fishery um, in the absence of a, of a shore-based effort and um, catch that GHL. This fishery began in 2006, so it's relatively new with respect to state waters fishery. 
Um, the GHL is sort of on a sliding scale. It it's, um, ranges between 15 and 39 percent of the federal Aleutian Islands ABC. It's, it's structured a stair step, so that way if the fishery um, GHL is achieved in any given year, the following year um, the state waters fishery is allocated an additional 4% of that ABC up to 39%. Um, there's also a step down provision where if the GHL is not caught two years in a row, we step down 4% all the way down to a basement of 15% of the, of the overall Aleutian Islands ABC, and, and there's also a, a cap. As a 15 million pound maximum GHL limit. So if the 39% of the ABC is more than 15 million pounds, the GHL is set at 15 million pounds. It can never float above that, that cap. Um, again, it's, a, it's an open access fishery. Um, it is exclusive registration area. Um, this fishery is a little bit unique in that it, it has a much my, wider um, array of gear types. We allow pot, trawl, jig, and longline. This fishery is also unique in that we don't allocate the GHL specifically to each gear type. Um, we have a fairly complicated matrix of, of um, seasons in play. And I'll note here that you know, oftentimes there's a, there's a high degree of catching power difference between, let's say, a small jig boat and a, and a large trawler. And so there's a 150,000 pound daily trip limit meant to sort of equalize some of the fishing power so the big boats don't necessarily run away with the, run away with the GHL, so to speak. So as I mentioned, there's no, no allocation across gear types. Instead, we use these sort of series of triggered openings to accomplish these objectives. Um, I, I think not a, we don't need to focus too much on the details, but there's really three triggers. On January 1, the ADAC section, which is a, sort of a smaller subset of the overall area, sort of a couple degrees east and west of ADAC, opens up to vessels that are less than 60 feet. Trot, long line trawl, jig boat. So again, first opportunity or the first objective is to try and promote small boat opportunities that are delivering shoreside. So that's the first trigger for this fishery. There's a second trigger that allows, say, medium-sized pot boats to enter the fishery. So pot boats between 60 and 100 feet. Um, this trigger happens when the federal over 60 pot fishery closes and allows boats to fish transition from the federal fishery into this fishery. And this trigger also then triggers uh, an area opening where we expand the open waters from just the ADAC area to the entire AIS. And then there's a third triggered opening on right now is March 15th. Um, that allows the trawl vessels into the fishery and it also allows um, pot boats between 100 and 125 feet into the fishery. So uh, a fair bit of balance happening um, in this management plan. So with, with this in mind, um, proposal one is a department submitted proposal. It seeks to clarify openings, management time zones, landing requirements, and reporting requirements. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of change to the Lucian Islands sub-district management plan. Um, I think it's been before the board on, on every cycle, and many of the changes have happened on a cycle. So we tend to be laser focused on specific elements, largely who gets to fish in this fishery and when. And we sort of lost focus of all the other regulations that, that govern the fishery. And so the department here is just trying to take a kind of a house cleaning measure and just sort of standardize and, and rationalize the rest of the, the regulations here. Um, the last time this management plan was changed was early 2020 out of cycle and Kodiak. And there was a, a, a sort of a technical error that we, we noticed and we're, we're seeking to fix that. Um, this fishery is unique that it spans two time zones, the Alaska time zone and the Aleutians Hawaiian time zone. So we, we manage the fishery in ADAC or in, in Dutch Harbor under the Alaska time zone, but most of the fishery happens under a different time zone. It causes some confusions when we want to close a fishery. People are saying, what, what time zone are you talking about? So we're going to put Alaska time zone as the time zone of record in regulation so everyone understands that. Um, one thing that's happened recently in this fishery, as I mentioned, there's a 150,000 pound trip limit. And in years when we don't have a processor or the processor has limited capacity, oftentimes we're in a scenario where a boat has 150,000 pounds on board. They have a tender come in because they're tendering fish, say, back to Dutch Harbor. The tender can't offload that full 150,000 pounds. Say maybe take 
100,000 pounds and there's 50,000 pounds left on board. Boats obviously want to go back fishing and put another load of fish on, but it makes that, it makes uh, regulating and enforcing that trip limit really difficult because you've got last trip's fish on with this trip's fish. And we have at least anecdotally heard there are instances where there are boats that would have maybe more than 150,000 pounds on and they would stop the offload at 150, go back out and fish, catch another amount up to that 150. And so we, we propose that um, in these scenarios where they're doing partial deliveries, you can't go back out and fish until you fully offload the fish from the last one. And it just really helps catch accounting and enforcement. Um, there, we have a good relationship and strong reporting with this fleet, but we're just going to ask to put the reporting requirements into regulation. Um, this happened, you know, even though we're in Dutch Harbor, this fishery happens three, 400 miles to the west of us. And so we're, we're managing these fisheries based on text messages and, and uh, sat phones. And so just helpful to let folks know what the expectation is, what kind of information that we need to have that fishery. And then we're putting in a, a, a seeking to um, put in a regulation that says that when the fishery closes, you can't pull your gear out of the water until you've offloaded all your fish. Again, similar to the to the partial delivery, um, we want you to be out of the fishery before have all your fish off before before you start tending to your to your gear. Otherwise, there's really no way to enforce the, the fishery closure. So these are all in practice what we're doing. We're just looking to mostly codify these in the regulations for clarity. Proposal two is a, is, a, is a proposal that really looks to repeal the existing management plan and, and replace it in its entirety, and replace it um, with a set of regulations that really resemble most other state waters cod fisheries. So have a, have a fishery for pot and jig gear, uh, sort of a more abbreviated and simpler openings, pot limits, things like that, and so um, this would really sort of fundamentally alter how this fishery has been managed and, and seek to revert it more towards fisheries that um, happen to, to the east and would functionally exclude um, vessels that use trawl gear and um, longline gear. Uh, this figure just gives you an indication of sort of proportional catch for each of these gear types, sort of pot catch is in sort of lighter shades of blue, trawl catch is in um, darker gray. So you can see when the fishery opened up, you know, each of the gear types, um, trawl, longline, pot, and, and jig were all fishing. Longline effort really dropped off starting about 2013. Really for the first 10 years of the fishery, trawl and pot catch were roughly proportional. Each one of them were, were largely catching about 50% of the GHL. A couple years, 2015 and 2016, where there was no pot effort and only trawl effort, and then um, since 2017, um, pot catch has predominantly dominated the, the overall catch. And you know, some of these differences are, are really driven by changes to the harvest or the management plan, where we sort of allowed different boats in at different times, and also reflects, um, you know, I think years when there is a processor available and operational in ADAC, you tend to see more pot effort. So um, again, a lot of moving parts to this, but this gives you a snapshot of, of how um, all the gear types have historically interacted with the fishery. Proposals three and four are, are similar and um, less complex in nature, and, and it simply seeks to um, move the, the date at which trawl vessels can enter the fishery from its current date of March 15th up to March 1st. So they're seeking to enter the fishery a little earlier than they have now. And the table here just gives you an indication on the, the spread at which um, boats have been, um, trawl vessels have been allowed into the fishery and it's sort of really variable between late February and, and, and mid-March. So I'm going to transition now to the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict State Waters Fishery. Here's just a map. So we're moving to the east. This fishery is happening on the Bering Sea side. And so the ABC is based on um, the Bering Sea ABC. Um, much smaller footprint, much smaller area compared to the Aleutian Islands, um, and, and really focused out of uh, processing capacity in, in Accutan and, and Dutch Harbor. Um, a few details about this fishery. Um, it is predominantly a pot gear only fishery. Um, this was our, our newest established state waters fishery. It was developed by the board in 2013 and first prosecuted in 2014. 
As you heard, the GHL is based on a sliding scale up to 15% of the photo bearing CABC. Um, it has a, a one-way stair step in that if the, if the GHL is caught in any given season, the following year, the, the state waters fishery gets an additional 1% of the ABC up to a maximum of 15%. There is no step down provision and currently in regulation for the Dutch Harbor District, similar to what we just discussst in Aleutian Islands. Uh, it's an open access fishery. Anyone can fish in the fishery. Um, it, it is structured again to open up after the federal under 60 pot gear season closes. Again, so we don't want overlapping fisheries for the same gear in the same place. Um, fishery tends to open up in um, late January, early February. Uh, vessel size is limited to no more than 58 feet in length, and there is a pot limit. So all vessels can't operate any more than 60 pots per boat. Um, again, I mentioned there, there's a, a smaller jig gear fishery. Um, really no focus on that one, but um, acknowledge that there's a small amount of jig effort that happens under state regulations in the subdistrict as well. Um, this table just gives you a snapshot of um, effort um, catch and, and value through the years. Um, the GHL has been achieved in every given year, and I'll note there's some regulatory guidance that says if the GHL, if the catch, um, if 90% if of the GHL has been harvested, that the state um, determines that has been fully harvested. This is how we achieve the GHL, 90%. Um, somewhere around 30 boats historically fish in the fishery. Uh, GHLs have changed over time, but in recent years, average you know between 30 and, and 38 million pounds, uh, and then at least based on reported ex vessel value on fish tickets, you know the average ex vessel fishery ex vessel value of the fishery in recent years sort of between 10 and and 16 million dollars. Um, so looking at the two sub district. Proposals, Proposal 5 looks to limit pot vessels from fishing around Unalaska Bay to, to no more than 55 feet or less in length. This is a, a bit of a unique proposal in that it's not looking to really change who fishes in the Dutch Harbor subdistrict fishery. It's looking to um, reduce the amount of subdistrict effort um, in Unalaska Bay relative to other users. And so there's a small fleet, predominantly long line boats that fish out of Dutch Harbor. You kind of see there's a, a, a couple stat areas right in Unalaska Bay. Um, and sometimes they're, they're making the, the suggestion that um, the fishing pressure from pot cod boats that are fishing in the sub-district sort of um, displaces other users in the area and they're looking to essentially reduce that effort. Um, here's a, a figure that just shows um, the number of pot vessels by size that are fishing in the Dutch Harbor subdistrict. So relatively few number of boats that would sort of fall into this category. So the impacts are relatively unknown. But um, you know, obviously there's some effort by larger size pot boats in Alaska Bay. Proposal six. Um, likely a proposal that's going to generate the most amount of conversation and it seeks to sort of replace and uh, reestablish the methodology used to allocate GHL to the Dutch Harbor subdistrict fishery. As I mentioned currently, uh, it's based on uh, a stair step up to 15%. Um, this would use a tier based approach to set the subdistrict sub GHL. So you can kind of see the tiers there where based on the amount of federal ABC in the Bering Sea would um, fix what your exploitation rate would be essentially for the GHL. So we can see when, when abundance is relatively low, less than 100,000 metric tons, the, the GHL would be set at 10% of that ABC. As the ABC increases, say anything north of about 154,000 tons, it would fix it at 13%. So. Um, and then there's also seek to implement a total cap. So I think it's about 20,000 tons. So regardless of whatever the percentage is of the ABC, the GHL could never exceed about 44 million pounds. So I, I think that the take home here is it, it's sort of a different look on abundance-based management. It would um, theoretically take um, the, the top 2%, 14 and 15% um, off the table and put in a cap. And as I mentioned, the currently to, to get your step up, all you have to do is catch your catch your GHL. And, and this proposal would also then implement um, what we're calling a GHL modification <laughs> modifiers or step downs. So basically, 
the only way you can increase your GHL is if your biomass increases. However, if you fail to catch your GHL, you can step down. And so you can kind of see those modifiers there. So it sort of inverses the current regulations where if you catch it, you go up. Here, under this regulation or under this proposal, you would only go down if you, you fail to catch your GHL in a given year. Um, here's a, a quick snapshot of sort of what is and what could be under this proposal. So on the left hand two columns there, you're kind of seeing the ABC in tons and pounds. Um, the middle two columns just shows the current regulations and shows the history of, of how much of the ABC has been allocated to the state waters fishery and the corresponding GHLs. See 2022 is 11% translated into about 37 million pounds for the fishery. And then the, and the right couple columns would be if this proposal were adopted in 2014, this is what the GHLs would have been or could have been under the proposed rules. So as you can see in the early, on the, in the far left-hand column, in the early years, ABC biomass was high, and so you really hit that cap. So it would have been 44 million pounds really through much of the history, and so you know, retrospectively, this would have been an increase um, overall to the amount of, uh, to the Dutch Harbor subdistrict fishery, but then in, in more recent years, you would see that uh, uh, it would be still exceeding, but a little more moderated. And so it, it wouldn't really be until the state waters fisheries achieved their 14 and 15% that you would expect this to inverse and see a loss to the state waters fishery. Proposal seven, um, again, is a, is a department proposal. It seeks to clarify um, some of the more broader or, or global um, ground fish regulations. Again, most of the focus have been sort of laser pointed at the harvest strategies, and we've sort of lost fidelity to some of the other ground fish regulations. We're looking just to, to standardize um, delivery requirements and standardize the gear marking requirements. In practice, um, we're just looking to put in regulation what we're already doing. These are um, basically identical or very similar to almost all other state waters fisheries around and um, just sort of missing some of the uh, regulations that, that clarify, you know, what your gear needs to be marked with and, and, um, and uh, how you deliver that gear or deliver your catch. So really a housekeeping type proposal here and wouldn't um, have any uh, change to how the fishery is prosecuted. So we're gonna move away from Bering Sea a little bit and um, look at the South Alaska Peninsula. Again, so now we're really just um, switching um, sides and now we're looking at the state waters fishery that's predominantly um, based out of Sand Point and King Cove. Um, this fishery began in 1997. Again, it's a pot and jig gear fishery only. Vessel size is limited to no more than 58 feet. There is a direct allocation of the GHL to the gear types. Pot vessels get 85% of the GHL, jig vessels get 15%. Again, open access, structure to open up after the corresponding federal fisheries close, and, and there's um, limits to the amount of gear um, boats can use. Uh, this is a department proposal, and it really is, again, housekeeping in nature, and it seeks to clarify a weather delay provision for the start of the cod fishery. Um, this fishery typically opens in early March. Um, oftentimes a lot of weather in early March in the, in the Alaska Peninsula. And there's a weather delay provision where the department will delay the opening of the fishery if there's a gale warning, marine forecast in, in the forecast. And this is really meant to be an equal start. This fishery can be fast paced, oftentimes um, 10 to 15, 20 days long. So you can imagine if you were a, a smaller size boat and it was blowing really hard, and you didn't want to leave town because it was unsafe for you and you were sort of on the hook for four or five or six days, you could lose you know, a third quarter of your entire season just waiting for the weather to clear. And so we have this weather delay provision saying basically no gales in the forecast and you can go and, go and fish. Um, department, uh, well, people's perception of weather is relative. And so we ask for very specific criteria to use to weigh ourselves against. And so we want to see a, a, a um, follow the, the National Weather Service standards and see a gale warning for that area in the forecast. In the last couple of years, the Weather Service has changed how they define the reporting areas. All we're doing is just updating our regulations to reflect how the forecasts are actually putting out. Again, in practice, no changes to the fishery, no practice and change of how this regulation is, is enforced. Um, we're just standardizing it with recent changes to um, the Weather Service. 
Um, so we're going to shift again a little more to the east and look at more of a broader regional um, jig fishery proposal. So again, sort of looking at, at uh, jig fisheries that happen predominantly on the south side from Kodiak to Aleutian Islands. Um, this proposal is pretty broad reaching, but uh, in its most basic form really is looking to um, standardize jig seasons uh, across most management areas in the region. And it wants to open all jig fisheries for cod on January 1 and eliminate any exclusivity. Basically, you want to have a common season and flexibility to move across different management areas, which is not possible now. Um, so I think that the motivation for this proposal, as we understand it, if you look at the, the red box here, is you can see that's a 10-year snapshot of effort and allocation or GHL allocation and catch. You can kind of see that um, jig fisheries tend to be underutilized. So in the Kodiak area and the South Peninsula area, two areas we can report harvest, you know, on average, somewhere around 30% of the allocation has been caught by jig vessels. Um, there are currently regulations that say within each area, if the jig fishery isn't fully caught, we can roll that, roll that GHL to the pot boats within that same area later in the year. But I think there's a, a subset of jig boats here that are saying, look, why don't you just make it more flexible for jig boats to move around and, and catch jig quota independent of where we're at rather than give that quota to the pot fleet. I think that's the, the thrust of this ask. And the, and the table below, again, just shows that um, for the most part, state managed or state waters fisheries are really designed to reflect the local fleets in those areas. And so sometimes not a lot of consistency in terms of how these seasons are open, the size of the boats, what they can and can't do. And, and really they're sort of designed to sort of represent sort of the local fleets. And so each, each area sort of has its own flavor and it makes exchange across areas um, difficult or, or prohibits it altogether. Um, the last two proposals here, we're gonna shift away from cod, um, focus on a sablefish fishery. Um, there are a handful of state managed sablefish fisheries in the state. The, the one in um, Western Alaska is the Aleutian Islands um, sablefish fishery. This fishery was established in 1995. Um, at the time it was established, they set a GHL of around 5% of the federal ABC. And this was sort of based on how much of the ABC was caught inside state waters prior to the state waters fishery being, being caught. However, it was never formalized. And we sort of stuck to this informal 5% over time. Um, the, the, there's a, you know, similar to pot fishery or similar to the state waters cod fisheries, um, there's pot long line jig and, and, and hand line gear or legal gear types. This um, fishery has been generally underutilized. We have not caught the full of GHL. Um, it opens up concurrently with the federal IFQ season. Um, obviously boats are restricted to fishing inside three miles. Um, and, and in recent years, um, biomass of sable fish has been going up. Price has been stronger. So there have been sort of renewed interest in this fishery. And, and we're now um, fully exploiting the fishery as well as the federal fishery is being fully exploited. And so we think it's time for us to, to specifically codify how much the GHL, how, what's the ABC poll for this GHL. And so um, we saw this figure for cod, you know, again, right now, the, the total BSI AI um, sablefish ABC gets divided up in the Bering Sea and then it sort of gets divided up into IFQ and CDQ users and in the middle there, you'll, you'll notice that the state just takes 5% off the top for the state waters fishery and all we're looking to do is just formalize this in regulation. It just allows for um, ground fish specification to, to flow a little more freely. Finally, proposal 11. Um, really stepping away from specific fishery and it seeks to establish guiding principles for ground fish fishery regulations. Um, there's similar principles for um, you know, sustainable salmon fisheries and well as there's guiding principles for king and tanner crab management and state regulation, but there is no sort of overarching umbrella of, of, of objectives for state ground fish fisheries. Um, so there's no policy statement or defined objectives. Um, Adding these in would provide some transparency and provide guidance to, to industry and others when are deliberating changes to ground fish fishery regulations. And, and I think um, the, the, the motivation of this proposal is to aid sustainability certification for state waters ground fish fisheries. I think as, as you know, many of our fisheries have MSE or, or FAO type ground fish certifications. Um, those certification programs like to see objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? 
in prosecuting these fisheries. And so this leans into that, that thought and, and provides some guidance in terms of um, how the state is um, choosing to prosecute groundfish fisheries. With that, Madam Chair, I'll take questions. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stickert. Um, if I remember correctly, at one time there were guiding principles for all the different uh, groundfish fisheries, and um, because of the time it took to deal with them, the, uh, we slowly but surely eliminated them all. So you still have it all. You still have guiding principles in the in the background if we need to bring it up, and we decide to take up guiding principles in the state water meeting. Yeah, Mr. Jensen, through the chair, you know, again, I think, I think it's been the, the state's opinion that those guiding principles are sort of baked into all of each and every one of our management plans, and, and this is meant to take a, a broader step back and, again, sort of provide a more of a global view. And I'm not sure they're really designed to influence specific actions, but just put the bookends in terms of, you know, what, what are the state's objectives when deliberating groundfish fisheries for state managed fisheries. Follow up. So what, what we're looking at would be maybe different than what we had before or more specific to the fish, groundfish? I, so I, I, can, I can pull up those old guiding principles and, and provide some contrast maybe during, um, during the committee meeting, but I, I think they generally follow the same guidance, and, and I think it was acknowledged that um, despite having those, there was really no strong motivation or need for the board to reference that during their deliberations, and so we got away from them. Now that there is more and new need to do that, we're looking to, to bring those back now that there's a, they serve a greater utility than they had in the past. But I think they're very similar than what they were in the past. Thank you, Mark. And Mark, just with respect to um, you, you referenced MSE and FAO certifications for folks that may not know what those are. Can you explain them, please, and why they matter or might matter to people? Sure. So th this really is more on the, the industry marketing and business side of, of fisheries management, where there's a, a discerning uh, consumers that want to better understand and, and know that the, the fish they're buying from the market or wherever um, are been harvested responsibly and sustainably. And so there are a number of um, organizations that have set up criteria and evaluate each individual fishery based on those objectives to ensure that um, those fisheries are being managed in a sustainable and transparent way. Um, the, they, um, the, each fishery then is largely its own client and they, they essentially pay for this review and should they pass, they get a stamp of approval from that organization that says that, you know, you should feel good about buying this, this fish. And the acronyms are for? Um, so there's the marine, no. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, we can do it later, but. Thank yeah, I, there, there's there's a handful of them. We can, we okay. can talk about that. Okay. We'll Fair enough, thank you. And I have several questions, but I will go ahead and hold mine until we get uh, around the table a little bit more. Mr. Heimbach. Two questions, uh, Madam Chairman. Mark, do you happen to know if the parallel fishery is subject to or can be subjected to any aspect of state management authority? Um, so outside of um, ensuring that you are coordinated with ABCs and things like that, the parallel fishery is um, largely fully within the purview of, of change for the Board of Fish. Okay, um, very different question. So when the ABC of COD goes down, I'm gonna assume that the bycatch or the PSC reduces by the same percentage. And, the re and uh, so I wanna know how difficult is managing the non-directed fisheries a bycatch if the ABC is significantly reduced. And I ask that because I think that's maybe the 800 pound gorilla. If we go forward with decreased biomass on cod out there, it's, I'm guessing it's really gonna increase the complexity of managing the non-directed fisheries in the Bering Sea. Mr. Heimbach, through the chair. So that's really a, a federally focused question. You know, the state, we largely sidestep all of that just because we've got very discrete, small footprint 
state waters cod fisheries, and we don't have any other ground fish fisheries that largely overlap. And so we don't really have a lot of bycatch in other fisheries um, just because we have a, a pretty small footprint. H however, so the, the federal fisheries, as I think you saw in this sort of bubble plot here, that, that federal, um, the TAC gets um, distributed across, you know, many different fisheries. There are many different jurisdictions and management plans and, and allocation schemes with each, within each one of those fisheries. Some of those fisheries are, are um, I mean, this is obviously the directive fishery, but within each one of these boxes, that, that box can choose to take those cod either as a directed fishery or use them in bycatch and other fisheries they might be fishing in. So I, I'm not sure it's a, an easy to, to answer question, and it's really going to depend on you know, each one of these boxes really is, is its own independent fishery. And so how those fish get used, whether they are a bycatch or they are used as a secondary target or they're used as a primary target um, is going to be really variable. And I think if, you know, you, you want some detail, we can probably find that detail, but I'm not sure there's a single answer to that question. Mr. Wood. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have a Couple of questions on several slides. On slide 11, and it's found elsewhere as well, you find a 15 million pound cap. What is the reasoning behind establishing a cap on GHL and poundage uh, as opposed just to sticking with the percentage level wherever it may pan out? Is it related to a lack of processing capability or a lack of fleet to harvest? Or what is the reasoning behind establishing the caps? Uh, Mr. Wood, through the chair. So I think it's a twofold purpose. Um, as you alluded, I think the primary objective is to um, ensure that because there's so much variability, you know, one year there's a processor and we catch a GHL and the processor is not there the next year and we don't catch the GHL. And the potential of catching up to 39% of the AI, you can, you, you know, you, you, sort of 15 million pounds is really meant to sort of capture the historical catch overall and, and put a lid on it so that way um, should should the processor should the capacity not be in the fishery to catch the full GHL we're not stranding a lot of extra fish um, so if the percentage that was applicable would have resulted in let's just stick with uh, slide 11 would have resulted in GHL of say 18 million uh, what in effect you're doing is reducing the percentage allowed uh, by putting that cap Correct? In practice, yes. And I think um, it was about 18 million pounds this year was the full computed GHL because it exceeded that 15 million pound cap. We effectively reduced the amount of allocation or reduced the ABC allocation to the GHL. Okay. Next slide, uh, 12. I just want to confirm something. Pot gear, whether it be under 60 or under 125, Primarily, if not exclusively, is processed onshore. Is that correct? Uh, I would say if there's a local processor available, yes. Um, processed onshore in terms of, um, you know, dock deliveries, if there's a processor, a local processor, um, I would say pot gear otherwise delivers to tenders who then take it to other onshore processing facilities in King Cove, Accutan, or Dutch Harbor. There are times and years when there are floating processors, but um, I would say um, trawl vessels have a higher tendency of delivering to floating processors, but pot gear, I would say, predominantly delivered to short processor, shore-based processors, whether locally or tendered um, some distance. As we go through the proposals, what I would like staff to do is if you believe they would have an impact on landing fees, are those being processed on shore, I would like to know what your uh, thoughts are on that. Uh, Mr. Wood, the chair, certainly um, there, there's some sense for that. Um, table 8 in the staff comments, RC2 on page 20, sort of breaks down um, sort of not necessarily by gear type, but where that catch was delivered, whether it be floating processors or shore-based processors. But, um, you know, one of the problems of the Aleutians is much of this data is confidential because of the limited number of participants. But uh, we can break it down and, and provide some more information to you. Yeah, and I haven't had a chance to study that, but I will do that. Boy, you bring up a, a point that's been a 
Vaughn and my side since I've been on this board. The lack of ability of this board to look at confidential information uh, is really, I think, selling us short. I understand the justification and reasoning in the past, but I strongly feel that we should have access to that confidential information when we're making decisions. And uh, just, just put that on the record. Uh, last question relates to, let me get to where I was, table 20, or not table, but uh, slide 23. This is the same slide you gave as 22 in your presentation to the joint board. So if I want to compare what GAL, GHL would have received under the current scenario, I go under the category in the middle of GHL pounds, correct? And correct. if I want to know what I'd receive under the proposed four tier system, I go all the way to the outside column, which says actual GHL in pounds. I segregated out from 2009 on when the new regimen was you know, put into place. And the figures change accordingly, obviously. But it seems to me, if I understand this correctly, under the scenario where we're still under the 14 to 15 percent uh, percentages, there would be more fish caught in the GHL than under the new system than under the old system. Am I reading that incorrectly? Uh, Mr. Wood, through the chair, no. I think you are largely correct. I'm sure there's some some circumstances where you, under low biomass levels, even at 14 percent, you, you could have a, a lower GHL. But yes, it's when the existing step up reaches that 14 and 15 percent, we would generally expect that the GHL would be um, higher than what would be under the proposed rules. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Mitchell and then Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. For slide 15, can you um, explain maybe what influences some of the variability in the harvest by gear type that's shown here? Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start by referencing the staff comments for, for this proposal. Um, and I can maybe during committee break down years when there was a so. Two things, um, when there's a shore-based processor, um, uh, we tend to see, like more in recent years, we tend to see more pot effort, because pot boats like to you know, travel short distances to their, to their market. Um, like 2015, 2016, I, I believe there was no shore-based processor, and so it was largely um, trawl vessels that had their own um, floating processor that prosecuted the fishery. So, uh, so t two things, availability of local processing, and I can sort of break it down during committee maybe about what those years were the lineup of this, and then changes in regulations. Um, I think if you, if you look at table, um, table seven, you can see that, you know, um, regulation changes that influenced who could fish in the in the fishery and when has changed, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven different times, and each one of those regulation changes is going to influence um, how and when uh, uh, a vessel may or may not be able to fish in the fishery. And so, uh, kind of a, a complicated matrix. It's all in the staff comment, but we can um, consolidate that for you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at. Uh, your matrix on page nine, and the state fishery on top, federal parallel fishery on the bottom. So the state fishery in the Bering Sea, the ABC, gets split up eight to 15 percent, and that's based on um, performance of the of the pot caught fishermen, right? The eight to 15 percent. Mr. Jensen, correct. Okay, and then you go down 89 percent. Um, goes the other direction to the Bering Sea TAC. Um, and then you've got a 10.7 that, that's uh, CDQ. They, they get that, uh, they get that 10.7 percent off that 89 percent. Correct. And that's every year. They don't go up or down. They, they just, that's just a straight allocation. It is my understanding that is a fixed percentage and that 10.7 percent comes off the top of the TAC. Okay, year. so there's, there, there's no variability in that. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to 
make sure I understood that correctly. Thanks. Sure. And, and I'll note that, you know, the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict GHL was caught this year, and so it'll be 12 and 88 percent next year. Okay, so they, they, are, they are finished and they did. Uh, the fishery is not fully caught, but I think we're at 96 or 97 percent catch, and we anticipate the full GHL will be caught before the end of the year. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mr. Jensen. I appreciate kind of that line of questioning because I was thinking along some of those lines. And the other thing that I was looking at this diagram and wondering how the buffer comes into play or what is the functionality of the buffer, how is that calculated or not calculated? Um, where does that come into play in these percentages that you have listed on, on here, if at all? So, Madam Chair, I think you're referring to the, the ABC buffer. So what, what we didn't discuss is um, there's an OFL, so the federal overfishing limit. That is actually the, the, the amount of cod that we shouldn't ever exceed. And, you know, the, the idea is if you exceed the OFL, we're threatening the long-term viability or sustainability of stock. Um, as I, I mentioned here, there's a, there's a fairly involved process at which the ABC and OFLs get, get established, um, and there's always some amount of uncertainty about how big that population is, how accurate your assessment models are. And so um, the OFL has a buffer, um, usually sort of depends on the, the uncertainty and depends on the reliability of the data you have to inform these decisions, um, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. And, and that's where the ABC comes from. So you have an OFL. I don't know what the buffer was this year for Bering Sea OFL, but probably 10 or 15 percent, and then below that is the ABC. And that's really meant to account for scientific uncertainty and ensure that um, you, don't, you don't catch too many fish because your assumptions are wrong. Thank you. Um, appreciate those clarifications. Two slide. I'm just going to kind of go, I was marking, marking a slide. So on slide 16, um, it notice here that the proposals to three and four, and we, we might get into this in staff um, during committee a little bit more, um, but I'll just kind of put throw it out there. Um, there's a request to move the date, and I'm just wondering why was the March 15th date currently? I mean, where did that date come from? Why was that set at March 15th? Surely there must have been a reason. So I'll... M Madam Chair, I'll, I'll note here there's no, you know, almost all of these changes before you are, are not management measures. These aren't guided or sort of needed by the department to process these fisheries. Um, you know, again, because the Aleutian Islands subdistrict is unique in that each group doesn't get a specific allocation like we see in other areas, um, your, your opportunity is going to be based on time. How much time do you have to to fish in that fishery and when can you enter that fishery. And so there's a dynamic tension between the opposing gear types about when boats come in. I think it's generally understood that trawl vessels have a higher capacity to catch fish in a shorter amount of time when those fish are available. And so I think it's been generally understood that, um, you know, when those boats come in, the opportunity for the other gear types will likely go down. Um, not universally true, but that's sort of it. And so I, I, I don't know the specifics, but I, clearly it was um, other gear types looking to preserve opportunity prior to trawl vessels coming into the fishery is what sort of anchored that March 15th. I'll, I'll note that that triggered opening used to be based on what was going on in the photo fishery. So now it's a, it's a date certain fixed date. It used to be it would open up after the federal trawl, non-CDQ trawl CV fishery closed. And so this, this date has changed under a couple different configurations as well. Thank you. Um, next question was on slide 18. And I noted in the, um, the last bullet there under pot gear, there's a 60 pot limit. Can that be waived or changed by executive order? Um, so in each state waters management plan, um, we have usually what's called rollover, position, rollover provisions, where if at some point towards the latter end of the year the department assesses that um, the likelihood of us catching the full GHL is low and, and we don't want to strand fish because, again, we're taking federal ABC, um, the department can relax rules and essentially manage more aggressively. 
Um, so yes, the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict right now, um, we have the ability to reduce the, or make the pot limit go away to encourage more effort. And in fact, we took that action several weeks ago um, just to catch the last little bit of, of GHL left in Dutch Harbor Subdistrict as we allowed boats to um, fish more gear. Thank you. And then um, back to slide 23, this is an illuminating slide and, um, and I think it kind of dovetails with some of the tables that you have in the um, department comments for this. Um, but I was wondering, and I know that in the department comments it, sh it shows vessel numbers, there's no cap. It's, you said it was an open access fishery, so there's no cap on GHL vessels, correct? Correct. Um, how many vessels are participating in the federal fishery? Madam Chair, so I'm assuming the federal fishery, are you referring to the, the equivalent under 60 pot gear sector? Or are you thinking about total participants in the Bering Sea federal cod fishery? I'm thinking about total participants in the Bering Sea federal cod fishery. Madam Chair, I, I, I hesitate to venture a guess. Um, I will put that on the list for um, Ms. Milani to hopefully provide us some context on that. Perfect, thank you very much. And then lastly, um, again, um, just because some folks may not have the same level of exposure to some of these terminologies and what they mean, would you please define what it means um, for exclusive and super exclusive designations and how that interplays and um, how you manage? Thank you. Uh, certainly, Madam Chair. So again, all state waters codfish are open access. Um, so there's really no, you don't have to purchase a permit card to enter the fishery. Um, but each area does want to sort of preserve opportunity in their own area. And so we have what is called vessel exclusivity regulations. And, uh, and so there's three, three categories, non-exclusive, exclusive, and super exclusive. Um, any areas that are non-exclusive means that you can move in and out of that fishery at will. There's really no restrictions to, to transition across fisheries. Um, I think there may be one fishery in Southeast that's now non-exclusive. Most fisheries are exclusive. Right? It says you can pick any state waters fishery you want to fish in the given year, but once you pick that fishery, you're basically locked into that fishery. You cannot fish that fishery in the spring and then go and register and fish in a different exclusive or super exclusive fishery later on that year. So within a calendar year, you choose one and you're stuck there. Um, super exclusive is just one layer on top of that is saying, you know, so I guess within the exclusive registration, similar to, uh, I mentioned we've got the authority to reduce or increase the number of pots in order to encourage harvest, we also have the ability to eliminate exclusivity. So if we thought we were under harvested in a particular area, there were vessels that would be interested in fishing in that area, but they had previously chose to fish in a different exclusive area, we can make that area non-exclusive and allow them to transition into that fishery to encourage effort. So, so even though exclusivity is you choose one, um, under certain circumstances, the department can make that go away to, to promote opportunity in the areas that we need it. Super exclusive doesn't matter. You choose one. You're, you're locked into that for the full year. It doesn't matter what the other areas are doing around you. Thank you. That was very helpful. Any additional questions for Mark? Appreciate your presentation. It was very informative. And um, thanks very much. All right, let's take about a 15-minute break, and then we'll roll into public testimony. I will also just remind folks that the deadline to sign up for public testimony is 11 a.m., about an hour from now.
All right, welcome back. Thanks, everyone. It is 10.38. We are back on the record. We're going to start rolling into our public testimony portion of this meeting. Um, so for this particular meeting, the board has called for public testimony on the numerous proposals we have before us. We appreciate the interest and concern of all those who will testify during the public hearing as well as those who have taken the time to submit written materials to the board and also those who participate in the board's committee process that's coming a little bit later. There is a handout on the table in the back entitled Guidelines for Public Testimony that provides some useful information on how to testify. For those of you who would like, you must fill out one of the blue cards located at the table in the back of the room and hand it to the board staff. Again, the blue card should be legibly and completely filled out so that with both your name and your area of interest, um, your topic or the proposal number that you're interested in communicating to the board about, um, and please refer again to the proposal that you are addressing by its proposal number rather than the page number. Similarly, if there's PCs or RCs that you would like to reference or that you will reference in your public testimony, please do so. It's really helpful. Um, again, the time for cutoff of oral testimony is 11 a.m. today. That's in about 20 minutes. When your name is called, please come forward to the microphone. State your name for the record and who you represent. Again, if you have written materials for the board, you should identify those, identify those materials by RC number, PC number, or AC number. Um, I will provide the board members an opportunity to get the paperwork before them so that we can see what you're going to reference. And that time won't be charged to you or the advisory committee representative who is testifying. So your time will start um, you know, as soon as you start talking to us, uh, right after you reference your numbers and put your name on the record. This meeting, the public will be given three minutes to testify. Advisory committee and regional advisory council reps will be given 10 minutes. When you begin your testimony, the green light on the table will come on. When you have one minute left, a yellow light will come on. And when your time is up, that light will turn red and you will be instructed to stop speaking, even if you are not done with your testimony. When you have finished, please remain seated for a minute so that, or a second, a couple seconds, so that the board can ask you any questions that it might have. We ask that you confine your oral testimony to the subjects under consideration in as concise and direct manner as possible. It is the intent of the board to deal with the merits of proposals based on the general principles used by the board. We do not deal in personalities, thus public testifiers are, are and will be admonished not to refer to people by name, um, any staff member, board member, or any other member of the public. Advisory committee and regional advisory council reps should also fill out a blue card and indicate whether they will testify at the beginning or the end of the end of the public testimony. Please note on the card which AC you're representing and be prepared to describe the general membership of your committee. Please confine your testimony to the position the committee took on particular issues and give minority opinions of the committee, if any. If you wish to provide your own public testimony or your own personal testimony, please fill out a separate blue card and submit it to the board staff. If your name is called and you are not present to testify, a second call will be made. Second calls are made after the midday and evening breaks if we have an evening session. If you receive your first call in the morning, you'll get your second call in the afternoon prior to um, any of the other first calls. If you receive your first call in the afternoon, you'll get your second call first in the evening after the dinner break, If again, if we hold an evening session. Um, if the board next meets in the morning, you'll get your second call first thing in the morning. If you meet, miss both your first and second calls, you're not going to be able to testify at this meeting. Also, the Board of Fisheries considers the allocation criteria when it's taking actions on propo proposals, which may affect allocation. I would highly encourage members of the public to reference elements of the allocation criteria in its oral testimony and written comment to the board, and copies of that criteria are available at the back table, at the executive director, or online. All right, so let's go ahead and begin public testimony. And the first person on my list is Julie Cavanaugh, representing the Kodiak AC. Mr. Executive Director. Madam Chair, just one note since I'm still trying to master this little black box that does our timer thing and we only have one AC rep, I'm just going to run her time on my cell phone timer uh, so that I don't 
mess up the uh, three minute timer thing here. So when you hear my cell phone beep, that's your 10 minute timer. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your service on the AC and um, please begin whenever you're ready. Welcome. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, board members, for um, taking public testimony today. Um, my name is Julie Cavanaugh. I've been on the Kodiak Advisory Committee for, I believe this is my third term. I'm the vice chair. Our committee met October 10th um, at the Vision Game Building in Kodiak, Alaska. Uh, we had um, 12 member, members present and held an election process during that meeting. Our members are, uh, are quasi-designated seats so that we have a broad spectrum of user groups on that panel. We have commercial fishers from different sectors throughout the island, set netters, saners, small boat, big boat, crab. We also have um, a harv uh, processor seat, trawl seat. Um, it's very diverse, and um, I believe that that is the process of, for that for a committee like that to kind of mash out the, the topics and get diverse perspectives. And you'll see in the minutes that we have that there is a diverse perspective throughout the, the COD proposals before you today. I think that our committee as a whole appreciates that process and, and that we can bring it forward to the board. Um, on the agenda, we picked up all the proposals on at this meeting, and we started, uh, let me get past the election here. We started with proposal one, uh, the Aleutian Island Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan, season dates, reporting, and landing requirements. That motion passed 13 to zero. We felt like this motion was a housekeeping motion and supported the staff's desire to, to do some cleanup on that for language. There was no objection from uh, the participants in the under 60 fleet. They th felt like it was good to clarify regulations because there's a few moving parts in that fishery. And that um, the rationale also included that the second trigger hasn't occurred, if the second trigger hadn't occurred by the time of the third trigger, they occur sim simultaneously. And this language really made that um, more clear to the harvesters. Proposal two, Aleutian Island Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan, restrict legal gear, increase pot limit, and total and limit total harvest. Uh, the motion passed nine to two. We had two members that abstained because they um, felt like they didn't understand the issue. We did have an election with some new members, and we also had some members that just were not familiar with the fishery at all, so they abstained from that vote. Uh, in support of proposal two, they recognized that, there, that, the, that the author wanted to align the AI management plan to be more similar with other state PCOD fisheries. They wanted to, but <clears throat> they wanted small boat and processors to have a better opportunity that would benefit local communities. The proposer um, was in the at the meeting and. Uh, and spoke to the fact that he was working with the ADAC community and that he felt the language that is now in that proposal would, would be um, embellished by input from the ADAC community and expected more language at this meeting today. Um, they felt like this uh, potential, the potential for this proposal would allow uh, pot boats and small boats able to make a better business plan that both processors and fishermen would benefit from that, being able to, because when you're making a decision around the area that you're gonna fish, if the, if the harvest rate is unstable, it's difficult to make the decision to go out to a remote, isolated area. Um, the, this, manage, this change in management would also support state waters habitat protection and reduce bycatch. In opposition, uh, there was a, lar a heavy concern about uh, what the trigger would be to allow harvest of any remaining GHL. Uh, they don't. They didn't want to see stranded fish in the in that in that district. Uh, this district does um, does have in its management plan currently triggers that um, allow to the harvest to be uh, um, the harvest. 
situation to change and add additional gear types and vessel sizes if they feel like the uh, GHL isn't going to get caught. Um, they were concerned that the proposal was still under development due to the due to changes that haven't happened since submission. The proser is not seeking to implement what he put in. It was it was it was not clear what the final proposal would do or intended to do. Um, there was a, a number of trawl um, representatives in the room, and they were concerned that with that they have historical use and that, that this proposal would adversely impact, impact that. Moving, moving on to proposal three and four, we picked those up semi simultaneously, and that motion failed one to nine with three abstain. And again, for the same reason, those people felt like they weren't familiar enough with the um, topic to to put a vote to put to vote the Aleutian Islands. Um, this these two proposals do exactly the same thing. They want to move uh, a, a, a trigger date of March fifteenth to March first, which allows larger boats, larger vessels to enter the fishery. Um, the in support of this motion, trawlers. Uh, spoke, trawl representatives spoke to the fact that they have historical use, that this trigger, move, this trigger move to March 1st would allow them to fish when the fish are aggregated, and that the March 15th date was fairly late, and, um, and that they also um, were concerned about increase in crab bycatch from fixed gear pot vessels. So they felt like if they had additional uh, opportunity that that they might positively impact uh, crab bycatch in that area. In opposition of this proposal, that they felt like the change would hurt the small boat fleet by further compressing the season and reducing safety. That the change would also increase bycatch. Uh, I think that when I think the. The difference there is maybe that the trawl, the trawl representatives were worried about crab bycatch. The opposition fixed gear fleet was worried about other ground fish bycatch, just to clarify that. Vessel operators, um, there was a vessel operator in the room that, that participated in a crab survey that they did for the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game where they were looking for crab in the area about two years ago. Uh, he, he, was, he found no crab in the area where the, this fishery operates and felt that the concern over crab bycatch was, was of no concern. Um, the next proposal, Proposal 5, um, <clears throat> uh, Reduce maximum size in the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict Pacific Management Plan. It failed one to nine with three abstains. Uh, in support, they felt the people in the room felt that there would be better fishing opportunity for small vessels, 55 feet and less, based in Unalaska. That it impacted a small area, basically Unalaska Bay, according to staff and that the historical area in that catch averaged only 5% of the GHL catch in the um, DHS. Opposition to this proposal, uh, the peop the, those representatives felt that this might be a non-issue with the change that was made at the council level on um, the jig rollovers becoming redefined, that it did cut off a lot of fishing grounds uh, and that if you look at 58 feet versus the 55 feet, it's really not a big difference um, in size. That it would make it difficult for boats to participate in voluntary measures to avoid Bering Sea red king crab. And that some and some members may abstain, not knowing enough uh, that oh, and in, in the opposition, some members did abstain, not knowing enough about the local area. I think I said that already. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <clears throat> Proposal number six, um, establish a new framework for setting the GHL. That motion failed two to 11. In support, uh, the members in the room 
felt that moving cod from the federal fishery to the GHL fishery harms Alaskan fishing businesses, that Alaska resident owners and cap that uh, there are Alaska resident owners, captains and crew in the federal fisheries that are, that are allowed to participate there, but not to participate in the GHL fishery, it don't, which only allows under 60 cod pot boat, under 60 cod boats. The federal fishery participants, including the Alaskan trawlers, is that 10 minutes? I have like a minute. It's up to you. I can, um, I can take I, questions. What, what I will allow you to do is just quickly summarize the positions that the AC took on the others, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I think that, um, wow, I talked too slow. I thought I had so much time. Um, uh, position number, our proposal number seven passed 13 to zero. That's uh, illegal gear and landing requirements. Um, uh, proposal eight passed 13 to zero. That was the season opener weather delay. Felt like it was a uh, housekeeping. Proposal nine, we made an amendment that passed 10 to one. And we also passed that motion 11 to one with one abstain. Proposal 10, we, we adopt, we passed that 13 to zero. And then proposal 161, with a lot of discussion, was tabled to our next regular meeting. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate that summary. And I will also just draw members' attention to AC1 in your RC1 binders. That's where you'll find um, the Kodiak AC report. Questions for Ms. Kavanaugh? Mr. Wood. Just one quick one, Julie, it's, it's your math. Uh, go to number two, proposal two. Was yes, the sir. vote nine in favor, none opposed, and two abstain, or was the vote nine in favor, two opposed, and two abstain? Nine, two, and two. We did have a member come in late, so if there's a number difference between some of the proposals, um, it should have been stated in the minutes, but we did have one member that came okay, in late. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Again, thank you for your report and thank you for your service on the AC. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, number uh, two on the public testimony list is Eric Velsko. Hi, Eric. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, for the record, my name is Eric Velsko. I'm a uh, participant in the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict Cod Fishery, um, one boat that participates in that. And I am opposed to proposal number six. Uh, our participation in the fishery started, I think, in 2019 when the cod crashed in the Gulf. We had gear. Um, I had just bought an LLP in the Gulf that was useless, basically. So we've we went to Ariel with our old boat and started um, started fishing cod there. Um, we ended up upgrading vessels, um, kind of jumped jumped all into that fishery, um, and I think looking at proposal six, I, I I don't see what the problem is or why we're going down this road. I think the fishery is functioning functioning as intended. Um, twenty twenty two, we harvested. Um, 90% of the quota by May, the rest of it got fished through, uh, throughout the summer. There's a couple smaller guys without LLPs that, that could participate this, in this fishery over the summer. And uh, I think we're up to 96 or 97%. So in my mind, that's a fully executed uh, fishery. Um, another benefit to this uh, fishery is just the open ac access nature of it. There's been numerous crew that have uh, expanded into other fisheries or bought into this fishery. There's, um, God, I would say probably half that fleet has either bought parts of the boats they run or bought into Bristol Bay or bought IFQs. Um, it's, been a, it's been a real benefit for the state. Um, and I want to kind of thank the board for, for supporting this fishery and thinking, thinking ahead um, when it was being implemented. I wasn't there at the beginning stages, but we were definitely um, benefiting in it, from it. Um, another aspect is the, is, is the Alaskan nature of the fishery, you know, we're almost, I think it's the last numbers we looked at was about 85% Alaskan owned and operated. 
um, for our operations, we do all our vessel maintenance in Alaska from, from Wrangell to Dutch Harbor. There's always something going on um, maintenance-wise. Um, uh, this is just one of the fisheries we do. We don't, I'm not going to say we're, we're a fully dependent on the state waters fishery, but every one of these fisheries is important to these smaller boats that we have to kind of roll it all into one big bundle, and that's, that's how we, we make up our whole year. So um, any reduction in quota down the line is going gonna, is gonna to affect your Alaskan participants. And I can take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Perfectly timed. Any questions for Mr. Vasco? Ms. Mitchell and then Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Eric, for your testimony today. Do you think it's appropriate in general to have some sort of cap on fishing harvest? Uh, through the chair, I don't think it's appropriate for a, for a state waters fishery. I, I just look at the Gulf as a good example. We've got 30% in Western Gulf and 25% in the Central Gulf that goes to state waters. And I think you kind of have to leave it open-ended like that. I don't think it's up to the state to prioritize the federal interest to make sure they're um, fully um, compensated for. We, you know, this quota fluctuates with the abundance of the uh, cod. I mean, that's how it's set up. It's, it looks a little bit exaggerated right now because we have this 1% increase every year, but that's going to end at 15% and then we're capped out and then it is what it is. So um, I think putting an artificial cap in right now and tiers and uh, just overcomplicates the management. We don't need to go down that road. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was basically the same question I was going to ask. There, there is a cap, basically. Um, it's a performance cap, and it, it ends at 15 or 16 percent, correct? Through the chair, Mr. Jensen, yeah. The 15 percent would be the overall cap, and we'll reach that, I think we're, uh, we still got a few years to go before we reach that, but we've been fully uh, harvesting, you know, the, to the parameters of the fishery, you know, harvested within 90% every year. So um, and we're slowly going up. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in your opinion, Eric, is it seems like that fishery is pretty stable, stabilized now. I'm looking at the vessels and participating. It looks like it's Sort of staying in the in the same area for the last couple three or four years. It was at forty at one time. Now it's down into the mid twenties and in that area. So it, it, from what I see in the paper, I mean the stuff we read here and are told about, it, it looks like it's fairly stable. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Jensen. Yeah, I think it's it, it's it's kind of a function of how other fisheries are doing too. You know, if it's a big salmon year, sometimes you'll have less participation. If it's, if it's salmon's a little slower, you might get a couple more boats, but it's a tough fishery. I mean, I've, I've fished out there for 15 years on big boats and um, freezer long liners and crab boats and that, that little boat fishery. It's a, it's a tough fishery. It's not meant for everyone. So I don't think you'll have this massive increase in boats. We haven't seen it yet. We've, like you said, it's leveled out. Um, on average, 27 boats. We've been up to 40, you know, so 27 to 30 boats. That's kind of the who you're going to get for to to be involved in a fishery like that. Thank you. Uh, so you're still capped at 60 pots. You haven't had any increases in the pot limit since you've been out there. Through the chair, no, uh, they kept it at 60. They they did raise the pot limit here the last, I think month or so towards the end here, they, they gave them a little bit of an increase to see if they could, if that would help uh, achieve the remainder of the GHL. But uh, for the most part, it's been a 60 pot fishery since its inception. Thank you, Eric. Mr. Heimbuck. Just one question. Does the variability in cod prices affect participation in a meaningful way like it does in jig fishing? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Heimbuck. Yeah, I mean, that'll if it looks like a better price, you might have a couple more entrants. If it's if it's going to be a downturn in price, guys might not decide to go. There is a core fleet, like every other fleet in Alaska, there's a core fleet of guys that's always going to go out and fish cod. Um, so, it, but there is some fluctuation there based on 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 market prices. Thanks for your testimony today. Next up is Peter Neaton.
Hi, Peter. And I think it's 11.03, so if you have a blue card in your hand, bring it up to the front. If not, uh, sign up for public testimony is now closed. Welcome, Peter. Madam Chair and the Board, uh, my name is Peter Neaton. I'm captain and part owner of a 58-foot vessel that participates in the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict sub Pot Cod Fishery. I'm an Alaskan resident. I split my time between Homer and Dutch Harbor. I'm commenting in opposition to Proposal 6, the tiered quota structure. I've participated in the Dutch Harbor Pot Cod Fishery every year since its inception in 2014, first as a deckhand, working my way up to captain and vessel owner. Currently, this is the only fishery in which I participate. I have employed at least seven crew members that have gone on to purchase either their own fishing permit, IFQ, or commercial vessel. Others have purchased real estate in Alaska. We, the residents through the Alaska Board of Fish, work to create this fishery, gaining control and management from the federal sector, and I feel that this should not change. Accepting Proposal 6 will return quota back to the federal sector. The tiered quota structure is a pr proposed fix to something that is not broken. The Dutch Harbor Subdistrict Pot Fleet is largely owned and operated by Alaskan residents. This fishery has created great opportunity for young people in the state, myself included. I feel there is nothing wrong with the current quota structure and therefore no need for the proposed tiered conditional quota system. Let's not give up what we've already worked to create. I urge you to vote no on Proposal 6. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone on the board, the staff, and the department for all your work in making these fisheries possible. Thank you for your testimony, Peter. Are there any questions? Appreciate your being here today. Thanks. Thanks. Cody Thomason. Welcome, Cody. Put yourself on the record and begin when you're ready. Thank you. My name is Cody Thomason. I was born and raised in Wrangell, Alaska. Uh, fourth generation Alaska commercial fisherman. Been working as a deckhand since I was a little kid. And I started pot cutting about five years ago in 2018. Um, it's, a, it's been a really good opportunity for me. Since I started pot cutting, I have became part owner in the boat and now a relief skipper. And, uh, a little nervous, sorry. <laughs> You're doing great. It is, a. Uh, I am opposed to six. I think that the system that we have now is very good and helpful to young fishermen trying to get into the program. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wood. I'm really interested in incentivizing young people to get into the fishery. How is it you feel the present system does that? Uh, just that it's you don't have to spend so much money on a permit. If you have a way into an operation, you can work your way up to be captain without much overhead costs. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, thank you for your testimony, Cody. Yeah, like you said that you've, since you've started fishing on this boat, you've had an opportunity to buy in to the boat, is that correct? Yes, a minority ownership in the boat. And have you seen that happen with uh, other boats in the, in the fleet? Or it seems like that's sort of a common thread. There is a couple other boats that I know of. Okay. But. Thanks for your testimony, Clay. Yeah. Thank you for being Thanks. here today. Appreciate it. Chuck McCallum. Welcome, Chuck. Put yourself on the record and begin when you're ready. 
Yes, I'm Chuck McCallum. I'm the fishery advisor for the Lake and Peninsula Borough, and the communities of the Chignik area are within the jurisdiction of the borough. And I'm here to testify in opposition to proposal number nine, which, if enacted, would remove vessel registration exclusivity for all state water jig fisheries. The exclusive, the exclusive registration approach was created for a reason, to protect the small boat fleets of communities local to the fishery. The Jignik communities are stressed enough with struggling with low salmon returns without cutting away Jignik super exclusive status for the jig fishery. The super exclusive Jignik GHL is designed to promote the jig fishery opportunity for the small boat vessel Jignik fishermen and not for a large vessel statewide jig fleet. And the reason there's no active jig fishing in Chignik in recent years is that there is no local processor to provide tender service for the small boat fleet. This problem will not be solved by doing away with Chignik super exclusive status. Please vote no on proposal number nine. Thanks, Chuck. Questions? Mr. Jensen and Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for your testimony, Chuck. So right now, at this time, because there's no processor, you haven't had any of your <clears throat> local boats out fishing in that area, right? Not for jig. Okay. There's, both, there's other boats that participate in the pot fishery, I yes. suppose. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, John. Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, my question was similar to the one Mr. Jensen asked. Um, considering the fact that, you know, I mean, unfortunately, years ago, there was, there was a fire with the, the facility that was there, and for a jig fishery to be executed, it's quite a transit to try and take those fish to Kodiak, for example. Um, has the community or has the borough looked at fisheries like this that are currently on the books where there's opportunity for the people in Chignik to try and provide some sort of opportunity for those fish to potentially be processed in the future so that this GHL that's accessible right now could be utilized? And Mr. Carpenter, thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, yes, uh, there's been some thought put into that, but it's a heavy lift to try to um, uh, provide uh, those services in, uh, under the conditions that we have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today, Chuck. Todd Hop. Oh. Hop. Hi, Todd. Madam Chair, members of the board, for the record, my name is Todd Hoppe and I reside in Homer. Uh, I own and operate a 58 foot boat that I pot fish for Pacific Cod and Black Cod. Over the many years, I have fished state waters in Cook Inlet, Kodiak, Chignik, Aereo, the Dutch Harbor Air Fishery, and, out, and the Aleutians out in ADAC. I'm opposed to proposals five and six. The Dutch Harbor Aereo fishery has been a very successful fishery, through, especially for the past process of the Board of Fish. This fishery and all the other state fisheries are extremely well managed. Um, Come very re reliant on this fishery, as you all, many of you all know, we've lost more and more of our federal fisheries access in the Bering Sea, and we, and we lost our, our federal fisheries in the Gulf. Um, I normally fish federal waters in Kodiak, and then move either out the area or the Aleutians. So we come very reliant on this fishery, and some of the Gulf is starting to come back now. And uh, I just wanted to stress that point, you know, and these are. This is a very tough fishery. It's very expensive equipment. And uh, so we're, you know, we put a lot of service work back into Dutch Harbor and different Kodiak and Homer to maintain these boats and the pots. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm in at, at awe in this fishery that it's brought the opportunities, you know, for new entrants. Just like the gentleman three times, three uh, people before me, I believe his name was Cody. I just met him last night, you know. I pull into Dutch Harbor and I see the, the skippers on these boats. I'm just in awe, you know, and I read these articles about the grain and the fleet, you know. Well, I think they're talking about me, you know. I mean, I, and, it, and I'm getting that point in my life, 
you know, I'm going to need a Cody. And two of my deckhands have, uh, have bought salmon permits and boats, and I'm lucky enough that one of them still comes back and fishes with me in the winter because it's a salmon fishery. You know? And this is all Alaskan Bay. All my crew is from Alaska. All, you know, and, and you heard in earlier testimony not to read here. It's 85% of us are Alaskans. And uh, I just want the last thing I want to say is, is I really enjoy state waters fishing. Um, you know, it's really extremely well managed and it's actually fun to work with Asian and Mark and different people in this fishery. And I just want to say that because we never get to see everybody in the room but for every three years. So with that, um, I think I'll finish my testimony and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Boy. Any questions? Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Todd. Have you been in this fishery ever since it started? Madam Chair, um, Mr. Jensen, no, it was a little late coming. I believe 99 was my first year out in the Aleutians, and then I took some time off. You know, some things fluctuated then. IFQs were really big. Um, so I really started fishing cod heavy in, in uh, it would have been about 2009, fully dedicated to it. So you've been participating in the, the state water fishery? Consist yes, since consistently inception. since 2009, correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very today. much. I appreciate it. Bernie Burkholder. Hi, Bernie, welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, my name is Bernie Burkholder. Uh, I no longer reside in Alaska. I, I live in Biloxi, Mississippi. There's not a lot of snow shoveling there, so, uh, but I spend a lot of time here still. Uh, I'm here today to uh, say that I oppose five and six and three. Uh, a lot of the reasons that are already stated, I don't need to repeat things you've already heard, but I think the state and the federal are two important things. They're not at odds with each other. They can work together. And I, I do believe that uh, we need to stay with the management we've got. The state water fishery program has worked. I started fishing cod in, uh, wow, 2000. Uh, actually before that, 1989 in Kodiak, uh, in processing the product myself. So I've got a long history. Right now, we're part of a core group in ADAC that has consistently fished product out of there. We have delivered to the shore plant when there was an opportunity to do so. When that failed, we were hurt fairly severely with, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars that didn't get paid, but we've stayed put there. We stay, we, we start and we finish at the very end. Uh, I have a boat, I have one boat that's 58 foot. And I have another one that's 78 foot. The 78 footer has, has been there the longest. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not so difficult to catch fish in ADAC. It is difficult to deliver it and get paid for it. And I, I don't mean to be smart about it, it's just that's the, the challenge. And you need a group of boats that work together and that can coordinate and the logistics of getting fish back to ADAC, or back to Dutch Harbor, King Cove, Akatan. And we've done that. We actually last year had tenders that, that they, they paid the tendering costs. We paid tendering costs for two years, and it was significant. So I think the, the fishery is working in the right direction. Uh, I want to protect my participation, my catch history. Uh, I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Mr. Wood. Bernie, did you come up here? To testify only, or were you up in Alaska anyway? No, I came to testify only. That's impressive. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for making the trek. Appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Next up is Michael Stoltz. Hi, Michael. Hey, Welcome. Now. Hello. My name is Michael Stoltz. I'm from Chugiak, Alaska, in South Central. Um, I would just like to say that uh, this cod fishery has been one of my main incomes. I, it's something that I've relied on when the crab fisheries have disappeared, the shrimp fisheries have disappeared. It's uh, just one of these, it's not, the, it's not a high paying fishery, but it's a reliable fishery that gets you through the winter. And uh, I uh, want to uh, just encourage more management and maybe uh, consider, because we've lost crab fisheries and we're more reliant on this cod fishery, the, the gray and the black, that uh, maybe we exercise some uh, restraint in uh, when we close down a crab fishery, maybe the trawl fleet doesn't still get a percentage of the crab for bycatch. Um, anything we can do to... Used to, it used to fish nine, ten months out of the year, and uh, down to five, six months out of the year now because of uh, fisheries going away. And, uh, I just feel that this is like uh, almost like the gas pipeline. It's like the one last thing that uh, might have an opportunity to buy into someday to make some, you know, make a, uh, a reasonable living in a fishery. I just uh, want to thank the board for for allowing me to speak and please continue to protect this fishery. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, me and my crew, uh, we're relying on it. It's, uh, just want to thank you for your time. Thanks, Michael. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Next up is Bill Stoltz. Welcome, Representative. Nice to see you. Uh, good morning. I'm Bill Stoltz. I'm from uh, Chugiak, uh, born just a couple blocks away downtown here. So I won't tell you how many years I've been in Alaska, but, but um, I want to first put a dis uh, dis uh, disclosure on the record. I do some very limited lobbying for the Matsu Borough on primarily on uh, Cook Inlet fisheries. So. I will be full, more full-throated uh, uh, participant uh, next year, I guess, or the year after. But, uh, but uh, the Matsu Borough doesn't have any interest in cod, except for on the broader issue of uh, on those fisheries about bycatch, and and uh, encourage the, the state board and state entities to work with uh, with the feds to to limit that as a as a broader goal. Uh, I was very compelled by the testimony of. Uh, of Cody and I believe the gentleman a couple before him that uh, that uh, about uh, we heard a lot about the grain of the fleet and listened to many presentations. Well, you, there's the antidote for that is this opposing number six. My old boss Rick Halford said, "If it ain't broke, government will try to fix it till it is." We have something that seems to be working for for. Um, Younger, smaller, younger people, smaller entities to uh, enter the system. Uh, would sure like to encourage that to keep going. I didn't know a lot about cod when Clem Tillian would visit and spend a time chatting with him over his multiple cups of tea. He would talk about the cod fishery and Alaskanizing, and and if God hadn't called him to do some other things, he'd probably be here testifying today as well. But um, this uh, proposal six. Uh, I think it takes a uh, takes a step backwards, and um, I just uh, watching. Uh, a lot of people have been surprised. I was always a sport fishing legislator, and I guess now the deep dark secret is out. My I have a brother that's been heavily involved in the commercial fisheries, and I'm proud of him and his work ethic, and the thousands of other Alaskans who do as well. So, uh, strongly oppose uh, proposal six. Um, Let's not step. Uh, let's not step backwards uh, on something that appears to be working. And I hope to hear more uh, anecdotes about from people like Cody and 
others who see this as their opportunity to participate uh, at, a, at an achievable level, that, uh, something they can really, uh, it's, uh, it's, I guess, for the little guy or, or, or woman. So with that, I thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Bill. Looks like Mr. Wood has a question. And that was timed right, I guess. Perfect. It must be practice. Yeah, Madam Chairman, it's not often that we have people come up and testify with the background that this particular witness has. I, I would I'd like to ask you, Chairman Stoltz, uh, yesterday or day before, we were hearing a difficulty in getting research dollars put into the budget. Uh, when you were chair of the House Finance, uh, what was your experience in, in listening to the the consistency and, and getting money devoted towards nothing other than research. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wood. Both the in and out of my constituency, we had a lot of challenges with federal dollars and we uh, for crab research and other federal fisheries and, and state federal mix to, to supplant that. So we uh, core research is one of the most important things we have. Uh, so we're, we're, we're guiding by biology. And and there's an old axiom, if you don't take credit or make too many waves, uh, don't send out too many signals, uh, people don't notice how much you're doing. Work together with, uh, with other, some other legislators. We got over $7 million in research at various levels for uh, fisheries from the uh, Kuskokwim and Yukon into the Susitna drainages, uh, which, are, which were more important to me, but we tried not to be parochial. And, took advantages of projects like Susitna and NAB extra research opportunities out of there. But, you know, $7 million, we didn't put a newsletter out on it because generally we, we uh, I'd rather get it done than, uh, than have a, uh, 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 make a statement about what we accomplished. Just have one last question. Would you be willing to offer your services with Chairman uh, Mitchell, who's going to be chairing the research committee here? and see, uh, give her some advice back and forth as to how best to approach some of these issues? Yeah, on this and other fisheries. The Matsu Borough is in the process of making their priorities. Uh, 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 one of the members of the Assembly, Jesse Sumner, his number one item was core research for increased weirs and genetic sampling uh, with the statement that uh, to make accurate and good management decisions, you have to have the core research and science. So that, that should be a top priority, and the Matsu Borough makes that a top priority on the fisheries of which they've stated and been involved with. Thank you, Madam Chair, for bearing with me on this. It's just an opportunity that we're not going to see again. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to, to converse with the old sage. Thank you for being here today, Bill. Appreciate your testimony. Robert Gunderson. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, thank you for letting us testify here. Um, I'm just uh, want to be on record for opposing uh, Proposition Six. Um, I guess I'd be a longtime fisherman of the Dutch Harbor fishery out there. I started out there in 2003. We fished every year since out there, so that was before it was uh, a state water fishery or anything. Uh, I did spend three years on the AP for the Management Council, and at that time, uh, Dutch Harbor, uh, less than 60-foot uh, fishery, was the last open access fishery that uh, was out there. And I know the council was trying to preserve that, uh, and it still is. Uh, this with the uh, State Board of Fish making the uh, uh, state water fishery here, to me, that seems like that uh, accomplished everything that the council was trying to do with uh, making a true small boat fishery that, uh, that can uh, go for more than just a couple of weeks. Uh, the, uh, the idea of putting a cap on it, it just seems wrong to me in that uh, if you put a cap on anything, you're just in the nature of everything, you're probably going to uh, start to limit participation. Uh, when I started out, uh, out in Dutch Harbor out there, uh, there were three or four of us, and with the state water fishery, it's went up as high as 40, and it's fluctuated a little bit since then. Uh, 
you're also with uh, a side benefit of it. You're taking some pressure off of other state water fisheries. Uh, we've had boats from Sandpoint fishing there, which is uh, taking pressure off of the Area M state water fishery. So there are a lot of benefits to it. Um, I guess I would kind of drop back to the, uh, if it's don't broke, uh, don't fix it. Uh, I think uh, I think it's working real, real well, just the way it is, and it's uh, uh, still giving room for more boats to enter if they uh, if they want to. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Appreciate your testimony today. Okay. Ernie Weiss. Welcome, Ernie. Good to see you. Good to see you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, for the record, my name is Ernie Weiss. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Aleutians East Borough. My testimony today is in an opposition to Proposal 6 that would limit, and I believe, reduce the GHL for the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict in future years. The borough includes communities from Akatan to Sandpoint, Port Moeller and Nelson Lagoon, False Pass, Cold Bay and King Cove. The borough is responsible for maintaining schools within the borough and building community infrastructure like docks, harbors, and airports, and we're able to do this in part through taxes on fish delivered uh, to our onshore processing plants. We support the current uh, fishery management plan for the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict. Many of our local home ported vessels and fishermen participate in this fishery that is uh, more than 50% within our borough waters. Uh, the fish vessels in this fishery deliver their fish to local shore plants or to tenders delivering on shore, supporting local community and borough fish tax. Um, the fishery occurs in state waters under state rules, that is open access, but limited to vessels 58 foot and under using pot gear and limited to 60 pots. Uh, because the GHL is a percentage of the Bering Sea sub area, uh, ABC, it necessarily goes up and down as the ABC goes up and down. And the GHL has been fully harvested every year, this year so far 96% as we've heard. I would note that three of our communities are member communities of the local Bering Sea CDQ group, APICTA, and we consider APICTA a close partner, uh, but we do not support this proposal. Uh, we support the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict fishery that supports local families and provides fish taxes for borough and local communities. I would also Mention we're supportive of the department proposals and tentatively proposal 161 at this time and we'll uh, probably look at that again at the March meeting and I would also note the Sandpoint AC got their minutes in late but they are in opposition to proposal 6 as well. Thank you for the time. Thank you Ernie. Mr. Jensen. Thank you Madam Chair. Thanks for your testimony Ernie. Um, I thought I heard you say 50% of the participants are from uh, your your Lucian East Borough area was that? Did I hear that correctly? I I meant to say if you look at a map, the fishery is fifty percent within our waters. Okay, thanks. Okay, but you do have a lot of participants. From there. Yes, I couldn't tell you how many. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just want to thank Mr. Weiss and the borough. Uh, they sponsored one of the legs of a trip for several of us on the body to go out this summer and, and meet with the. The fishermen out in, in their particular area and gave us a boat ride from Cold Bay because of transportation issues. And, but other than that, the trip went very, very smooth and learned an awful lot and was glad to be able to talk to the, the fishermen in those areas. And I would encourage other members to take advantage of any similar offers that might be forthcoming in the future. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. We are happy to have you. Mr. Heimbach. Would you happen to know how many... Uh, under 60 trawl vessels are home potered in Sandpoint with residential owners? I could tell you an exact number, but I would, uh, the overwhelming majority are, are vessels that participate in the salmon fishery, so they're necessarily 58 foot and under. And so they take that opportunity to go up and fish cod in the state water fisheries. But I'm sorry, I can't give you a specific number. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank I appreciate you. you being here. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. As Mr. Weiss pointed out, um, we do have as RC5 the uh, minutes from the Sandpoint Advisory Committee in addition to the two other ones that are in your RC1 binder. Uh, 
Everett Anderson. Welcome, Everett. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Everett Anderson. I'm the Senior Vice President at Bristol Bay Seafood Investments. I'm originally from Dillingham, Alaska, and uh, did spend time commercial fishing growing up and spent some time out in the Bering Sea as well. Um, I'm here to uh, share our support of the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan Proposal Number 6. Um, the proposal is intended to recognize the importance of state water opportunities for Alaskans while balancing the historical dependency on the federal Pacific Cod fishery for the 65 coastal communities in the CDQ program, 31 villages within the Bristol Bay region, and other Alaskan participants in the federal cod sectors. It is our hope uh, that this proposal will minimize the impacts on BBSI's investments in the freeze along line sector and other fisheries while providing state water participation and growth in the area of fishery. In addition, the slower performance in the, in the fishery this year relative to the past years uh, suggests that a modification to the fishery uh, may be warranted to prevent stranded cod in the state waters. A substantial source of BBSI's income is from the harvesting activities in the fisheries of the BSAI. BBSI's investment and operational focus on the BSAI were initiated through the investment in the freezer longline sector in 2019. Our parent, the Bristol Bay Native Corporation, was formed through the passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971 and is dedicated to the mission of enriching our native way of life. BBNC works to ensure the prosperity and well-being of our 11,600 shareholders through investments in our region and innovation through, throughout our business operations, including our seafood business line. Uh, Alaska Native corporations like BBNC are an important economic development driver, and uh, there is a uniqueness to Alaska and, and the United States. BBNC has made significant uh, contributions uh, to our shareholders uh, since inception, whether it's through shareholder training, uh, economic development opportunities for uh, shareholders, uh, education through our education development fund, um, and even you know preparing some of the up and coming shareholders to participate in the uh, investments that we do manage and own at BBNC, including our our seafood business line. Uh, with that, uh, we hope that you agree that Proposal 6 is a reasonable modification uh, of the existing ABC. And thank you for your careful attention to, the, to this item and appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you for your service. Well done, Everett. Good timing. Mr. Wood. Thank you. And this question may be misdirected because there's so many organizations that start with Bristol Bay this, Bristol Bay that. But is not your organization the one that also funds and operates the test line? I'm sorry, Mr. Wood, the, the last word through the chair, the, the which? The test line that uh, is crossed uh, further on up from Port Muller. That is, no, that's a different organization. Different organization altogether. Another BB. Okay, yeah, no kidding. Uh, you were saying that the, the proposal six, if I understood you correctly, was addressing a, a concern about possibility of, of stranding cod in the state sector, yet they're being successful consistently in harvesting what they have available to them. Am I missing something here? Uh, through the chair, I, yeah, I, I'm going to defer a response here. There may be some additional information that comes through some other testimony that speaks a little bit more to that. And I think it's documented in some of the data that's been provided as well. Um, so I'll. Okay, that. that's yeah. fair. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Everett. Um, has your organization considered buying into this fishery by building 58-foot boats for this fishery, or is that something that's out of your, that you can't do? Uh, through the Chair, so uh, great question. And so the, again, through the investment that we've made uh, currently in the seafood sector, uh, that really was kind of a um, coming back from a, hi a hiatus uh, from being in previously involved in the seafood space when BBNC owned Peter Pan uh, in the late 70s. Um, the, the 
operations, the holding company, if you will, for seafood operations, does explore other strategic investment opportunities. And uh, currently, that there's a lot of exploration going on. OK, thank you. Sure. Appreciate your testimony today. Thank, thank you very you much. for being here. Patty O'Donnell. Hi, Patty. Welcome. Yeah, good morning. So, for the record, Patrick O'Donnell from uh, Kodiak. I have an 85 foot trawler. Uh, been living and fishing out of Kodiak for 32 years. I also sit on the Kodiak Advisory Committee in the designated trawl seat. I have two kids down there, 20 year old son that uh, works on the boat with me and a 23-year-old daughter, so that's what we do for a living. Uh, I oppose number two, proposal number two. I support three and four, and I support number six, and I'll start with uh, number six. So I think I had a hard time when this got increased from 8% up to the 15% with the fact that as an Alaskan, that only does feather fisheries, with the exception of Prince William Sound, Pollock fishery, which I participate in when I can, that uh, you're taking fish away from Alaskans to give to Alaskans. And my kids were born and raised here, and I felt it was a bit of a slap in the face to me and many other people in the trawl fisheries that uh, are Alaskans and have invested in the community of Kodiak and, and, and other places in Alaska. I, 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 I don't think it's the right approach, so I'm in support of, of uh, limiting limiting that uh, uh, fish going from the feather fishery into the GHL fishery. I think that as time goes on, we've seen in 2018, on spec, two vessels were bought, 58 footers. People walked out of the meeting, and two vessels that were already built were outfitted. You're going to see that as things increase. You've got to remember this 15% is 15%, but as the quota goes up, that means a hell of a lot more fish. So there is room for expansion there if you look at past history of quota and uh, increases in quota. It's not just, oh, it's capped, we're going to stay at this arbitrary number. That's not going to be the case. It's going to increase. You can see that in some of the data that staff presented up upwards of 72 million pounds going into the GHL if there was uh, no cap based on past uh, tax in the federal fishery. So uh, the other thing you got to address is the impact on king crab stocks. We've seen what's going on in, with, with king crab, and we've heard about the high takes of king crab in the in, in the state water pot cod fishery. There's no observer coverage, so the state needs to look at getting some kind of observer program in the in the pot cod fishery within, within that state uh, management program. And, and, and that's beneficial to the stocks, which uh, no, no data coming out of, but uh, anyway, I think that's an important factor. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Questions? Appreciate your being here this morning. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. This is Eric Deakins. Good morning, Madam Chair. Welcome, Eric. So um, I'm Eric Deacon from Coastal Villages Region Fund. I'm the, the CEO there. <clears throat> I'd like to take the opportunity this morning to provide comment on proposal number six, the proposal to establish a new framework for setting annual state water Pacific cod GHLs for Area O. We helped craft this proposal and are in support of it. Uh, Coastal Villages Region Fund, or CVRF, is the largest of the six Alaska Community Development Quota Program groups. The CDQ program was created in 1992 in order to help address persistent poverty in remote Western Alaska communities and a historic lack of access to Bering Sea federal fisheries. Uh, this, there's been some misunderstanding about the program in this current process. Uh, to be clear, CDQ groups have boards of directors who live in our respective communities. We serve actual residents of our 65 communities <clears throat> and none of our groups have shareholders that live out of state. 
CVRF administer various programs that distribute benefits to our residents. We do not give cash payouts. Uh, rather, we are the economic development engine for our communities. Uh, the CVRF re uh, region itself has 9,900 residents and 20 communities uh, located uh, below the Yukon through the Costco and Delta. Uh, our region is culturally rich, but economically poor. We have a high percentage of households on food stamps, some of the lowest per capita income of communities in the state. Profit from our cod long line fishing vessels is directly utilized in some of the benefit programs we administer, such as home heating oil donation, boardwalk construction, scholarships, and most recently, uh, donations and logistics related to the damage in our region caused by uh, Typhoon Murbach. Um, CVRF operates two vessels in the freezer long line cod sector, which fish the Bering Sea about 10 months a year and offload in Dutch Harbor. Uh, we regularly buy fuel, grocery services, um, and other things in Dutch Harbor and pay Alaska landing taxes just like GHL fishers. It's been implied here in previous testimony before the board that the CDQ program is somehow uh, belongs to outside corporate interests. That cannot be further from the truth. We are an all Alaska nonprofit program created by some of the most pro Alaskan policymakers in our state's history. CDQ's charge has remained unchanged from its inception to socially and economically benefit our communities in remote regions and the entire state. Profit from each pound of fish we harvest goes directly to programs that benefit Alaskan communities uh, most in need. We do not come here today to propose a taking or creating an allocation fight. We simply ask for a revisited approach that is based on data and fairness. Thank you, Eric. Are there any questions? Seeing none, appreciate your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Abby Duffy. Good morning, Abby, welcome. Good morning, thank you. Uh, I'm Abby Duffy. I live in Tilkeetna, Alaska. I'm the deck boss on trawl vessel Miss Leona. I'm a former research biologist. I'm a former NIMPS fishery observer, Alaska resident. Um, I'm opposing proposal two, which seeks to align the AI cod management plan with other state cod plans. Uh, alignment of plans assumes there's similarities between these fisheries. But fishing in the AI is different. The fish are different, the hydrology is different, the bathymetry is different, the weather is different, and the needs of, of uh, excuse me, the needs of the communities are different. Uh, the fish are not yet caught this year. Um, they're likely to get stranded in the water because we're late in the season. Um, so this proposal would remove historically dependent boats from the fishery, like the boat that I fish on. Um, and this would be directly opposed to standard one of the Magnuson-Stevenson's Act for optimal yield of a fishery. Um, I am also uh, for proposal three and four um, because for trawl vessels to catch fish in the Aleutian Islands, the timing is very important. Um, cod trawlers don't just go out and set their gear and scoop up fish. Uh, it seems to be a major misconception. Um, the captains will actually search out fish in the few areas uh, that they actually fish in for days looking for a suitable school of fish uh, before setting gear. And this is actually uh, one of the most effective bycatch mitigation measures because when the cod are schooled up, the other fish move out of the way. Um, so this aggregation of cod in the AI usually occurs in early March. Um, and then they disperse again very quickly. So uh, sometimes the start date of March 15th is too late. Um, I would like to also clarify that the AI trawl fleet is not a lot of vessels. It, over the last 10 years, there's been an average of four vessels per year, trawl vessels. And many of those were under 60 foot boats. Um, so for successful participation, uh, the opening of March 1st, is needed for the AI trawl fleet. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Mr. Wood has a question. Yeah, thank you. On uh, proposal three particularly, uh, the trawler's asking it to push back to March 1, but they didn't ask that the pot folks be pushed back to March 1 also. Why not? Uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure about the answer for that. 
I didn't write the proposal. Um, I don't think that they would be opposed to that. The, the trawlers would not be opposed to that. You're talking about the larger pot vessels? I'm sorry, sir. Are you talking about the larger pot vessels? Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that the trawl vessels would be opposed to including them in that change of start date. Okay. And how many uh, trawl vessels are currently fishing? You gave us an average of four. But last year, how many fished a fishery? Uh, this past year, I believe there were six. Um, so it's been an average of four over 10 years with a low, I think, of two and a high of six. Um, so it's, it's not much more than the average. And okay. um, I would like to add that uh, all of the boats that did fish, the trawl vessels, uh, they all delivered to tenders, uh, with the exception of the boat that I fish on, which uh, had to gut the fish and bring them back because we deliver shoreside always. Thank you. Sure. Doesn't look like I see any more questions. Thank you for being here and testifying today. Yeah, sure, thanks. Next up is Julie Cavanaugh. Welcome back, Julie. It's <laughs> madly typing back there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, board members. My name is Julie Cavanaugh. I'm from Kodiak, Alaska. Our fishing family is 100% dependent on fishing for our living. We operate in federal and state waters, Pacific cod fisheries, and a handful of other fisheries managed by the state. Our family participated since 1991, building and growing state Pacific cod fisheries in the Gulf and Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. Our vessel, the Sylvia Star, was one of five vessels in the Bering Sea in 2001 the second year of effort in this fishery. We are heavily dependent on these fisheries and have no federal quota shares that supplement or sustain our vessels and crew. I support the ADAC community's efforts utilizing Proposal 2 to modify the Aleutian Islands subdistrict management area that would stabilize and encourage deliveries to local onshore processors. I oppose Proposals 3 and 4 that seek to move the March 15th trigger to March 1st in the Aleutian Islands for trawl gear. The council took action in December of 2021 to rationalize the trawl pot peacod fishery for the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands. This program is intended to slow the fishery, provide safety, and improve utilization of the cod. It is therefore possible for this trawl fleet to choose the timing and effort of their federal fishery to link seamlessly with the current March 15th trigger date. Leaving the current trigger in place allows the under 60 vessels to continue harvesting and operating in a safe and mindful manner over a longer period of time during the most productive portion of their season. The trigger we are talking about causes a frenzied approach for those small vessels to meet necessary economic thresholds in, an, in a diverse uh, and expensive place to operate. By putting the date two weeks early, you are undermining and disenfranchising those small boats that commonly fish methodically, provide predictable harvest to processors, and deliver a high quality of product. I understand Proposal 5 was withdrawn by the author, but we, while we expect no action to be taken, it is important to note that we are adamantly opposed to that proposal. I oppose Proposal 6. The state of Alaska should manage the fish inside their waters. That The TAC and the GHL are currently managed for Pacific cod based on abundance, and the ABC is set using scientific data and federal TAC and state GHL are proportioned from there. Proposal 6 is misleading and suggests that that apportionment should be based on abundance when it already is. Furthermore, that, that in years of low abundance, that state fishers should bear a heavier burden of conservation than the federal participants is not interesting to me, and relinquishing a did it again, didn't I? If you have a, a very succinct closing statement, I'll let you go. It's not very succinct, Madam Chair. <laughs> All right, then. Any questions for Julie? <laughs> Seeing and hearing none, um, Julie, we have Committee of the Whole, and um, that will be an opportunity to, to add some additional information. Thank it's, you for it's your It's been testimony. a while in person, so it's, I need to get it hard down, I can tell. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on, uh, Hannah Heimbuck. Thanks for your honesty, by the way, Julie. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi,
Hi, Hannah, welcome. Hi there, Madam Chair. My name is Hannah Heimbuck, uh, Executive Director of the Under 60 Cod Harvesters and a commercial salmon fisherman from Kodiak. We oppose proposal number six. This says at times of low abundance, the federal share of the resource grows while the state share shrinks. At high abundance, the federal quota grows while the state quota is capped. That's not abundance-based management. To me, that's a federal priority and a preemptive restriction to state water fishermen only. So just generally, as you are thinking about any action today, I'd ask that you consider whether you're assigning your state water pot cod sector greater restrictions than are imposed on any other cod sector, including the industrial trawl and longliners who stand to benefit most from this transition. So where would that fish go? 10% uh, about to CDQ, and of what's left, about 40% to trawl and about 50% to freezer longline. These are robust, successful sectors. But there are consequences to moving that quota offshore, right? There's habitat consequences because both bottom and pelagic trawl gear have significant contact with the ocean floor, and consequences to species like halibut. In 2021, three of the largest peacod sectors, just when they were fishing cod, had a total halibut bycatch mortality of 2.5 million pounds. So that's a lot of fish to us, and we need to consider what happens when those numbers go up while state fisheries go down. And I think it's important to note that we're not hearing from the majority of the businesses that would receive that quota and then add it back into some highly valuable rationalized catch share systems. To me, that's odd um, because I don't really think that this is a conversation about Alaskans versus Alaskans. I think this is a conversation about whether or not to set a federal priority for resource management. And you know, some of the non-CDQ companies that are familiar advocates that would benefit most from a federal priority, whether we're talking about cod or halibut or salmon, um, we haven't heard from them in comments, and, and I think that their views are important here. In summary, the, the CDQ programs are excellent, enormously successful programs. These are really positive things for Alaska. I think they're well positioned to participate in the state cod fishery, like some CDQs already have, or to increase the federal share um, of the CDQ programs if they think that that is needed. And I'm really glad that Alaskans are finding diverse ways to benefit from fishery resources. But the success of those program investments don't negate the need for diversified, thriving open access fisheries and for small boat fishing opportunities that funnel winter jobs into coastal Alaska. That's what state cod fisheries do. Um, just a closing statement, a few percentage points of cod left on the table isn't stranded cod. It's a sustained fishing opportunity open for all Alaskans. Thanks for your time. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Hannah. Any questions? Seeing none, appreciate your testimony yep. today. Thank you very much. We have time for one more. Um, I'll call Nicole Kimball. Welcome, Thank you. Nicole. Thank you, Madam Chair. If it's okay, um, the next testifier, Julie Decker, um, we were going to, we asked to testify together. We could save you a little time. No problem. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, board. My name is Julie Decker, testifying as the executive director of the Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation. Um, we are here, my colleagues and I, to provide joint testimony in a sign of unity in support of Proposal 161, which was earlier referenced as Proposal 11 at this meeting. Uh, this proposal is non-allocative. It benefits all gear groups and is supported by stakeholders as a whole. It outlines a very broad management policy for the board, similar to policies for other species such as crab and salmon. Proposal 161 does not change current board management. That's very important. It only serves to document the broad goals and objectives that the board already uses to guide groundfish management so that Alaska can, so to speak, get credit for the management the board um, already does to satisfy a technical requirement to retain sustainability certification for Alaska's state cod um, by both the RFM, or Responsible Fisheries Management, and MSC, or Marine Stewardship Council programs. This proposal was put forward in response to the RFM and MSC certifications carrying a condition related to the lack of written fishery-specific management objectives for cod. The AFDF is the client for these certifications. 
uh, a condition means that certification bodies are granting the client time to address the issue before the next cycle. Uh, if it's not addressed, State Waters COD will lose certification. As the client, AFDF facilitated conversations amongst a steering committee that represented a broad group of Pacific COD stakeholders. Uh, and the following stakeholders signed a joint letter of support. So I just wanted to read the names it was submitted to you. But they are the Alaska Seafood Cooperative, Pacific Seafood Processors Association, Alaska Groundfish Data Bank, Alaska Fisheries Development Foundation, Western Alaska Community Development Association, Under 60 Cod Harvesters, Alaska Jig Association, At Sea Processors Association, North Pacific Fisheries Association, Freezer Longline Coalition, and the Alaska Whitefish Trawlers Association. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just um, add on. My name is Nicole Kimball. I work for the Pacific Seafood Processors Association. I'm from Anchorage. And I wanted to mainly point you to RC8 is something that Julie submitted. It's some substitute language for this proposal, 161 or 11. Um, I think that some of the benefit of this process is once you put a proposal out there, everybody looks at it and gives you their opinion. And we did hear particularly from a member of the Kodiak AC that had some language suggestions that would strengthen the proposal, streamline it a little bit, um, make it more aligned with the state constitution language. And so everyone in the group that Julie just mentioned looked at that those proposed suggestions and, and liked it. And so we've submitted it as an RC. Um, obviously, you're not poised to take action on this at this meeting. It's really set for action at the statewide meeting, but because we were having COD stakeholders here and it's very appropriate and relevant to COD certification, it, I think that's what uh, the department decided this was a good place for you to hear some initial testimony. So I, with a little more time, just wanna say um, how much we support this proposal submitted by AFDF. I think Julie explained why MSC certification is needed. COD delivered shoreside in Alaska, so we're talking about Unalaska, all the Aleutians, East Borough communities that have already been mentioned. Those are primarily that COD is going into US markets, which requires MSC certification to sell it there. It's required. Um, there are other important markets for COD. Europe, for example, also requires MSC certification and some other programs as well. Um, so in order to retain those important markets, those more valuable markets for Alaska COD, we have to be certified. Um, this kind of a condition on the fishery hampers that ability, and if we don't fix it in the next year or two, then we will lose that certification. So this really benefits all the people in this room, all the shoreside processors. I, I should say for those of us that take deliveries of cod in Alaska, we take state water cod, federal cod. There are vessels that deliver both uh, to shoreside processors, and if you can imagine the complexity and the cost associated with trying to channel those supply chains and keep them and account for them very separately and market them separately, that would be a hugely complex and costly undertaking. And clearly you'd have state water cod going into poorer markets than federal cod, which would remain certified. That's not a situation that we want for Alaska. Um, I also wanted to note with any additional time that, you know, Julie mentioned all the support from sectors that fish in both state and federal waters, and that's it. Um, Quick summary. Quick summary, and that's in part because this just creates more confusion in the marketplace without that certification, and it harms the Alaska brand. And Alaska, the board, has done a great job at elevating Alaska fish in the market, and we don't want to lose any ground there. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Quick question for Julie. Um, you mentioned a joint letter of support. Was that, a, was that submitted as a public comment? Yeah. Do you happen to know on, what that number is? On time. I don't. OK. Excuse me, through the chair, I, I don't. Um, yeah, it was submitted uh, October 11th. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wood. Julie, it almost sounded like a political ad, endorsed by, and then a list following. Do you, is, uh, is there anybody out there that's actively opposing this 161 that you're aware of? I'm aware of no one. No, neither am I. That's the reason I, I was asking the question. We worked hard for that. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that to be the case. Uh, the RC8 that you're referencing, uh, apparently, according to uh, Ms. Cavanaugh's earlier testimony, the Kodiak uh, AC table, that was it surrounding this amendment that is covered with RC8? I can speak to that through the chair, Mr. Wood. Yes, I think that was the, the circumstance that allowed for them to table that where we worked through some additional language. 
that's the person that provided us these kind of strengthening language. So I, they will see this new language when they bring it up again at the meeting that Julie Kavanaugh mentioned, and then they can vote on it at that time. And yeah, and that's where I was going to. So they're going to vote on it again once they have a chance to digest this RC8. Is that what the? That is my understanding. Julie's nodding. Yes. Yeah, she's shaking her head. Yes. Through Good. The chair. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question on definition between RFM and MSC. Uh, are these both needed for approval of sale of fish, or are they different? They are generally both sustainability certification for seafood. Um, we have both. They both carry this condition. So we don't have a situation where we could turn away from one and use the other. Uh, they both need this proposal to remain in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's PC2, just in case you get asked. PC2, thank you. Thank you. All right, it is... 12.03, let's go ahead and break for lunch and resume public testimony. We'll be back on the record at 1.30. And Florence Cargi will be up first after lunch. Thank you.
Welcome back. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch break. Time is 1.37. We are back on the record and we'll resume public testimony. First up after lunch is Florence Cargi. Is Florence in the... Hi, Florence. Welcome. Okay. Is this on? Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and the Board. I, my name is Florence Cargi. I am from Hooper Bay, the largest uh, community in the CVR region. I am in support of Proposition, Proposition 6. People from off-the-road rural Alaskan communities often don't have the opportunity to participate in longline cod fisheries to make a living. Um, and this is where the benefits uh, provided by the CDQ, CDQ program fit in. As a kid growing up in rural Alaska, I experienced a rich Yupik culture. Uh, but as I started to learn more about money, the more I learned about how people, how poor and limited our people are in our region or in our villages. I, benefit, I benefited as a scholarship recipient and intern and now I'm a full-time employee at Coastal Villages Region Fund. I realize now how important it is to provide benefits to our uh, residents. Our kids need an education so that they can come back to, to provide jobs to, to help deliver benefits to our region. We help these real Alaskan, Alaskans in our communities every day, every day through the programs that we provide. Recently, uh, Senator Murkowski's office asked CVRF to travel out to Chivak and Hooper Bay to assess damages post ex-Typhoon Murbach. I had the opportunity to travel with them and uh, the see what the impacts. It was very devastating to see four homes broken, four homes meaning 40 people. The, the houses in our region are severely overcrowded. So that's 40 people. On average, you have 10, per, 10 people living in a three-bedroom home. And that just speaks to how um, economically poor our region is. So the revenue that we make from our cod fishery, it directly benefits the, our 9,100 people. And we at Coastal Villages in the CDQ program do what we can with what we have. And we make sure that every dollar is spent accordingly to help benefit that. So um, at this time, I want to thank Madam Chair and the Board for all your hard work and your consideration. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you for your time. Mr. Wood. Thank you. And I, I may have missed my opportunity in addressing uh, Mr. Deacon with his question, but is Coastal Village Region Fund funded exclusively through CDQ or are there other sources of revenue? No, sir. Uh, so we work for all our money. We, we fish for Paula crab and cod and with those benefits and revenues, uh, we, we uh, turn those revenues into programs and projects and then on an, on an annual basis, we put about $15 million back into our 20 communities. When I was out in Dillingham this summer, I had the uh, uh, pleasure of uh, visiting quite a, a bit with Robin Samuelson, who was describing a program to me that would get young fishermen into the boats and permits, et cetera, through a financing mechanism. And I believe it was funded through CDQ funds. Do you know anything about that program? Um, sir, there is each CDQ has their own benefit pro, uh, program, and it's at their discretion on how they are going to be providing those programs. And so that is just something BBEDC does, CVRF does um, something a little bit different with our benefits uh, yeah. delivery. Well, I see Robin's name on here, so I'll ask him when he gets up. Thank you. Any other questions? Clean up for your testimony today. Thank, Thank you. you. Tiffany Andrew. <clears throat> Hi, Tiffany. Welcome. Place yourself on the record and begin when you're ready. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Aguiar or Andrew. 
I am a resident of Alaknak, which is one of the members of Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, a CDQ group. I am here to testify on behalf of Proposal 6. I wanted to let you know what the program means to me and how it affects my community. In short, it means jobs. Jobs which wouldn't exist without the CDQ program. I have been lucky to have worked for YDFDA both in rebuilding the Alaknuk School and Teachers Apartments and also at Quick Pack Fisheries, which is YDFDA's fish processor that buys chum salmon for, from local fishermen and women. If YDFDA didn't exist, the construction and fish processing jobs it creates, about 600 per year, and the fishermen it supports, which is 400 permit holders, also would not exist. We cannot overestimate the importance of these jobs in our region for money, for experience, and for pride. Please help us protect this program. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for Ms. Andrew? Going on for your testimony today. Thank you. Ragnar Alstrom. Good afternoon, welcome. Greetings, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Regner Alstrom. I'm the Executive Director of the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, is a community development quota group. Um, uh, I'm here in support of, um, of proposal number six, um, abundance-based management, coupled with what we believe is a fair floor and a fair cap where we came to the, uh, the floor from, from is that uh, the 10% is above long-term historical averages. The cap, 20,000 metric tons, um, is, is above of what they've taken ever in the state waters fishery. Um, I, I participated as a crewman on a, on a pot cod boat out of Dutz. And I recognize that uh, a lot of these under 60 foot vessels are family owned businesses or vessels, and a lot of times generational family owned. So that's where the, the, the floor and the cap in my mind came from. We want to protect those fellow Alaskans. We, I, I believe it's a fair uh, proposal. I have to balance that against the, uh, what we're trying to do in region as a lot of you know, uh, Yukon Delta spent a lot of money developing our salmon fishery infrastructure in region, uh, value adding, heading and gutting automated, uh, automated uh, filet machines. Then we had a crash. What we've seen in the, the, uh, over the last 10 years, I don't know if it's because of global warming or changing currents or whatever, the subsistence fishery offshore is uh, harvesting more Pacific cod. So what we're doing is we're investing. We, we're trying to develop a, a, a new fishery directed at Pacific cod. We've, re, we've invested in cod pots, uh, jig machines, uh, long line, and we're going to take our CDQ, a portion of our CDQ allocation for pea cod, and, and try to harvest and bring, on, bring that fish on shore. Alaskan fishermen deliver to an onshore processor. I mean, uh, you know, these vessels are, they're below 60 feet, 32 foot range. But we're going to, we're, we're, we're geared up, we're going to give it a try. And uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Any questions for Mr. Alstrom? Thank you for being with us today. Appreciate it. Oscar Yvonne. <coughs> Welcome, Oscar. Press the button. There you go. Thank you, Madam Chair and the board members um, for this opportunity to speak in support of uh, proposal number six. I come from the village of uh, Quigilingak and uh, lived out there and um, in constant observation and awareness of the uh, uh, economic challenges out there uh, and 
having worked with the tribal tribal uh, local government for a decade, you know, and um, work not bringing much needed uh, um, infrastructure um, and economic opportunities into the village. I will say that uh, um, there is no opportunity like um, the C what the CDQ pro program brings to the communities. One example is um, the, the uh, mechanic welder shops that have been put in place in the villages. They are what automotive shops are in urban areas. Their work um, um, in repairing boats, motors, snow machines, ATVs, they give us the ability to access our subsistence resources. And subsistence is our um, lifeline out there. And also, um, I've seen what the CDQ program benefits um, provides to the whole um, age generation from the youngest, the youth to work programs, um, all, all the way up to the uh, um, heating fuel assistance for, for uh, uh, elders and uh, uh, the residents. Um, we talk about high prices and the cost of living and it gets way more expensive and worse as you head out further into the uh, uh, remote villages that uh, we live in. And so I will say that uh, um, in closing that um, I cannot overemphasize the benefits of uh, participating in the fisheries and the economic impact that it has to our um, communities. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Yvonne. Any questions from the board? No, but thank you very much for making the journey to be with us today. James Burton. Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the board, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, allowing our testimony. My name is James Burton. I'm a commercial fisherman and I have uh, four children. Oldest of whom fishes with me, currently reside here in Anchorage. Uh, hometown, home port is still Cordova, Alaska. I am here before you to testify in opposition to proposal number two. I am in the middle of trying to buy a 58-foot vessel that has historically participated in the under-60 trawl sector in both state and federal waters in ADAC. This is a crucial element of the business plan that I've established in order to make this possible, and removing trawl from legal gear types in ADAC <clears throat> would effectively kill this boat transaction. It's important to note, unless my facts and historical study of this fishery are incorrect, that the state waters fishery exists because it was pioneered by a small number of trawlers in ADAC prior to the fishery's inception in 2006. This proposal would dis be disenfranchising the very people who started this fishery. The Pacific Cod trawl fishery <clears throat> is already under extreme change. With trawl rationalization, the, the seven under 60 Aleutian cod trawl fishermen will have a combined quota of approximately 500 metric tons. This is decimal dust of a percentage point of the entire Bering Sea Aleutian Island pea cod quota. The state waters fishery is crucial to trawlers who have historically participated in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island district. In fact, there were years when the under 60 fleet solely fished state waters and not federal waters. I think proposal two is uh, a bit disingenuous considering the 120 pot limit that's proposed um, is double that of other state waters fisheries. In addition, there's other areas like around Sandpoint state waters, uh, area M cod fishery where I believe trawl gear is a legal gear type. Uh, when it comes to uh, the staff report this morning, I heard some comments that I don't, don't think are entirely accurate and it, it, it re it's around the uh, shore-based and floating processor segment. And I think trawlers generally have always delivered to a shore-based plant when there was one, with the exception of a year that I can recall where they were not given a market. And so that necessitated a change by bringing in a floater in order for those guys to participate. So, um, you know, the, the plant hasn't been in operation for years uh, since the last owner uh, I guess went belly up. Um, and the, the fishermen, whether they're pot or trawl fishermen, have had to tender their fish to King Cove, Akitahan, Dutch Harbor, whatever. That's been pretty <clears throat> pretty much the norm lately. 
Um, but I do want to circle back to my first comment in opposition that young fishermen like myself still need access to fisheries and removing gear types that have historically participated in an area is a barrier for entry for people such as myself. Thank you. Thank you, James. Any questions? Ms. Mitchell. Thank you for te your testimony, James. Did you uh, have any comments specific to the substitute language that was submitted as RC9 for proposal two? I haven't seen it yet. Thank you. Thanks. Next up is Jim Armstrong. Hi, Jim. Welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Jim Armstrong. I'm testifying uh, today in support of Proposal 6. Uh, which I believe provides a needed conservation check on the Dutch Harbor uh, cod fishery. I live here in Anchorage where I work as a technical advisor for the Freezer Longline Coalition. Uh, our vessels use hook and line gear. In our majority, Alaska owned. Uh, that majority, majority is CDQ, but um, I'm not going to address allocation issues. I'll, I'll let others go down that road uh, today. Um, I started my fisheries career in stock, as a stock assessment scientist, and then I, I got into management. I've worked for two different councils uh, before I uh, got hired by FLC. I was working for the North Pacific Council um, and, uh, you know, uh, was assigned to the plan teams where we review the stock assessments. And I'm in uh, pretty constant communication with the, the stock assessment scientists, um, uh, federal scientists. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, bring your attention to um, some, what I think are some important factors of the, the biology of Pacific cod in the area. Um, Pacific cod life cycle for uh, mature fish um, includes two uh, distinct um, distributional phases. Uh, one where they're aggregated uh, during the late winter for spawning, and then uh, two where they're um, spread out over the shelf during the, the summer. Um, there's a survey that feeds the stock assessment, and that is done during the summer when the, the fish are spread out. Um, the assessment has had problems over the year um, with different, you know, sort of signals coming from the survey and from the fisheries in terms of growth rates and, and size at age, things like that. So there's been a lot of effort, there's been a lot of effort to address that. Um, right now, the assessment. There isn't really a single model that's accepted. They're using an ensemble approach. It's sort of like the way uh, meteorologists forecast storm tracks, where they take several models because they can't settle on just one. Um, also, um, um, because of the, the movement uh, of cod um, during the summer and the distribution, um, there's been some question as to the stock, uh, spawning stock, uh, spawning stocks that are caught by the survey. So there's been a lot of genetics work and satellite tags that have been put on cod. What that's basically telling us is that um, cod uh, move around a lot. We've had fish tag that have, uh, south of the Aleutians, that have ended up going, wow. It goes quick. Do you have a quick summary statement? Wow, I sure do. So I'm just very concerned from a conservation standpoint that so much effort is being uh, put in a very small area. It's a crossroads for cod. Um, they, and CPUE has been going down uh, there. And I'm, con I'm very concerned from a population standpoint uh, whether the resident fish have been fished down. And I'm also okay. concerned about whether those are Gulf cod or Bering Sea cod, which is the basis. And uh, I really wish I had manage my time better. Thank you, Jim. Um, we will have Committee of the Whole, uh, which will provide an opportunity to bring out some additional information. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, Ms. Mitchell. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. It looks like you might have been reading off something, and I just encourage you to submit that information as an RC as well. OK. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Michael Link. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't start the clock.
Okay, Madam Chair, members of the board, and others here this afternoon, good afternoon. I'm testifying regarding proposal six. <clears throat> I will briefly describe today how revenue from federal fisheries that capture Pacific cod directly benefit thousands of Alaskans. My name is Michael Link. I'm the executive director of the Bristol Bay Science and Research Institute, or BBSRI, a nonprofit subsidiary of uh, the Bristol Bay Economic Development Corporation, a CDQ group. I've been its executive director for 25 years, or 20 years, sorry. BBSRI receives financial support from BBDC, companies that fish in federal fisheries, the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association, which is a 2,000 drift net fishermen, salmon processors, communities around the region, federal government and state government. Um, we leverage the income that we get um, from our federal partners uh, at a ratio of about two to one. And over the last 20 years, we've spent about $20 million helping to manage and improve fisheries uh, in the region, in the Bristol Bay region. We focus our work in areas that we see fall between the cracks of the state and federal agencies. And here's a super short summary of 20 years of work. First and the biggest thing we do is provide financial and technical resources to support fish stock assessment projects. We have an agreement with Fish and Game to fund the core um, management program in Bristol, Bristol Bay after a very steep decline in funding by the state, a 30, 32% decline a few years ago. So with stakeholders, we provide up to about a million dollars annually to support those programs in the region. And those programs are just classic stock assessment stuff that fishery managers use to manage the fishery. It's roughly one third of their budget in some years. Um, as part of the program, we run the Port Muller test fishery, which came up earlier. Um, in the Bering Sea, and we've been doing all sorts of stuff with that in recent years, including building an onboard genetics lab on that vessel. Um, this past legislative session, we worked with the legislature to get a $3.75 million grant <clears throat> to address the challenges associated with king salmon assessment, and that was made possible because BBSRI committed to double the duration of that effort to the legislature. So that's an additional... Um, leverage that our federal funding has done. And then lastly, uh, we do a lot of work with stakeholders, bringing them together, providing technical support to um, tackle difficult issues. In 2012 to 2015, we examined sockeye escapement goal policy, um, so, and a couple other things. In summary, BBSRI spends 100% of its income from federal fisheries to benefit thousands of Alaskans who participate in the salmon fishery, including the state of Alaska and moving cod from the federal fishery to the state fishery has a negative impact on those benefits. It's not any voodoo okay. math. It's just um, a transfer away from what we do. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry for running on a bit. Appreciate that. Any questions? Mr. Wood. Yeah, I really want to thank the organizations that are responsible for putting that test fishery out there. It's an extremely valuable resource and one that probably wouldn't uh, have a substitute because state funding just sort of went away. I was under the impression, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but that the matching funds that Senator Hoffman put in, the three million you referenced, got vetoed. Did it or did it not? It did not. Good, okay, thank you. Thanks, yeah, it did not. In, in part for, I think, the Department of Fish and Games sort of nod that it was a good idea. Any additional questions? Thank you for your testimony thank you. today, Michael. John Muller. Broader friend, Madam Chair, um, if, if that's okay. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, for the record, my name is John Moeller. I'm originally from Alaska, currently live in Juneau. Um, I'm an active commercial fisherman, and today I'm speaking on, a, on behalf of uh, ADAC Community Development Corporation, uh, referred to as ACDC. Um, with me today is Mandy Haas, who is the uh, COO of the Aleut Corporation, and I asked her to be here with me today because um, we are in partnership uh, in ADAC um, uh, with the fish processing uh, perspective here, and I wanted you to have the benefit of hearing some of the new work 
that's actually going on in ADAC here um, that is shining some new light on it, and we're excited about that. Uh, by, way, um, uh, by way of a little history here, ACDC is the, uh, the CQE, the Community Quota Entity for ADAC. It's purchased and capped out on halibut IFQ, and it continues to buy sablefish IFQ for the benefits of its residents. It is also uh, allocated 10% of the Western Aleutian Golden King Crab. Uh, so ACDC is invested in ADAC, and its primary goal at this point is to get an a operator uh, processing uh, fish in ADAC. Part of that strategy is to save the fish, what fish we have in the AI, to make sure that um, we can provide a business model that's going to work for the, uh, the future processor out there. Um, <clears throat> recently, ACDC entered into an MOU with the LU Corporation um, and Peter Pan Seafoods to jointly explore the options of a processor in ADAC. And I'm happy to report to you today that the effort's looking positive, and our hope is that we're cutting fish by this time next year. I want to uh, speak specifically to, uh, well, not specifically to Proposal 2. There's an RC, RC9 out there that ACDC is substitute language for Proposal 2, of which I, I'm looking forward to more discussion on that, um, that ACDC supports. Uh, proposal 3 and 4, uh, ACDC adamantly opposes these two proposals. Um, and Madam Chair, is that my warning light here, the yellow? Okay, seconds. well, I'm just going to, I'm going to um, turn it over to Mandy here. Um, but we are opposed to uh, three and four because um, it moves short, uh, fish away from ADAC. And the, the, it's so important that we have uh, uh, access to fish on shore in ADAC for any fish processors to come in there. Go ahead, Mandy. Mandy, you got seven seconds. Hi, my name's Mandy Hawes. <laughs> that might have been my seven seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, unfortunately, she didn't sign up for public testimony, and I can't give anybody additional time, so that wasn't signed up. That was my oversight, I'm sure. Apologies, but we do have commu uh, Committee of the Whole, so um, that may be an opportunity to provide some additional information. Um, Mr. Wood might have a question for our, one of you two. John, I'd just like to get it on the record. You're talking about a future processing plant in ADAC. Does, uh, you, do you, uh, does anybody in your organizations with MOUs, et cetera, have prior experience in ADAC with uh, developing processing plants? Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Wood, thank you for the question. So uh, 2008, I actually ran the fish plant in ADAC. Um, I was a part of uh, the buildup in the plant in ADAC. Um, some of the existing equipment you see in ADAC is actually stuff that I was a part of installing. The, uh, uh, the MOU that, uh, I, I got to do better on the timing of this stuff. Um, the MOU is signed between ACDC, which is an organization that I represent, uh, with the Allied Corporation and Peter Pan Seafoods, and we're in discussions. I wish I could tell you more in terms of, uh, you know, how, where those discussions are, but um, we're not quite, it's not quite ripe yet. But Peter Pan Seafoods, as you know, is, is a long time participant in the seafood processing business in Alaska. So in relationship to your position on uh, proposals three and four, you, you must have a pretty good grip of the challenges facing you going forward. Uh, and that's what you're basing your opposition on? Well, based my opposition on the proposers of the op, uh, proposal three and four, um, some of you may be uh, aware of this, that the North Pacific Council recently passed a rationalization program for cod trawl in the Bering Sea. Um, so it allocates uh, a portion of that resource to um, the, the same trawlers that are making these proposals. So in theory, um, in, that, in that program that the North Pacific Council uh, uh, is a product of that body, is scheduled to go into effect in 2024. ADAC got about 50% of its uh, historical participation through that program. And so, at um, any rate, so what we're seeing here is, is we don't even know the, the implications of that program and how it's going to impact ADAC. And so some of the beneficiaries of that rationalization program in the Bering Sea are now um, coming out to ADAC and, and looking for more opportunity in Proposal 3 and 4. So that's why we're oppos opposing it, because it'll essentially move fish away from ADAC. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moeller. Any additional questions? Appreciate your time today, and sorry we didn't get to hear more from you, Mandy. 
Thank you. Next up is Stanley Pete. Hi, Stanley. Welcome. No, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, my name is Stanley Pete. Uh, I'm from uh, Nunamikwa. I'm here to speak uh, in support of Proposal 6. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I, I'd like to recognize that uh, I'm in full support of the uh, cod fishermen uh, of, as a uh, past participant of the uh, cod fishery. I, I know the uh, importance of uh, having a means to support family. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, the, the people of my region of the Yukon Delta don't have a, a commercial fishery anymore. So we are all displaced commercial fishermen. Also, we are displaced subsistence fishermen. Uh, we, I see a, a, a cultural culture that's disappearing overnight. Now, now why is that important? You know, it, it's not that I w want to uh, so that we're, we're in dire need out there. It's just, I'd like to say that uh, the CDQ group is a beacon of hope for, for the people that are displaced commercial fishermen or displaced subsistence fishermen. Uh, my, myself, my family relies, uh, have learned to rely on the CDQ group to find an avenue for employment, training, and scholarships opportunities because the need is there because there is no, no more commercial salmon fishery. I have uh, two, two children in college, uh, a high school student attending a boarding school because of the, me and my wife's decision to send them away to have a good education at the expense of missing our child, we recognize that the, the seasonal em employment that I once had is no longer there, and I, I, didn't I don't want none of my children to rely on a resource that's nowadays so volatile. I mean, I, I, I participated in the halibut fishery, the cod fishery, the pollock fishery, the crab fishery, uh, I even uh, commercially fished for octopus in a time in my life. Through the, CD, through the CDQ group who gave me an opportunity to get out of my region and, and find a avenue to provide for my family. So thank you, Madam Chairman. That was really quick three minutes. Yeah, it goes fast. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Pete? No, I just want to say you're a extremely eloquent speaker, and I really appreciate you being here to, um, to speak with the board today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next up is Ron Kavanaugh. Uh, Madam Chair, board members, Ron Kavanaugh. Um, we have participated in state water cod fisheries from Kodiak to the Aleutian Islands since their inception. Those fisheries, all of them, are very important to local Alaska coastal communities. The preservation of those fisheries in the area O is very important. Um, the ratchet down strategy that I'm hearing thrown around I'm not really sure you have a, two very successful programs. The CDQ program appears to be very successful. And so does your state water pot cod fishery that you've created, very successful. Both of them benefiting local coastal Alaska people. Um, it's kind of a shame that you're putting both of them against each other with this proposal. All I would say is that um, you have a very um, 
successful program that is promoting younger people to buy into these boats. My boat included at least five or six other boats that I know that young people are buying into. So um, very much against proposal number six. On another note, um, proposal three and four, there's, as you heard, um, there was a federal program that's going to did not sideboard those vessels from participating in that. So there's going to be an increase in vessels in that little sector. Uh, I don't remember the year. I'm getting too old to remember the year. But basically when that trigger went off, allowed those larger vessels in, the fishery lasted 36 hours. That's why that's a problem. Um, and then on proposal two, I put that in in response to what was going on with the federal side because when the federal trawl sector rationalized, it was felt that the federal pot over 60 would be not far behind them. That's what that proposal was for in anticipation of a big increase of participants in that fishery, non-traditional. Um, the fishery in ADAC was designed to support the ADAC processor there that was created prior to the area O. And I guess I'll bring up more later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Any questions? Mr. Carpenter and then Mr. Heimbuck. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Um, seeing how that you were the, the author of Proposal 2, um, I would assume you've had time to look at the uh, the substitute language in RC009. I'm just curious if you had any direct comments towards what the substitute language said. Yes, and that's why my proposal was so vague because at the time I was fishing and I didn't have time to confer with ADAC, and that's what's came out of that. So, yes, I support that. Uh, I believe it's RC9. Mr. Heimbach. Thank you, Ron. Hey, do you anticipate any further revisions aside from what we have seen in the substitute in RC9 between now and when we go to Committee of the Whole? Is there any additional language coming up from, from your coalition get-together? Um, holy cow. <laughs> Sorry, you caught me off guard of everything here. Um, as far as what was in there, um, I believe there was, there may be need some adjustment with the trigger date for the 60 to 100 foot vessels, pot vessels. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Ron. How many boats on an average fish that 60 to 100 foot category with pots out that way? On the 6100 was put in in 2020, I believe, and that has ranged from three boats to, I believe, a high of five or six boats currently. And the in my original proposal had a, a cap on that of 25% because there is a tremendous amount of boats that are available that could fish out there. That was the intent of that in the original proposal. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah, I do understand the cap you put on it. And if I remember correctly, it's a very small group of boats that have fished out there continually Correct. since the inception. And yep. I don't want to forget those boats. Correct. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for your testimony. Right. Tonight. Thanks for your time. Next up is Luke Fanning. Hi, Luke. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Luke Fanning. I'm here today uh, in support of Proposal 6. I am the CEO of APICTA, which is one of the six CDQ groups. And uh, our region, ser we serve the region uh, in the Aleutian and Pribilof Island communities, a total of six communities. I'm also a small boat. I hope that's not my time already there. <laughs> All right. 
Fantastic. I'm also a small boat commercial fisherman myself. Uh, I fish actively in the salmon gillnet, halibut longline fisheries. I've also dabbled in herring, tanner crab, and sable fish over the years. <clears throat> Our organization supports small boat access and advancing fisheries-based economies in rural Alaska, which is paramount to the CDQ program. We also have an obligation to inform you about the importance of our program and the impact that the board's past decision decisions have had on our residents. In 2013, our staff testified in support of the Area O fishery. However, the creation of the fishery was not expected to significantly impact Alaska participation at that time. Today, the situation is very different. The fishery has only increased. The fishery started at 3.4%, then went to 6% to 8%, and we're on a path to 15% right now. In short, we're talking about a tripling of the fishery in a relatively short period of time with no consideration for the impacts to other Alaskans, which is a very significant increase. As you've heard from others, I cannot emphasize how important the CDQ program is to Western Alaska, particularly right now. Our groups have developed many programs to support and provide markets for small boat fishermen and rural areas where no other buyers exist. We also build critical community infrastructure like fuel farms and medical clinics, we fund education and address local needs like energy assistance and housing. We're also a major employer in our region, in Western Alaska, representing over 2,000 jobs, or 20% of the employment in our region. This decision is not a state versus federal issue. We are coming to you as Alaskans. There is significant Alaska historical dependency and investment in the cod fishery under the CDQ program which serves over 30,000 residents in 65 communities, where the GHL fishery on average supports 31 boats. I recognize how important this fishery is to those participants and the need for some of the younger fishermen in particular to get a foothold in the fishery. But since 2014, on average, there have been nine boats catching over 50% of the GHL. Last year, 51% of the fishery was caught by eight boats, catching nearly 2 million pounds each. This is a significant level of opportunity which comes at a direct cost of the residents of Western Alaska that benefit from the CDQ program. Additionally, under any percentage scenario under Proposal 6, the allocation is still larger than CDQ. Madam Chair, if I may, I'll wrap up just by saying we appreciate how challenging it is to reconsider previous decisions. But this was a major allocative decision and we're simply asking for some, what we think, reasonable consideration uh, for circumstances which have changed and for the interest of residents of Western Alaska. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Questions? Mr. Wood. What circumstances changed since? Uh, since 2014? Since you, your last statement was asking us to reconsider because of changed circumstances. What is it you are referencing? Uh, what I'm referencing is that when our organization in particular supported the creation of the Area O fishery, it was a much smaller fishery, and it was at a time of a much higher level of abundance. So the expectation, and I think the premise of the creation of the fishery, is that it would not have a significant impact on other Alaska residents at that time. The abundance has gone down, and the stair-stepping approach has dramatically increased the amount of quota that we're talking about. And we are also seeing a lengthening of the fishery. We're now at 266 days and counting, and there's still over a million pounds of fish left in the water, as opposed to uh, a 50-day average over the last five years in the length of time that this fishery was open. And I would encourage the board members to think about what might be happening and why is the fishery staying open that long and what other potential impacts might we uh, need to consider right now. Yeah, I would hope you would participate in Committee of the Whole. You bring forward some interesting data. Thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Luke. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked another fellow. Um, why hasn't your organization moved to purchase some 58-foot boats and participate in this fishery? I mean, it's basically an all-Alaskan fishery right now. And where you're coming from, you're basically an all-Alaskan fishery. So I wonder why you haven't looked at that opportunity. So thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Jensen. Uh, first of all, we, we have owned 58-foot vessels in the past, and we may someday own 58-foot vessels in the future. Uh, but I think there are three reasons uh, for us that we're not doing that right now, and we're not actively looking that, at that as a strategy. 
the first reason is, is economics. When we deliver a fish, and by the way, most, of, most all of our fish is delivered on a freezer long line platform. We're, we're generating the equivalent of $1.25 per round pound. Whereas if we were to take those same fish from the federal fishery to the state waters fishery, we're looking at somewhere typically less than 50 cents per pound. So there's an economic reason we're able to deliver. Um, I don't want to you know, insult anybody with uh, comments about quality, but the revenue that we're able to generate from a fish caught through CDQ or through our interest in the FLC is greater. So that's reason number one. Uh, reason number two is we have a significant historical dependence on this fishery, which of course we would note is one of the criteria for uh, allocation criteria for the Board of Fish. All of us that you've heard uh, from the CDQ program have made significant investments in that fishery and it's hard to turn away or walk away from those boats when we're already having to tie some of those boats up in order to catch a fish, the same fish for a lot less money. And I think the third reason is a structural reason. Now, we talk about the under 60 fleet, but realistically what we're talking about is a 58 foot boat uh, with few exceptions. And the reason for that is that 58 foot boats can participate in limited entry fisheries like the salmon seine fisheries. Under state law, we are not allowed to own uh, uh, limited entry permits. We're also not allowed to finance those permits for our residents. So there's a significant structural barrier to entry for us to look at arming our residents with permits to go ahead and prosecute that fishery. Yeah, thank you. I, I think everybody's in this for the same reason, they're in to make, make a living. So uh, these guys have went way out on a limb buying these Fred Wall boats and to feed their families as well as you guys have are doing, trying to do the same. I understand the predicament. Thank you for your response. Mr. Heimbach. Thank you, Luke. One thing I don't really understand that well is there's another aspect about this battle here on Proposition 6 that really doesn't get talked about. If this was strictly a matter of Alaskans versus Alaskans here on this redistribution of this resource under different scenarios. Mr. Heimbach, I caution you in your questioning, given you're recused on this issue. Oh. I'll, I'll back off, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have any more questions? Luke, I have one question for you. Fanning, are you a Star Hill kid? I am a, very much a Star Hill kid, born and raised, thank you. Good to see you, I was one too. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Next, Robin Samuelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. My name is Robin Samuelson. Born and raised in Dillingham, Alaska. Been fishing Bristol Bay 57 years as a captain. Have four grandchildren. It's taken over my vessel this year, thank God, with my bad back. I'm also the chairman of the Bristol Bay Economic Development Corporation. I was the CEO president of the corporation but I've stepped down. I still manage the offshore fleet outside of Bristol Bay. <clears throat> My grandfather started the fishery in Bristol Bay before any canneries were built. His name was John W. Clark over 150 years ago. He had three salteries and decided to bring in some people with capital to start a cannery. The first cannery was built in Klukuk. The second cannery was built in Kanaknak below my house, and he had money in that cannery. Those were the first two canneries built in Bristol Bay. My grandfather fished 70 years in a sailboat in Bristol Bay. <clears throat> There's a place in Bristol Bay called Dead Man's Hole. It's called Dead Man's Hole because if you got trapped inside the hole, when the wind switched, your sailboat would roll and you'd, you're gonna be dead. There was no getting you out of the hole. So we named it, my grandfather and them named it Dead Man's Hole. My father fished 60 years in Bristol Bay. This is my 57th year, I'm retiring at 58. I've been involved in the fisheries. I've been involved in helping the people of Bristol Bay, the Kusquim and the Yukon all my life. My Yupik name is Yupik. <clears throat> I've been on tribal council for 35 years. 
I'm here on proposition number six. I support proposition number six. I sat as a Board of Peace member like you all in purgatory sitting around a table. I put nine years in the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Terrible years, terrible fights. I mean, they were fights. You guys are pretty well organized today compared to them days. I still got scars on my back from Jensen. <laughs> However, I'm not here to condemn the boats under 58 foot. I support, I supported them when the fishery was started. I support Alaska communities, whether it's in my community or other communities. And the old fishery, the old fishery should take place. But they need to be capped, and that's what Proposition 6 does. You've heard from the other CDQ groups about their programs that they're developing, that they have developed, and what they're bringing forward to their, their residents. Um, we all have them, community programs. Right now, if you're just Mr. Samuelson, you're over three minutes. Can okay. you wrap it up, please? You bet. I think it's a simple, simple fix. I hope the board does not uh, uh, allow it to continue the way the fishery is continuing. We have major investments in the longland industry. You guys manage our crab industry. If any of you want to buy a crab boat, I got two of them for sale. Uh, things are changing faster than we've ever seen in the Bering Sea, and I think Crab should send a signal to both the council and the Board of Fish. Things could happen on a very fast track. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Samuelson. Uh, Mr. Jensen has a question for you, and then Mr. Wood. Did you call me, Madam Chair? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Samuelson, for your testimony. I, I thank you deeply for all your service to the fisheries over the years and to your communities up there in the Bay. I, I'm, I admire you for that. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood. Thank you. If it's any consolation, Robin, I think you've given as many scars as you've received over the years. <laughs> uh, are you going to be, the only thing I need to know is, are you going to be available uh, during the Committee of the Whole? Because I have a lot of questions and I don't want to take them up now if you're going to be there for the Committee of the Whole. I won't be here for the full committee process. I've got Lisa Burkowski coming out to Dillingham that I've got to meet, so I've got to catch a plane tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock for Dillingham. Okay. But I'll have people here. In that case, Madam Chairman, I am going to have a couple of questions now that I would have otherwise held unless you have a... Mr. Wood, we're going to get into committee of the whole um, <coughs> shortly. As oh, this will is we? One okay. of the last uh, couple couple more testifiers and public testimony will take a break and, and begin committee. So okay, then I'll hopefully we'll benefit that. from Robin being here. So sure. Anything else? Thank you for being here. Appreciate your testimony Thank you, and all your hard work. Next up is Dave Fraser. Welcome, Dave. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Dave Fraser. I'm a part-time ADAC resident. I started fishing cod out in the Aleutians in 1981. I delivered the first cod to the fish plant in ADAC when they opened in 99. And uh, my boat got cut out of the fishery because it was over 100 feet in 2008, and that was not a, it was the appropriate decision to make at the time, um, because the, the reason that, that the GHL fishery was created in the first place was to respond to the rationalization of uh, the crab fishery and shifting of, of uh, processing capacity into the Aleutians, floating processors. Um, and what needed to be done for the fish plant was to extend the season out so we had fishing over a reasonable length of time to make it efficient to have crew come out and uh, supplies and so forth and logistically. And rationalized fisheries, the council has long recognized that they need to be sideboarded. 
Um, they were belated in responding to the, the rationalization of the uh, Amendment 80 sector and the illusions, and that had a, a devastating impact on the fish plant that closed in 2010. And the council just acted last year to uh, rationalize the trawl CB sector. And that the council had no authority to, uh, ra to put sideboards on the GHL fishery. So it's a GHL fishery is unsideboarded. And if the 17 boats that came out in uh, 2006 um, that were under 100 foot were to come back out now, um, the fishery is going to be condensed to the point that it's not feasible to reopen the fish plant in ADAC. And I see my time is about up, so I'll close with that. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Fraser? Thank you very much for making the long journey from ADAC to be here with us. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Buck Bakaitis. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I have one of those names too. I'm a little wary of Mr. Um, of, of this this uh, three minute uh, Mr. Nelson's new three minute uh, magical clock. So. Anyways, um, it's really nice to see you all, um, new faces. Um, my name's Buck Lakaitis. My family owns two boats that participate in Area O um, cod fishery. Um, we've participated since the inception of the state water fisheries. I'm opposed to propos or proposals five and six. In 1996, I helped establish what did not previously exist, and that was a cod allocation with a clear gear type, a pot limit, opening dates that was easy for ADF and G to manage. The Gulf of Alaska GHL cod fisheries eventually stepped up to 25 or 30 percent of the allowable biological catch. I also helped establish and grow the Area O allocation at each board meeting since the original 2 percent allocation. The board in 2018 established a credible allocation schedule for growth, capping the Area O allocation at 15 percent in 1 percent annual increments if and when the fleet developed to catch its allocation. These state water cod fisheries have been overwhelmingly successful. So thank you, thank you, thank you, department, the board. Um, you're developing a new fishery. These are hard things to do, and they're sometimes controversial. You don't see much controversy in our fishery. You don't, you're not hearing a bunch of controversy between users. It's just something new. So I respect both the jurisdiction of the board and the federal um, council's jurisdiction. This board is not the proper jurisdiction to increase the share of COD for CDQ groups. The CDQ program was created by the federal system. The national or M, the council could increase the CDQ share as it's done by amendments and statute previously incrementally in the past and derive undiluted benefits to Alaskan CDQ communities. I feel strongly that the CDQ program is an important federal program. Robin, Ragnar are great men. I mean, their, their task is enormous, undoubtedly. Um, I just think that the CDQ groups need to address their grievances with the council, and I will support them. I mean, I, I think we've done a pretty poor job since 1996. We've Americanized our fishery, but we haven't Alaskanized, and I think we could do much more. And so. Let's not play small ball fighting each other. It's clear that this is a, a very Alaskan fishery. It's clear that CDQ program is very Alaskan and way more important in, in, in many ways because their task is so big. But I'd like to grow both of our shares together. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Buck. Questions, Mr. Wood? I was trying to get to how we all where we are today with the, the regulatory scheme. And you address that here in your testimony. My question to you is, while those discussions, negotiations were taking place, 
Was there any mention of ratcheting down if you were not able to uh, harvest the quota? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Um, I think everything was on the table at the time, and I guess I, I guess the way I'd approach that is, you know, that that might be a credible approach. But when when we first got two percent in area O, the 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 major industry um, opposition was you will never catch it. You'll never catch it. You'll never catch two percent. And then it went to four or whatever the next step was. And I think Mr. Jensen remembers this. You'll never catch it. And we're really worried about sea lions. And then it went to six. So my point is, we don't know what, you know, it's clear to us right now that there's 11% of this year's ABC in state waters. That's what we caught. It will go to 12% next year. We're clear that that fish is there. We're asking you to manage it because it's in state waters. It's not a mystery anymore how much is there. And, and, there's, and there's much more than... There's much more than 11% because you have to remember you also have a parallel fishery. So I, we can suss out those numbers later, but it's clear there's 12% or at least 11%. And, I, and one, one other thing that doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's been brought up as a criticism that there's a little bit of quota that got fished over the summer. That's kind of a feature, not a bug. That's a good thing. So you're confident if there were a ratcheting provision and the regulations said it wouldn't be utilized? Um, thank you, Mr. Wood, um, for the question. Um, in the, f the future's hard to predict. Um, and so I don't know. Our fleet will ebb and flow. A, a lot of our fleet has come and gone because of um, what's happened, the cod crash in the Gulf of Alaska. I couldn't predict right now if there'll be 30 boats or 40 boats, but it'll be somewhere in between. Um, that's a big... The one thing about state waters is they're, they're narrow and wide. Federal waters go deep. It's 200 miles. Um, and so there's, there is some limitation to the amount of gear you can get in federal waters. The department, the board chose to... My, my intention was to have a state water fishery everywhere in the Bering Sea, to Nome, around the Privilovs, okay. everywhere. But we chose to draw that line around uh, False Pass because the department was concerned about crab going any farther east. So I hope I, I got a little long-winded, but I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thanks for being here today, Thank Bob. You. Appreciate yeah, your testimony. Appreciate Next up is Paul Shadura. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make this quick. My name is Paul Shadura. I reside in the California Ski Village in the Kenai Peninsula. I'm a third generation commercial fisherman and have been involved in the commercial fishing industry for 50 years, 54 years, and a strong advocate of the small boat fleets. Today I want to state that I oppose proposal number six. One of the main emphasis of this board is to conserve and to develop the state waters pot cod fishery is a rare opportunity to promote a predominantly resident small boat fishery. In order to maintain a healthy interest in an open access fishery, some form of stability needs to be assured through this board process. This plan has been in place for a relatively short time. There has been no clear current conservation concerns identified, and the participating vessels are utilizing the GHL in the present time frame. However, it would be prudent to weigh all concerns. Communities are important. Consideration, again, this board would have a difficult time justifying any changes to this fishery management plan based on various possibly allocative assumptions. There must be a balance. The issues are complex. This is a statewide policy question in short, a plan is in place. It is working. Why change it midstream? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any questions from the board? Appreciate your being here today. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes public testimony. It is 2.41. Let's take a 20-minute break, get set up for our Committee of the Whole, and we'll come back on the record at about 3 o'clock.
record. It is 3.09 p.m. and we're going to go ahead and commence committee work. Um, and I will go over a little bit of information about the committee process just to refresh everybody's memories. Um, so in order to maximize public participation and the information received by the board, the board utilizes a combination of the committee of the whole and separate board committees to provide additional review um, of the proposals that are before the board for consideration at this meeting. Um, for this meeting, we're going to ex exclusively utilize the committee of the whole process. Um, and it's a little bit different. So for committee of the whole, any member of the public may participate. There's no sign up necessary. Upon completion of the public participation component of each group of the committee, the whole of the whole proposals, and after a suitable break, the board will um, commence deliberations. In this meeting, we're going to go ahead and do committee of the whole for group one and group two on the roadmap, and then the board will deliberate on groups one and group two. Um, since there's you know ten proposals that we're dealing with, um, we're going to go ahead and um, deliberate these consecutively. Um, but the purpose of that is to try and permit deliberations um, for, the, for the board members while the proposals are uh, and, the, and the committee of the whole um, information is still fresh in board members' minds. Let's see here. I would, uh, so once we complete committee of the whole, it's really kind of, uh, you know, a, your prerogative as to whether the public, any member of the public wants to stick around and hang out. However, I will say, I will caution anyone who has an interest in a proposal to consider sticking around at least 24 hours after a vote on a proposal to see if there's any attempt to reconsider the vote. Um, copies of the board's general policy and practice statements on the use of board committees are available from the executive director for those who are interested. Parliamentary procedures for committee work will follow sort of a New England town uh, town hall style meeting. Board committee chairs will attempt to manage meetings in a manner that encourages an exchange of ideas and that encourages development of solutions to complex issues and resolutions of misunderstandings. Committee meetings are intended to provide additional op or opportunities for additional information gathering and at times for dispute resolution. Committees are not a forum for debate nor a platform for repeating information that we've just received in public testimony. And during board committee meetings, advisory committee representatives may express both the official positions of their committees as well as their personal views. They must, however, identify which of the two positions they are stating. And the board recognizes that the AC reps um, as knowledgeable fisheries leaders and believe that they uh, must, should be able to function freely during committee meetings. So just you know, make sure to let us know which hat you're wearing. Um, again, I will tell folks that um, we have public comments for us. We have the AC reports before us. Um, we've had public testimony. So um, if there's something new or nuance or um, discussion that was had in advisory committee that you didn't have an opportunity to relate to us during, um, you know, that's in the minutes or, um, or during public testimony, this is, this is a good opportunity to sort of color in some of those lines a little bit and provide that additional information to the board. Um, so, Mr. Wood. I was under the impression that we're going to begin deliberations tomorrow morning, and the reason I'm raising that now is historically, when we've uh, completed the Committee of the Whole, we found that there are some of the issues that may be resolved through some negotiations and discussions. And if we did it in that historical manner, that would allow tonight for that to happen and start deliberations tomorrow morning. Thank you, Mr. Wood. The agenda states that board deliberations will commence tomorrow morning. I don't, I mean, there's a lot to discuss here um, in these 10 proposals. I don't anticipate moving into board deliberations this afternoon. We will commence deliberations on group one and group two in the morning, provided we complete the committee of the whole work. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right, so at this time, um, we will sort of, we will begin with committee of the whole group one, which is the Aleutians Island Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan, and I will turn it over to Chair Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we commence on Committee, whole, committee of the Whole Group 1, Aleutian Island Subdistrict, Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan, uh, I will remind folks that when you come up to please not reference anyone by name, you're bringing up new information only. 
And I will first ask the department to read a summary of the proposal, and then I will ask for the proposer, if they're in the room, to come up and provide some comments if they'd like to, and then we'll open it up for the rest of the group. Please raise your hand to be acknowledged in this process. Proposal one, department. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Mark Stickert with the uh, Division of Commercial Fisheries. Um, proposal one is a proposal submitted by the department, and it seeks to um, essentially clean up some of the regulations um, relative to the, the Aleutian Islands Subdistrict Management Plan. It, it fixed a technical error regarding one of the um, opening triggers. It also clarifies reporting and landing requirements, and it would require pot vessels to deliver all their catch prior to um, Leaving, exiting the fishery as well as require um, vessels to land all their catch in the situation where they're delivering, uh, making partial deliveries. Uh, in practice, this doesn't really change anything that we're already doing, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, and, I'll, and I'll note here that um, during the course of our internal review of the staff comments, we, we noticed a few errors in our own language that we provided in the proposal. Um, and so we submitted RC10 as new substitute language, and again, just a little bit of a cleanup based on feedback from, from others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would just uh, let folks know this might be a little different than you remember doing it. We have a mic, a standing mic up front, and so, you know, if you want to speak um, for just in the interest of saving some time and keeping things moving, uh, you might want to move closer to the front if you decide you want to speak, and it's easier for the chair to recognize you. Thank you. Would anybody like to provide new information with regards to proposal one? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, proposal two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Proposal two. Um, this proposal would essentially repeal and replace the existing um, Aleutian Islands Subdistrict Pacific Cod Management Plan. Um, it would transition from its current state into a fishery that was um, generally open to pot and jig vessels only with a few management provisions associated with those two gear types, Madam Chair. Thank you. Would the proposer like to speak to this? Yeah, through the chair. Uh, Ron Cavanaugh. Um, uh, RC9 has been um, put in here for substitute language. Um, one of the problems that I saw in the uh, substitute language was that we left in there um, the uh, opening for four days after the large boat pot um, closed to open the entire AI, and that should probably be changed to a date certain. And um, after that, unless you had any questions, I'll let somebody um, that uh, brought in RC9, answer any questions you have, unless you had anything for me. Mr. Wood. Yeah. Ron, as you're speaking, I'm trying to read RC9 to see where it is you're exactly referencing. If you could help me with that, or probably more preferably, if you put an RC in that would describe what you want to see changed. Yeah, yeah, I would rather do it with the RC with highlighted where the problem is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Heimbeck. Yes, thank you, Ron. As I read through this in the original, in the original submission, it strikes me that uh, this, in its entirety, that this proposal is aimed at maximizing the window in which smaller boats can continue to provide a source of cod for the ADAC plant. Correct. And having been out there myself at the start of this thing, I know that making sure that we don't attenuate that opening in any fashion by unduly impacting who's harvesting there, it's a central component of helping what's been described to us earlier today for the establishment and, and continuation of that plan. Is that, is that partially correct? No, that's absolutely correct. And that's part of the intent of getting rid of the larger trawl vessels because the larger trawl vessels by design, when they've went out there, they've brought with them their own processor, whether it's an Amendment 80 processor that's out of work at the time or whatever. but. Um, I want to say three or four different times when we were out there, when the large boat component for the trawl opened, it created a race for fish because they're bringing their own processor with them. Even though it's only a 150,000 pound trip limit, they're able to turn right around 
um, delivering to their own processor and that fish is not going to the ADAC plant. Follow up, Member Yes, Hundek. follow up. I just kind of like to point out for, for people for whom ADAC is fairly new and having been out there since the start of it, that this is an extremely important step in what the state did when the military decided to close ADAC. I was out there working, you know, during the decommissioning of that base and the central part of returning the first ever Superfund site to citizen private control was development of an economy out there, as was the state's interest in turning this into a second class city to maintain airport infrastructure maintenance out there mm -hmm. too. It all kind of dovetails together and the central part of that was predicated Member on- Member is there a question for the, for the yes, public right now? Yes, let me move right mm -hmm. to it. Do you consider this proposal in conjunction with that underlying mission for the development of ADAC? Absolutely, because after the process are closed out there, there's water issues, power issues, fuel issues, dock issues. And without a viable economic driver out there, those things are starting to fall by the wayside. They just got $12 million to put their dock back together. That's going to be a little short of what they need. They've got some federal money to put their fuel system back together because it's a strategic location for fuel. The water and power, there's some serious problems. And if there's no economic driver out there, it's literally going to dry up and blow away. Seeing no other questions, thank you. Yep. Would anyone else like to provide new information regarding Proposal 2? Please come forward. Hi, uh, Abby Duffy again. Um, so I'm just seeing this RC9 for the first time. Um, and I see that it works in a measure to potentially open to historically dependent vessels after March 15th, if the department thinks that that is uh, necessary. Um, and it could be any time after March 15th. So in practicality, this makes it essentially impossible to make a fishing plan that would include the Aleutian Islands for a boat that fits into this category. The Miss Leona, the boat that I work on, uh, it's 86 foot trawler. Um, we use ICE instead of RSW. We don't have this incredible turnaround time that has been mentioned by a few people. We're not gonna go catch 150,000 pounds in one day. We're, it's not possible for us. Uh, we have to deliver shoreside because of the ICE issue. Um, we have always delivered to the cannery in ADEC when it's been there. Um, we've even supported the uh, cannery in ADEC by delivering its fish waste when the pot vessels were fishing and their overflow was at its max. So we have supported that cannery in any way we could. Um, uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any new information with regards to proposal two? Seeing none, proposal three. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll note here that proposal three and Proposal four are identical in application. Um, both of these proposals seek to change the start date um, from March 15th to March 1st for trawl vessels that exceed 60 feet in length into the Aleutian Island Subdistrict Fishery. Madam Chair. Thank you. Given the similarities in proposal three and four, I'll accept new information with regards to both proposals. Is the proposer in the room? Would anyone like to provide new information for proposals three or four? Please come forward. Oops. Uh, hi again. Um, so uh, what I'd like to address right now, it, uh, I you, suppose applies to- Can you put your name on the record real quick? Oh, Abby Duffy again. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, I suppose it applies to proposal two as well. Um, we've heard a concern that because of the newly rationalized uh, federal cod fishery, that there would be a large influx of trawl vessels out into the AI state water fishery, um, which on the face of it is a totally reasonable assumption, um, but we have four years of evidence that uh, suggests that that won't be the case. Uh, so in 2021 and 2022, the entire BSAI federal cod fleet, uh, trawl fleet, 
voluntarily rationalized the fishery. So what this meant was that everybody divvied up the fish and they were allowed to fish it at their own pace. So in practicality, they could have all gone out to the Aleutian Islands to fish that state water fish and still gotten their federal pounds. Uh, we saw five trawl vessels in 2021 and five trawl vessels in 2022. Uh, so to me, that's evidence that we would not have an influx of trawl vessels. Uh, also in 2018 and 2020, the fishery opened before the March 15th date that's set now. It opened in mid-February and early March. And in those years, we saw six trawl vessels each year. So more evidence that this concern about the rationalization of federal cod um, is not going to affect the state AI, uh, AI fishery. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Please come forward and state your name for the record. Thank you, members of the board, Steve Miner. Um, I work for Peter Pan Seafoods. I am one of the, uh, we are one of the entities that have signed the MOU with the Alia Corporation and with ADAC Community Development Corporation, trying to uh, reestablish uh, seafood processing in ADAC. I have previous experience in ADAC too. Um, I'm pretty familiar with it. But uh, in regards to what you just heard from the last presenter, Ms. Leona, a vessel that we Please have. refrain from oh. using people's names. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was one of the uh, people, architects of crab rationalization for better or for worse. I've lived through Amendment 80. I've lived through AFA. Every time that we have rationalized a fishery, and as we are about to with catcher vessel bearing sea cod, it creates a situation for smaller players to lease their quota to bigger players and for that excess steel to then move into new fisheries. And uh, although you've heard that previous, that recent history suggests that won't happen, I would argue the opposite, that the history of every single rationalization program that I'm familiar with for the last 15 years, excess steel always seeks a new home and its new home uh, will be the Aleutian Islands uh, GHL fishery uh, unless there is uh, some constraints put on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. New information? Please come forward, Mr. Kavanaugh. Yeah, just real quick, it was 2019 when that fishery closed after 36 hours after the trigger to allow in the large trawlers and large pot boats, that fishery lasted 36 hours. Any new information? Seeing none, proposal five. Thank you, Madam Chair. Proposal five. <clears throat> would reduce the maximum allowable vessel size to uh, 58 feet in length um, or less in waters inside uh, Unalaska Bay. So basically would restrict um, vessels participating in the Dutch Harbor subdistrict uh, Pacific cod fishery inside Unalaska Bay to being um, no more than, or no, no greater than 55 feet in length. Madam Chair. Thank you. Would the proposer like to speak? Would anyone like to offer new information? Seeing none, Proposal 6. So Proposal 6 seeks to establish a new framework for setting the annual State Water Pacific Cod GHL in the Dutch Harbor Subdistrict. It would um, transition from a scenario now where the GHL is based on uh, anywhere from 8 to 15 percent of the Bering Sea um, Cod ABC um, to a, a scenario where the State Water GHL will be based on um, uh, tiers of uh, Bering Sea ABC biomass with some uh, other components that would um, reduce the GHL if the GHL was not caught in the fishery. Madam Chair. Is the, would the proposer like to speak? Would anyone like to offer new information? 
Please come forward. Madam Chair, uh, Board of Fish, Jerry Davis, General Counsel of the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, uh, regarding Proposal 6. Two items of new information are, we reviewed ownership information of the, of the 2020 operators in the aerial fishery, and at least one-third have significant outside Alaska ownership, and only 40% in 2021, only 40% were owners on board. Um, and that's, personally, I, I don't care, but it could be as part of the policy underlying this decision, 2018 at least. Uh, and also, uh, the, the, the proposition that it would be simple to go back and change the CDQ allocations um, by the council is, is, is a red herring. It would mean a change to the American Fisheries Act, uh, amendment to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and the chances of that are happening are so improbable as to be impossible. All the, all the reallocations are happening here in this room. We're not going to get an increase in CDQ, but we're, at, we're suffering a decrease. So there is no other opportunity for us to increase CDQ allocations. Thank you. I may have missed it, but can you please state your name for the record? Jerry Davis. Thank you. And there was a question from Member Wood. Yeah. You know, I may want to hear from the Department of Law on this. Your position is, is that it would require an act of Congress to change the CDQ? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay. It's embedded in, in the uh, American Fisheries Act and the Magnuson Stevens Act. Uh, I'll not, Aaron, I'll ask you to look into that. You don't have to answer now, but I'd like to get an answer from the Department of Law whether that's accurate or not. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to bring forward new information? Please come forward. Yeah, hi, my name is Julie Kavanaugh. I'm speaking for myself right now. Um, I wanted to address some new information. The, the fleet that harvests the GHL was characterized in a way, manner that there is this upper echelon of boats that catch the majority of the fish. But what was forgotten to be talked about was the bottom 50% of those vessels that catch 50% of the fish. And I don't want them to be discounted in this conversation. There might be smaller vessels that don't need the capital, but when somebody catches 200,000 pounds of cod and they can make their boat payment and pay their crew and make their home mortgage payments, we shouldn't be discounting how important that is to those people. So a, a, large, a large percentage of those vessels count on that um, lesser percentage per vessel to, to, for a livelihood. So I think characterizing it as, as, a, as a fishery that only feeds eight, eight boats and 32 families is not accurate. It's 30, it's 30, 30 to, it's four, up to 40 boats with five guys on them, 200 people that make house payments, mortgages, and send their kids to school. So I take a little bit of offense to the fact that you would discount a vessel that may only, only catch a small amount of that. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward and provide new information? Yes. Uh, um, Madam Chair, I think during the, my staff report this morning, I was asked a question of how many federal participants there are in the fishery, in the federal fishery, the Bering Sea. Uh, in 2022, there were 131 unique vessels that fished in the federal fishery. Um, 22 of those were hook and line boats, 60 non-pelagic trawl boats, and 49 pot vessels, Madam Chair. Thank you for that. Any other new, in yep, please come forward. Thank you uh, for the record, Angel Drabnika. Um, I don't have any new information to present, but just wanted to flag um, to the board that there may be an RC submitted on proposal six um, following this, the committee of the whole and um, maybe later on in the evening, so. Madam Chair. Not to get ahead of it, but are there any elements that might be contained in that RC that you could speak to just um, to give people here an opportunity to comment? possible 
Yes, I think um, we have gotten some feedback about uh, the, the complexity of the structure right now. So I think we um, couldn't speak to any substance, but just um, providing a, a more simplified pathway forward. Um, looks like you have some questions. Member sure. Wood? Yeah. Without knowing the specific, it's really difficult to, to respond. Uh, I would just point out in the last several Board of Fish meetings, so there have been some very controversial issues where some board members have volunteered to help facilitate the parties to come together to a mutual win-win uh, situation. I think you have that opportunity here with at least two of us that would be willing to do that with you this evening if, if, if both parties would be so inclined. Uh, but to, let's not wait till tomorrow morning because I have no interest in trying to, to forge out a, an agreement uh, in an hour's period of time. And that's one of the reasons I asked the chair when it is we'll start deliberations. If we're going to have myself involved, at least, it's going to be tonight and, or it's not going to be at all. And I've told people in the past, and I'll continue to tell them, it's told to me by an old judge, do you want me to make the decision or do you want to come into an agreement with the, your adversary as to what's best? It's your business. It's your livelihood. Would you rather make decisions among yourselves or would you rather a willy-billy from Willow push a button and make that decision for you? I think that might be a trick question, Mr. Wood. <laughs> but, um, but I really appreciate the offer. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you following the session. Member Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick question for Angel. Uh, are you working this out with the, the two different user groups, or are you just working it out amongst yourself and the CDQ group? Um, Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, I, I don't think we have clarity on that quite yet. I do think that we're, we're trying to simplify our, our ask here. So um, I, there might be some potential there, but not clear yet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my suggestion is the same as Mr. Woods, try to get it done in time for us to get a good look at it before we start deliberating. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other new information for Proposal 6? Yep, please come forward. Um, thank you, Jim Armstrong. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I, I didn't manage my time very well, and I really appreciate another um, shot. And I did, as you um, uh, suggested, uh, submit an RC, so I'm just going to um, um, mention the a couple of things that, that are in there that I didn't get to. And that, that is that um, the uh, lead uh, stock assessment uh, scientist for the um, for Pacific Cod uh, at National Marine Fisheries Service um, uh, suggested to the uh, SSC, to the council, you know, exploring alternative stock definitions uh, as early as next fall. Um, the... Uh, a fishery that occurs uh, just north of Unimac Pass, which is uh, the Dutch Harbor subsection, uh, would fish a mixture of resident fish as well as um, transient fish. The problem is we don't know what the proportions are of those transient fish. If there are um, ocean condition variables that affect their distribution, then those are likely to change from year to year. But the uh, setting the GHL as a percent of the Bering Sea ABC is called into question with that dynamic and uncertain nature of the uh, stock definitions. Ms. Carlson Van Dort. Thanks, um, Jim. How do you distinguish between the resident and the transient stocks? Are they genetically different? How are you making that determination? Exactly. Uh, genetics, uh, it, you know, and, and, and it yet, it's yet to be resolved. There's a backlog. Uh, I talked to uh, Ingrid uh, Spees, who's the um, lead geneticist at the National Marine Fisheries Service on COD, and she said she has a backlog of, um, of samples, DNA samples, from uh, just to the east of, on the north side, on the Bering Sea side of uh, Unimac Pass. Um, so it's... It's a, it's a moving target. There's a follow-up for you. Yeah, I'm just I'm intrigued here. I'm just kind of curious. Um, so how do you know that they're staying 
how do you know which ones are moving? Are they tagged or is it telemetry? Like how is that, how do, how do you know that? A, a mixture, well, the, the absolute ideal thing would be to have a, a, enough genetic samples so that you know the spawning stocks and then when you get those genetic samples, which don't need to kill the fish, you can also put a, um, a programmable satellite transmitter on and then see where they go. And that almost always generates more questions than it, than it answers because I mean, when they had a, a fish released in the Western Gulf that ended up in the Chukchi, I mean, it's just like everybody's like, well, what, what do we know about anything? So, um, uh, but, but that combination, uh, you know, th with enough funding and enough analysis, you know, uh, is probably the, the best way to do it. Thank you. Any new additional information for Proposal 6? Mr. Wood? Before you close our Committee of the Whole, I'm going to make a somewhat unusual request. There were two gentlemen that testified during public testimony. We ran out of time, and I said I'd reserve questions to Committee of the Whole, and they haven't stepped up, but I still have unanswered questions. I, I would like, if they wish to, uh, have them come up to the microphone and allow me to ask them the questions. If they don't want to, that's fine, too. And the first one would be Buck uh, Lakaitis, and the second one would be Robin Samuelson. If you heard your name called and you would like to come forward, please come forward. I feel like I'm in trouble. Yeah, if, if I might, Madam Chairman, one of your positions, as I understood it, was that this was not the the correct place to be changing CDQ allocations, the correct place would be at the federal level. You heard another gentleman just testify, and Department of Law is going to get a definitive answer, that to do so would require legislative change at the congressional level. Were you aware of that? Um, thank, you, thank you for the question, Mr. Wood. I uh, misspoke a little bit. I, I, my intention was to, I was never my intention to say it would be easy. I didn't understand entirely that all everything was in statute. So in other words, it can't, couldn't be changed by amendment. Maybe I um, didn't fully understand that. Um, but I think when, where there's a will, there's a way. There's, there certainly is the opportunity to change through the council process because it's a federal program. I'm not saying it's an easy lift. It, would, it, it sounds like it's more of a congressional, not our state legislature, but an act of Congress. Um, it, it, the, the CEQ program all started with Americans Fisheries Act and was granted through Congress. Yeah. And there's way better people to speak of that. So I somewhat misspoke. My intention was I'm willing to help um, through other processes. This wasn't the right process. And the reason why I think, don't think this is the right process is because the benefits are diluted. CDQ groups get 10%. So if you took the proposal as written, my understanding in 14 and 15, we'd lose between four and six million pounds, all other things being equal. I think that was ballpark figure. Four and six million pounds would be reallocated back to the federal system. 10% of it, 10.7% is the direct allocation to CDQ. So do the math. Now, they have a lot of other direct investments. They have direct and indirect investments in other fishing trawlers, factory longliners. Even some have aerial pot boats. And so that 10.7 is surely bigger than that. They, they claim it's 40%. I think it's, you know, it's maybe they have new numbers. But it looks like by the federal figures I've seen, it looks like it's somewhere the, the Alaskan ownership of the Bering Sea. And I'll RC this tonight. So you can see it by the, I think it's Pacific Marine Fish. I'll, I'll make sure you have the, the source. Okay. Is, is somewhere in the, like all ground fish, we, we have about 22% of the all ground fish is, is Alaskan, you know, and non-Alaskan's the, the vast majority. So. Yeah. Um, the second line of question and that I wanted to get a response back from you on, to make sure I understand your position correctly is the ratchet down, what they call ratcheting down. Uh, when I first looked at the proposal, uh, one of the things that came to my mind without talking to anyone is just why not allow the existing situation to continue as is, but put a ratcheting down provision in it. And you seem to indicate something totally opposite 
and that you've proven over the years that you've caught 2%, 3%, and you gave the figures 6%, 8%, and now we are at 11, and it's going to grow. Is it your position that that cap should go up as high as uh, the catch allows? In other words, if they start getting closer to 20%, it should be 20 rather than 15 or 13? Um, thank, thank you for that um, question. No, my view, and I think I said it in testimony, is the board had a credible program uh, system to do incremental 1% increases capped at 15. Now, if you're asking what happens if we don't catch it in a given year, what should happen? That's one of my questions. And so, yes. so I guess there's two ways you could do that. If, if for one or two years, or let's say one year, let's say next year, it's 12%, and the, that fleet doesn't catch 12%, it doesn't get to 90%, um, fishes the whole year, that would, in the current system, my understanding is, it, it could go two or three years at 12%, and then would increase the year that it did get caught. If you're saying that if it got stuck on 12%, didn't get caught, should it ratchet down, back down to 11? Is that what you're su suggesting would be one way to do it? Or That's what came to my mind. I'm not suggesting it would be the way to go, but I was just, yeah, that's what initially came to mind. That's what I was asking to comment on. Okay, okay so what, how I would comment on that is if it did, if it either stayed status quo or ratcheted back, to reflect the, reflect the current participation, that would be a policy choice. But then what if, if that 11 gets caught again? Does it ratchet back up? And I'd say that would, that would give you a symmetry. I mean, it just, the fleet's not okay. gonna, be, because we had an 80% or 85% crash from the blob years in the Gulf of Alaska, there was a lot more effort that came out. It's not a big growing fishery in my mind at this point. I don't know anybody else who's entering. There, there might be, I don't know everything, but, We've actually reduced the fleet a little bit. I, I don't know what, it was 40, and I think it went to 30-something um, last year. So it, it very well could be we get to a point where we don't catch that. And I, what I guess what my preference, obviously, would be if we ratcheted down or stayed status quo for a period of time, at least when we caught it again, we'd, we'd ratchet back up. Because the current plan in place right now to 15 is a cap. 15 is a cap. That's, I, that's what I'm getting, kind of trying to get at. One of the concerns vocalized by the other side was it started at a lower figure and it's been escalating ever since over a relatively short period of time. And what they were looking for is some stability. You know, a cap really means a cap. And what I heard you say, and I think I probably was mistaken, you are not, or are you advocating going beyond the 15% cap in the future? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Wood. I do not advocate for over 15%, me personally. I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else. Um, I will note that the, the golf stair stepped up from 10 to 15 to 20 to 20. Or, you know, I forget all the increments, but mm -hmm. ended at 25%. Western golf, they like the program so much, they asked for an increase to 30 Aleutian Islands is up to 36% with an overall cap, but it's, you know, 11 is yeah. not... 25 or 30, it's, it's way under that. 15, maybe that's the ballpark you want to play with, but you, you're not going to bind a future board anyway. So I, that's, that's safe for me to say 15's right. Yeah. When you have a chance, I, I'm impressed with your background, and would you take a look at the RC that uh, Angel just referenced when he comes in this evening and give me a response, or even get, prepare your own RC in response? I'd be interested in reading that. Sure. Um, th thank you very much, Mr. Wood. Um, I'll do that. We can huddle with other people. Um, and I'm, I apologize if I misspoke about the difference between in statute and by amendment with the CDQ group. So I stand corrected on that. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to look at Mr. Peterson to provide some legal insight to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Mr. Jensen might have been about to answer this too, but um, it is set by Congress. So that would, that would require an act of Congress, not an act of the North Council. And I also wanted to note for the record that consistent with the board's policy on conflicts, Mr. Heimbuck has stepped away from the table for uh, proposals five and six. That might have already been noted and I missed it, but I want to make sure it was on the record. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Buck, can you please come up? I believe board member Jensen had a question for you. Please state your name for the record again. Um, Buck Lakaitis again from Homer. 
Uh, thanks for coming back up, Buck. I, and I know you were there when this all went down with the uh, several years ago on the on the allocation, and the thought process was to cap it at 15, if I remember correctly. And and I, and I remember discussion about uh, if you didn't make it one year, it went back or stayed. And and we finally just came to the conclusion that you probably wouldn't be able to catch the fish that you were offered anyway, and you've guys proved us wrong. So that's why we capped it at 15, so it wouldn't go any higher. And like you said, you can't bind future boards. So is that sort of what you recall too? Is that, I mean, you were at all these meetings and, and that's sort of my recollection is that we, we, we had all sorts of different numbers and we finally yeah. ended up, I mean, we were at eight for a while and then we went up and we decided to cap it at 15 and if you, if you could reach that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jensen, for the question. Yeah, that's that's my recollection. I was on the council at the time, so I was not act actively participating in the board process. I was I was watching from afar, but that's how I remember it. I think any of those would be credible approaches, stepping up and stepping down if you paused. But my hope is that the board will continue to manage the fish that are in state waters for the benefit of the residents of Alaska. And that would be, if we can catch it, continue to manage it, and don't reallocate back to the federal interests because overwhelmingly, other than the CDQ program as a, a bright light on, the, on a dark night and our fishery, it's pretty much all going out of state otherwise. Um, and I, I think both these programs are somewhat borne out by frustration with this federal program. So if you have concerns about you know, some of how the federal system works, about bycatch. Any fish you reallocate back to the federal system is going to have higher bycatch. I, don't, I think that's a little bit new information. It should be well known. We, it, was, it was our seed by Hannah. I, I refer you to that. I forget the, 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 the amount that four to six million pounds more of cod into the federal system would result in halibut bycatch. And hopefully you can look at her RC. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's RC number six. But and then you had you said one other thing: that twenty percent, twenty-two percent of all ground fish is Alaska, and, and the rest is the rest goes out. Is that twenty-two percent uh, part of that twenty-two percent CDQ groups too? Yeah. Is that added in there? That's so. my understanding. I'll RC it, and then you can find the reference to it and see it online, just like I did. Yeah. It's somebody else's information, but it's definitely the. State of Alaska Council, it's their, I, I should know this, but it's their, it's, it's, it's a safe report. It's basically a safe report, and it's the most current information. I'll already see it tonight, and you'll be able to see the share of cod in the Bering Sea, all ground fish in the Bering Sea, all ground fish all over. And then I will point out that the Gulf of Alaska, as far as Alaskan interest in the Gulf of Alaska, is way higher than the Bering Sea. It's actually, we're doing pretty well. On cod, it's about 50%, so in the federal part of, of, of their management program, 50% owned by Alaskans. Is, and you look at the numbers, because I've been, I don't want to make a mistake, just I'll RC it tonight, and you look at it yourself and see what you glean from it. Okay, thanks for your help, Buck. Yeah, thanks. Looks like you got another question here, Member Carlson Van Dort. Hi, Buck, and I don't know if this question is for you or maybe it's for Mr. Armstrong. And I'll be the first to admit that I don't know a lot about cod biology. And, you know, in these discussions about ratcheting up and down, I'm just kind of curious if, if um, the biomass from year to year is highly variable or if it's kind of static. I, I, don't, I don't know much about it, but I'm just thinking that, like, he could be in sort of a perpetual up, down, up, down. Um, if, you know, one year it's pretty low and the next year, you know, it's pretty high. I, I don't know, but I'm just kind of curious what the trends of the biomass is, to the best of your knowledge yeah. or anybody's knowledge. Thank you, um, Ch Chairman. Um, I'm a dumb fisherman, so I, I will say that with the blob, and you know, they, they thought there was a big cod, um, where'd, the, where'd all the cod go? And they found them in Bering Strait. They found them up by St. Matthews in the northern Bering Sea, and it, luckily, that year, they were doing a northern survey, and they did the genetics work, and all these cod that disappeared down by Unimac ended up way up north, and that's been a trend with changing ocean. Um, it, as a fisherman, I know that fish travel through there. The Unimac Pass is a 
But I also know that they manage the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska right now, and that's what we have. And so a lot of the concern about conservation, there's a tremendous amount of effort just north of Unimac Island. I mean, that we're fishing basically, the best way to think of it is like a, a herring stock. It's, they're coming into spawn, they're coming from all over to get together, and whether they're inside three or just outside three, there's, if you look at the AIS of the number of boats that target that body of cod right there, and we're lucky enough to have state waters that are super productive, right? It's not the only place, but all those big headlands on where there's lots of current in the Bering Sea around, around Dutch Harbor are super productive. And uh, so to answer your question, I'm a dumb fisherman, all the stock, I'll just make a mess of all the, you know, I think in general we're down a little bit, but we're, there was a big concern like three years ago, you can see it from that one table that showed a pretty big reduction and now it's bounced back up somewhat, but it's no, by no means historical high or historical lows. So. Thank you, appreciate that. Any new information for proposal six? Please come forward. Robin Samuelson, Dillian M. <clears throat> Mr. Wood, I believe you requested this. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Robin, you cut shot at three minutes, giving us a background of your family, which I know is quite extensive out there in their, their establishment of these fisheries. But I spent, what, two days in Dillingham, most of which was in your company, and listened to hours upon hours of the history and, and what needs <coughs> to be done. One of the major concerns I'd like you to put on the record here t today is what your organization has done to get young fishermen and women the opportunity and the equipment and the permit cost, finance, et cetera, to get them into the fisheries because uh, that's the future. And I understand that you folks are heavily involved in that with the monies that uh, are coming out of the CDQ program. Yeah, 100% of our money comes from the CDQ program. Uh, our program is that, uh, that we will pay 50% of the permit price. Um, you've got a uh, we work with CFAB in the state. Uh, we can't own permits on CDQ groups. Uh, however, uh, and we'll get loans up to 15 years. Those loans would be subsidized interest loans, low interest loans. We also, um, uh, we did about 80 permits so far. I think we have 12 in the hopper uh, that my staff is working through right now. Uh, we have bought uh, uh, about 40 boats, and the same program goes for the individual that wants a boat. And uh, we require three years being out on the water, uh, fishing Bristol Bay, and we're working with the University of Alaska now to develop a program that would uh, entice young uh, residents, both male and female, to get involved in the fishery and through the university courses, uh, th they'd be able to apply. If, if I understood you correctly when I was out there, that 50% of the permit cost is not to be repaid if they stay out on the fishing grounds for three years. Is that correct? There are no other conditions to it. They, they've, got to they've got to fish. They've got to stay a resident of Bristol Bay. This is only for residents of Bristol Bay. They could leave up to 60 days to have a medical emergency or there's a family death or something like that. There's uh, uh, circumstances that the individual could stay out of Bristol Bay a little, a little while longer. But the average person is, is the most you could be gone is 60 days out of Bristol Bay. And uh, the permit's got to be fished every year. Thank you very much. If you have anything further you want to add as far as new information, it's more than welcome. But that's what I wanted to focus your attention on. And thank you so much. Well, I was, uh, I'm getting old. I read in the, the uh, uh, handouts you gave that uh, as an organization, I could testify three minutes and when the chair, I mean, 10 minutes and when the chairman said three minutes, uh, I didn't even get in my hollering mode. I felt like a Baptist preacher on Sunday. Uh, but I just want you guys to realize that 
that in our villages, there's no employment. I don't care if you're from the Bristol Bay region. I don't care if you're from the Kuskokwim region. I don't care if you're from the Yukon region. And the further west you go, the worse it gets. I'm, I'm from Bristol Bay, but my grandmother lived in Akichok, Alaska, a small village in the Kuskokwim where I grew up helping her run her store. And today, you're lucky if there's 10% employment. The employment machines that you heard from the young gals from the Yukon that got up here, I was so proud of them coming up here and testifying that, uh, that the CDQ groups are making a difference out there. We have debt loads to pay. We're growing. You guys were talking about 20, 22% of uh, the resource we own in the Bering Sea. I think it's 25%, and that's going to grow. Uh, and uh, we're very thankful that uh, we have the program out there, especially when COVID hit. The last time COVID hit in 1919, it wiped out half of my people in Bristol Bay. Bristol Bay was the worst hit in, in the world. And, um, and the, the people that we're working for out there are very, very appreciative. I organized 400,000 pounds of salmon last year to be shipped to the Kuskokwim Yukon folks because there wasn't a fishery. I talked the processors into, I didn't want junk fish. My people, us Yupiks, we know our fish. We don't want hatchery fish, we want fat fish. We know what kind of fish to eat out of our river systems. And I got them shipped last year, 400,000 pounds. I called them up again this year, I said, there's no opening in the Yukon and very limited uh, in the Kuskokwim. We got to get the people fish up there. 400,000 more went. And I hear of people crying, crying when they're given that fish uh, because they eat fish. You have eggs for breakfast. A lot of our families eat fish for breakfast. You have a ham sandwich for lunch. A lot of our families eat salmon for lunch. You have steak for supper. A lot of our families eat fish. We're lucky that the moose population moved in. We're lucky the caribou moved in, subsidized the diets. Before, it was 100% fish, salmon and freshwater fish. And culturally, as a Yupik myself, culturally, as a Yupik myself, I get phone calls from people saying, Robin, I only caught three fish this year. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I told the governor right to his face, you eat white man's food, we eat the native food. Our people in, in Western Alaska, the last two years, are culturally starving for fish, culturally starving for fish. I worked hard on this board. I worked hard on the council. You guys work hard. We got to build the runs back up. Our culture depends upon the fish. Thank you. Any additional new information for proposal six? In the back there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman and the board. Uh, once again, Jerry Davis, Yukon Delta. I just want to correct some information we heard by a previous testifier. With all due respect, and I think it was meant in an offhand comment, but it was incorrect. We calculate 40% of all federal fish belonging to Alaskans, belonging, 100% belonging to them, uh, not the de minimis amount. And we heard testimony that, that a significant amount of the aerial fishery goes out of state. So please, I just want to correct that for the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please come forward.
Um, hello, my name is Julie Cavanaugh. For the record, I'll be speaking for myself again. My, uh, I have some a new perspective on information on on a, a, on a topic that's been introduced during um, committee of the whole, the stair da step down um, idea that that we're talking about is really something that's only applied in one other uh, GHL fishery in ADAC. And it was, um, in, it was in put, inserted into that fishery because there was a, a, a real concern for stranded, f stranded fish. In the area O fishery, there is no concern for stranded fish. This fishery is successful year after year after year. And the, stair, the step down provision is is separate from this proposal. It's almost like a substitution or or other than the proposer's intent and addresses a problem that isn't there. And I think it's just um, a, a reaction to a potential fear that isn't, there's no basis for. And actually, if there's a concern, it might be a legitimate action taken up in the next cycle, there's no way in two years that we're going to reach a biomass that this, this sector can't land on, that can't harvest. It, it, there's nothing, nothing that I've seen or been told that gives you any information that says that this is necessary um, because of this proposal. And so I really think it's like almost, um, a compromise for a compromise. And that's that's my new information. Thank you. I actually do have a question for you, Ms. Kavanaugh. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just um, what would you can, you know, can contribute the reason for the extended season length dates? I, I think we're at like 200 and something days as opposed to the average of 60 to 90 days open for the season and, and what that has to do for catch per unit effort. Yeah, thank you, um, Ms. Mitchell. I. I believe that it's because there's more quota available. I think that uh, I, this this body and the council just recently talked about a year long opportunity for state for small boat fishermen. It's it's something that we want. The numbers that you heard sound really large, but there's a there's um, there is effort right now to get that last million pounds, and we and we expect it to be caught by the end of the year. There's plenty of time to get that million pounds caught. And there's nothing wrong with a, a small amount of fish, 3%, being left on the table so that small boats that aren't active in other fisheries in the summer can harvest that fish all year long. It's a good thing. It's a really good opportunity. This board created a situation for that to happen. OK, I, I think maybe more specifically, uh, why does it seem to be taking longer to catch the, the same amount of fish as in years prior? Through the chair. Um, I think that I might end up in the same position as another speaker and misspeak on that. So I'm going to defer that to somebody that might give you that new information. Thank you. Mr. Jensen has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Julie. Um, do you know how many boats are fishing right now for that million pounds, trying to catch that up? Um, I have heard from other harvesters that it's one or two boats. Okay. And I, I, I'm, yeah. Just and, there, and the reason that number is so low in the fall is because the little amount that's available, it was uncertain if there was going to be um, enough fish to, to, for a boat to go out and fish and try to harvest that. Um, people have, some people have other opportunities in the fall that they have to go take care of. Okay, thank you, Julie. Yeah. Thank you. Please come forward and state your name for the record. Thank you, my name is Todd Hoppy. Um, Ms. Cavanaugh is a good friend of mine, but I, I kind of want to answer part of that question. Why is the season going so long? Cod is a different kind of species. It's different every year. It's different with salmon. Some salmon don't show up real well in different parts of the state, and they show up later than they are. It was just a very odd year with cod. It was a 
No, no two years are the same with cod. We could go into 2023 and that stuff could be whacked out by May 1st like it has other seasons. And um, it just didn't come into the three mile line real well. I was out there fishing. It would wave in at times, fishing would get really good and then they'd go back out into the deep. We're restricted to the three miles. Um, black cod was getting a little off topic. Black cod was really a lot the same this year too. It's really just peculiar how they were acting. So what's the reason for that? We will never know. If we ever learn that, we won't be sitting here. So I hope that an answered that question better. Thank you. Any additional new information for proposal six? Seeing none, that concludes Committee of the Whole Work Group 1, and I'll pass the gavel back to Chairwoman Carlson Van Dort. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Good job, Chair and uh, Group 1. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Committee of the Whole Group 2. While we have everybody in the room, I'm reluctant to take a break unless anybody's screaming at me. Just keep her, keep her moving here. All right, um, Mr. Heimbuck, I don't know if you're out and about, but you're welcome to rejoin the group here. Thank you. Um, so committee of the whole group two uh, is five proposals. It's Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, and South Alaska Peninsula area legal gear, landing requirements, and season dates. And Aleutian Islands Western and Western District of the South Alaska Peninsula Sable Fish Management Plan. Um, I will turn it over to Chairman Heimbuck. And uh, you can commence with Committee of the Whole Group 2. Thank you, Madam Chairman. At this point, I'd like to ask anybody who has new information on proposal number seven to come forward after we get the presentation from Mr. Stickert here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mark Stickert, Fishing Game. Uh, proposal seven is a department submitted proposal. It seeks just to um, clarify and codify um, some regulations for the entirety of all groundfish fisheries in the Bering Sea Lucian Islands area. Again, similar to previous um, department proposals, it's just putting into regulation what is done in practice. Thank you, Mr. Sticker. Any comment, any new information on proposal number seven? Anybody want to say anything? Seeing none, we'll move on to proposal number eight, Mr. Sticker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proposal 8 is another department submitted proposal. We're going to shift down towards the South Alaska Peninsula area. This is just a technical update to align the state's weather um, delay criteria with a, a recent change in the um, National Weather Service forecast area. Again, technical change wouldn't change any um, aspect of how we manage the fishery. Any new testimony from people who don't like the weather in that country? Seeing none, we'll move right along into the Chignik, South Alaska Peninsula, Dutch Harbor Subdistrict, Aleutian Islands Subdistrict, Jig Gear Registration and Season Dates. One proposal, proposal number nine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This proposal would um, seek to create some continuity um, between uh, a handful of registration areas for jig vessels. As we heard earlier this morning, that each registration area sort of has their own season dates, their own restrictions, their own um, regulations that sort of reflect local fisheries. Um, there's some thought that that creates a situation that strands quota. Um, and so this proposal would drop all the exclusivity regulations, which would um, then allow jig vessels to move more freely between registration areas within a given year. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any new information available from the public on proposal number nine? Please come forward. Please state your name for the record. My name is Julie Cavanaugh. Um, um, at this point, I'll be speaking for the Kodiak Advisory Committee. Uh, I ran out of time and didn't speak to this proposal. Uh, this proposal at our meeting uh, had an um, amendment uh, uh, attached to it that passed. The Jig Association, uh, I, don't, I believe president was at our meeting, and they were not able to come to a consensus um, as the proposal was written, they had some concern about the, the word rock, the rockfish being included in it. It's a simple amendment that we made by taking out rockfish in one spot in that proposal. I don't have the language in front of me, but um, we removed rockfish from that um, language. And then um, 
and even though that made the representative more comfortable without, without talking to his membership, he wasn't able to weigh in on it. We did pass the amended language at the um, advisory committee meeting. We, f we felt like um, that it provided opportunity for jig vessels to um, operate in a more fluid manner and be more um, profitable if that makes sense. And I can take any questions or try to answer them if you have them. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, thanks for your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move along to Aleutian Islands District and Western District of the South Alaska Peninsula Sablefish Management Plan. There is one. Per I have one question. Please go ahead. I don't know if this is for Julie or anybody, and I, I don't know if the proposer is here, but. Um, there's an assumption of stranded GHL, and I was just wondering what that assumption was based on. Um, sorry, thanks. <laughs> Scrambling with paper here. Oh, yeah, no, thank you for the question, and I will do my best <clears throat> to answer it. So, tech, basically, if the jig quota isn't caught, you could assume that it is stranded, but there's a rollover mechanism, and uh, generally speaking, I believe, pot vessels, and it's generally the local pot vessels in Chignik that would be able to harvest that leftover quota. Okay, thank you. And if, if somebody from Chignik thinks I'm wrong, I don't mind if they come up and correct me. Thanks, that's helpful. Thank you. Moving on to proposal number 10. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you noted, we're gonna switch gears to Sablefish. Proposal 10 would define in regulation the annual allocation for the state waters Aleutian Islands Sablefish GHL as 5% of the federal Bering Sea Aleutian Islands Sablefish ABC. Thank you. Does anybody wish to bring forward any new testimony or information on Proposal 10? Seeing none, we'll move on to the final proposal in Group 2 here. Number 161, the policy proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Proposal 161 would uh, create and establish a Alaska Board of Fisheries policy regarding management of ground fish fishery resources in Alaska. Anybody wish to testify on this policy proposal? Please. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'll, I'll um, direct you towards RC7, which was uh, submitted by the department, and it just captures the, the transcript from a 2014 meeting at which the old guiding principles were um, deleted. Thank you. Any further comments? Board? Madam Chair, seeing we have reached the end of public comment. Oh, I can never see her hand. I know, it's kind of tough to see. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am just, again, just sort of scrambling through my notes here, and I can't remember if there was, I believe that there was going to be substitute language and RC8 offered for this. Is that correct? I'm seeing nods back there. And I don't know if there's anybody that wants to speak to that substitute language um, in Committee of the Whole, but I just I had, had that little memory in my mind. So if not, that's fine. I just wanted to note it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other hidden hands down here that I can't see? Madam Chairman, it appears we've reached the end of new new testimony on Committee of the Whole, Group 2, and I would entertain a motion to close this Committee of the Whole. All right. Thank you. Very, I don't think we need a motion, but thank you very much, Mr. Heimbach. Very nice job um, chairing your first Committee of the Whole. Um, so that concludes Committee of the Holes for Group 1 and Group 2. Um, it's just about... 420 here this afternoon. I'd like to provide the afternoon and the evening for folks to get together to work on substitute language, to work on um, perhaps some compromise language if possible. Um, and I would also, if there is substitute language hanging out there, I would really encourage the authors of that language to make sure you get with a board member and run it through um, staff, run it through legal and enforcement just to make sure that the language is is correct so that when we do get into deliberations, we have um, good language before us that um, doesn't bog down the deliberative process with amendments that we might get confused by, frankly. So um, please, please work with um, a board member to make sure that substitute language um, gets drafted correctly. I've seen many good ideas of substitute language 
sort of die on the vine because they didn't connect with the proposal when we got to deliberation. So um, with that, we will go ahead and break for today. We will commence with deliberations um, on group one and group two beginning at 8.30 <coughs> tomorrow morning. And um, I encourage people to keep an eye out for our C's in the morning so that we can take a look at any substitute language that might be generated tonight. Appreciate all your hard work, Mr. Wood. When would you have to have an RC in sufficient time to get it to us tonight? I'm getting at uh, proposal six, which is apparently we are anticipating an RC. I'd like to know what that RC is tonight, if at all possible. How do we go about doing that? Well, once you know, once our staff leaves here tonight, then of course you know we wouldn't be able to uh, to print it and distribute it. And um, that's a matter of minutes, correct? Before they leave. Uh, you know, we could stick around for a while. I don't know how soon it is likely to come forward from the public. We have the new online <clears throat> submission portal on our website for written comments. I know people have been utilizing it, so they can upload it any time. And if, if we're still around and it's the desire of the board to do a distribution, maybe like at, at 5 o'clock, if something's going to come that soon, then I think we could stick around f for, for that. I don't think that is, that's a, not a problem. Yeah, and, and the other... Also, if, if an RC gets is um, you know dropped in the morning, I'm more than happy to provide time for members to read it um, <clears throat> and and get familiar with it before we commence deliberations. And of course, the department will be available to us. So, just for the public's you know edification, clarification, um, we're going to come back on the record at 8:30 in the morning, but we might be taking a break if there is sub substantive substitute language that is brought forward, so that everybody has a chance to get eyes on it. Does that help address your concern, Mr. Wood? Yes. Great. So no distribution. If anything comes through. In the next 30 or so minutes, staff will do a distribution around five. Otherwise, um, we'll look for it first thing in the morning. So um, with that, we'll see you at 8.30. Thank you much.